everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you all here today. So without further ado, I'd like to bring this meeting of the TDC to order and ask um, for a roll call vote for attendance, starting over here on the right. Good morning, morning. Chuck Prather, the Birchwood, St. Petersburg. Julie Ward, Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Doreen Moore, Travel Resort Services, TRS. <coughs> Good morning, Brian Hogg, City of Clearwater. Russ Kimball, Sheraton Sand Key, Clearwater Beach. Good morning, everyone. Steve Hayes with Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Good morning, uh, Copley Gertis, City of St. Petersburg. Good morning, everyone. Mike Williams, Innisbrook Golf Resort. Good morning, Trisha Rodriguez, the Clearwater Ferry. Good morning, Phil Henderson, Starlight Cruises, uh, Clearwater Beach, Madeira Beach, and South Pasadena. And good morning, oh, Excuse I'm me. sorry. Good morning, Clyde, Clyde Smith, Bill Mar Beach Resort, Treasure Island. I didn't hear a word you said. Could you say that? Oh, again? Clyde Smith, Bill Mar Beach Resort, Treasure Island. It's lovely to see you all this morning, and thank you all for such great attendance. Obviously, you're very interested in the money and our budget, so it should be a good day. I'm Janet Long, and I'm a county commissioner, District 1, which is countywide, and I'm your chair this year, and over here, to my left, we have Michael Sauce, our county attorney, who's going to keep us on the straight and narrow. Okay, so uh, those are my comments for today. I think you all are prepared to stay through lunch because we're going to be having a deep dive into our budget for the coming year. And as you know, we have big decisions to make, and I know we're very capable of making them. So I'd like to ask for approval of the minutes from our last meeting, please, if I may have a motion. So moved. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Mayor Pajowski, yes? Second. Oh, second, okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And Stacy, do we have any public comments today? No, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, now we have an action item, which is our capital funding request, the Salvador Dali. And I don't know if Dr. Hines is prepared to testify. Do you want to say a few remarks? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll even hear from Trevor Burgess, who I see sitting yes. over there. So when you get to the microphone, please uh, identify yourselves and tell us what your position is and who you're speaking for. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Hank Hine. I'm the director of the Dolly Museum, and I know most of you from your many years of service here, and the Dolly Museum, as you know, is, has come before you. And I'm here with Trevor Burgess, who is chair of our building task force and Tim Bogot from our marketing and development committees of the board of the Dali Museum. And uh, I know uh, we were before you seven months ago in October. And uh, so I would like to just walk through basically what this project is. And this is the report from Crossroads, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, actually, Dr. Hine, we've got the uh, other presentation being pulled up. Is, is to be pulled up? Yeah. Uh, so uh, do I initiate that? Uh, no, they're, they're doing, they'll do that in the back. Okay, good. Uh, That's not our report. No. It looks very good, but I think we contribute to that, though. Yeah, uh, I'll wait for the right uh, slide. You want to give Pete some direction about yeah. what he's looking for, yeah. please? Yeah. Just just a little miscommunication here. Bear with us. Pete will get it all straightened out post haste. Well, I want to in this time, refresh your memories about this project. 
Uh, this project differs from the original request, which you recommend, re recommended funding to back in 2019, in two respects. First, we have removed the parking aspect of the project, and in so doing, been able to quadruple the amount of programmatic exhibition and convention space in the project, one that we see being sufficient for us for generations. The second aspect, and this will not surprise you, is that the price has gone up. And it's gone up uh, due to two factors, to scope, putting in more programmatic space, and through this thing that we are all faced with, the incredible rise in the cost of materials and labor. So no surprises there, but those are the two aspects that make this project different from what you heard in 2019 and which you funded. Okay, there we go. Uh, so that's the Dolly Museum you helped us build with 2.5 million. Um, and you know we're the leader in the culture arts re revolution in Pinellas County. We're the uh, tide that raises all boats culturally. And together with the beaches and the contributions of the beach communities, the Dolly Museum is what drives visitation. Uh, we're the most visited single artist museum in America. Uh, we are an education leader, not only for those who visit, but for our community as well. And most interesting now, we are a pioneer in innovation. We are doing something quite different from other museums. We are using technology to shorten that distance from person to person that art can provide. And in so doing, we're a place to build empathy, which is very positive for the world. Our visitation has ranged in recent years between 320 and 440,000. Uh, we have 5 million page views uh, at our website and 500,000 uh, social media followers. Uh, only 11% of our visitors are from Pinellas County and thus only 25% are local. 75% are coming from out of area. And of those, a very high percentage say that their uh, motivation for coming to the Dolly Museum, uh, to coming to the area, was to see the Dolly Museum. We uh, see a growing impact, and there are, uh, there are five facts that I want to, uh, there are four facts that I want to put before you, uh, and which will be reiterated by uh, uh, my colleagues and, and also, uh, in the very excellent Crossroads Consulting Report. That is, the Dolly Museum over the next 10 years will bring five million visitors. We will have an economic impact of $1.9 billion over 10 years. We will add 1.3 million room nights with 15 million dollars returned to tourist development taxes in that 10 years. Uh, we give international exposure by loaning works and advertising the museum around the world. Uh, however, we need more space. And this is not space to hang paintings. We have about as many paintings as we're going to get since they cost so many millions of dollars now. But we we'll add something that's even more valuable to our visitors, and that is access to them through digital arts. And we have become the leader in interactive art experiences in the nation. This is just a short history of some of the innovations that we've had. And if you've been to our Van Gogh Alive, or you've seen Dali brought alive by artificial intelligence, then you know what our brand is. Uh, we've done a lot of surveys to see this is what people want and we have that confirmed. So I would like to ask uh, Trevor to take you through the, uh, some additional points. Good morning. Good morning, Janet. 
So nice to see everybody. It's uh, great to be back here. I uh, have been in front of you a few times before, back when I was part of C1 Bank and now leading uh, Neptune, which is uh, one of the fastest growing companies in America, based here in St. Pete and the largest flood insurance company in the US. And we happen to also insure the Dali. So, you know, I'm really on the hook for this, not just uh, uh, presenting today. This is a, a labor of love, and it's a labor of love between a lot of interested parties. Uh, this great county and state that we live in, the city, and many of its constituencies. And we had to figure out a solution that would work for everybody. And by everybody, I mean the Mahaffey, I mean the Grand Prix, the city of St. Petersburg, the museum, and the realities of the funding environment. And so, as Hank mentioned, we scrapped the idea of parking, which when we presented here in 2019, there was some head scratching, like why are we spending so much money on parking? Well, now we're spending no money on parking, so that uh, is uh, an easier uh, you know, discussion. And the idea becomes, let's really uh, create space that adds the most value, which is programmatic space. So you can see that the new building basically comes out the back away from the water um, and is uh, designed by uh, the same architecture team that uh, built uh, the museum itself. And you know their history of being involved in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And so this is uh, just an absolutely iconic uh, building and this expansion uh, out onto what is called Lot 6 uh, will be uh, absolutely transformative in giving the museum the space it needs to grow to attract uh, new visitation uh, to our county. I'm uh, very excited uh, that it is a quadrupling of the programmatic space uh, from the original uh, vision. Uh, lots of new space for uh, you know, circulation, uh, lots of new space for uh, programming and education being able to go from a tiny education room to a huge education space. Uh, the number of students from our county who go through this every year is just uh, phenomenal. And even on the roof, being able to you know, put in some food and beverage with the vistas is uh, going to be helpful to uh, the overall economics and uh, the attraction of this uh, building. A um, couple of views for you, just to be very clear about what's going to be built. You see there's no interaction with the Mahaffey parking garage. There's no interaction with the existing parking space. This is just building out the back of the museum onto what's currently uh, a roadway, uh, again, called Lot 6. In November, uh, there was a referendum uh, that was passed by the residents of the city of St. Petersburg supporting uh, and instructing the city of St. Petersburg to amend the lease uh, to include lot six. That passed overwhelmingly, actually got the highest number of votes of anything on the, on the uh, uh, ballot uh, that year, which is, it's rare to have anything bipartisan, but I guess the DALI is something that is completely bipartisan uh, given uh, its contributions to this community. So I wanna be very clear, this is what we're talking about building here out onto what is currently a, uh, a roadway. Uh, it will have to be built uh, so as not to interfere with Mahaffey operations and so as not to interfere with the Grand Prix. So it's sort of like, okay, build all the foundations, make sure that they can operate the race, then we come back and build up and make sure they can operate the race, much like was done with the original uh, building itself. Um, Hank talked about sort of the impact. I don't think there's any question. I read the very good uh, report that was done. Uh, you know, I think the main thing that draws a significant difference between funding for the Dolly and funding for other things that have taken place is this has a proven track record of actually being able to attract people to this area where this is the reason why they came to the area and put uh, people into hotel rooms and make sure that they stay and spend money here. And uh, so I'm excited about being able to continue to have the Dolly uh, to fulfill uh, that uh, vision. Uh, lots of uh, advertising money that goes, you know, along with this that are, is promoting uh, 
uh, the Dali and our area. And today we're requesting your support uh, for the updated cost. The updated cost is $68 million. Let's just cut to the chase. You know, and so uh, in 2019, you all approved 17 and a half. That was half of the 35. Thank you. Uh, now we need another 16.5 to get us to half of the 68. The Dolly has the rest of the money, so this is not a, oh, we need to you know, raise money to make this happen. We will try to raise money. We will try to get naming sponsors and all that sort of thing. Uh, but this is a shovel-ready project. This is a project that we are able to uh, execute upon and uh, that will come to fruition uh, with the great support of the city and the county. And so uh, that's, that's the simple request. Given the inflation and given the 4X of the programmatic space, which is more expensive than parking space, uh, we need another $16.5 million to make this a reality. And that's the request in front of you uh, today. Tim, do you want to share a couple closing sure. thoughts? Thank you, Trevor. Don't go too far away, though. We may have questions for you. Tim, how lovely to see you back here again. We oh, have missed you. Thank you so much, you. Janet. Great to see you, too. You never get any older. Oh, yes. oh <laughs> hello. Thank you. It's not true. Many w will remember that well, my name is Tim Bogut and that I was on the Tourist Development Council for, I think, 17 or 18 years. And about 2010, mm -hmm. the issue came before the Tourist Development Council and then the Board of County Commissioners as to whether or not there ought to be uh, an allocation for the new building at the Dali. Uh, there was a re request for two and a half million dollars. Um, and that ultimately was approved. And I want to point out at the time that I believe a lot of, lots and lots of debate, uh, if you remember, about whether or not money ought to be advanced toward capital improvements versus sales and marketing. Uh, ultimately, I, we, we argue, I argued and others argued that the Dali uh, new building would be like a flashing billboard, if you will, uh, forever, as long as the Dali existed. And I think it's safe to say that um, that is sales and marketing. It comes in a little bit different form, but it is sales and marketing. And um, ultimately, the, the $2.5 million was approved unanimously by the Tourist Development Council and recommended to the Board of County Commissioners that then I think approved it five to seven. Um, I argued at the time that this was different, that this project was so compelling because it was like this billboard again flashing forever uh, as long as the Dolly would exist. And I think the Dolly has proven beyond every expectation, any, any wish or hope that we might have had at that time, uh, what it could contribute to our destination. Um, and if you look back, it has contributed in just tourist tax alone. And I would argue that virtually every other investment that we've ever looked at for capital improvements, we always look only at economic impact. But I'd ask you to just look at the fact that on the, on the chart, I think on page 33, which is the uh, existing benefits of the existing DALI, that it's producing about, if I go back a little bit to pre-pandemic levels, producing about a million dollars a year just in tourist tax. That's in the, the pockets of the Tourist Development Council to be able to reinvest in other projects. And to me, that is beyond anything uh, that I ever saw um, in terms of an opportunity to invest. Now, last, just last week, last Sunday, in fact, Hank and I uh, visited a museum in Bilbao, Spain, the, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. If, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to take the opportunity because it is, is a study in how a museum can make a community, basically. Bilbao, Spain is a centuries old, over a thousand years old community. Uh, they found iron ore outside the city thousands of years ago and began to do um, steel manufacturing, et cetera. And so it grew up as an industrial city and of course, 
times change. And Bilbao is not an industrial city today, but if you go there, you'd be blown away at what a modern, up-to-date, prosperous community it is. And it is largely regarded by the fathers of Bilbao, Spain, that the Guggenheim Museum is responsible for that, that it revitalized the community. And while we all know there are lots of other reasons to come to Pinellas County, and I've argued for years that it, to have a perfect des destination, you gotta have great beaches, you gotta have great accommodations, and probably right after that, you've gotta have something other than beaches, like art and sports, et cetera, because people get sunburned and they need something to do when it's raining and all those kinds of things. And the Dali fulfills that. And I believe that having seen this, and I, I would point out I have no interest in the Dali, no interest any longer in trade winds. I, my interest is the same as yours, having sat on the Tourist Development Council for all those years, that I'd like to see Pinellas County continue to benefit and do well from tourism. And this, to me, is a perfect fit for what Pinellas County is trying to do in terms of invested capital dollars. So the, the Dolly, as it exists today, has proven itself. A million bucks a year, approximately, over the last 12 years since the new building opened in tourist tax collected in the county's pocket. And the new Dolly that we're proposing to you will do similarly. If you look at the chart on page 35, you'll see that over a 10-year period of time, that in, again, in tourist tax alone, not economic benefit, tourist tax alone, it will produce over $15 million over the next 10 years. Now take that for another 10 years, that number is likely to grow and you're producing, again, something north of 15, combine the two, and you're probably very close to paying back the full $34 million over the next 20 years. And I would, again, argue that this opportunity is the most compelling investment opportunity I have ever seen sitting on the Tourist Development Council. As many of you know, I came from Lee County, Southeast Plantation, and so forth. And they used to argue that Sanibel and Captiva produce all of the room nights and therefore all of the revenue, and therefore they should get all the money. And of course, you know, there's no place to build anything on Sanibel and Captiva. But my point is that we all know there's debate here about, you know, North County versus South County, et cetera. I would argue to ask you to look past that and see that because this is so compelling more compelling than anything I've ever seen in my uh, years on TDC and 50 years in business, that it can pay back in tourist tax alone just from 6% of just bed tax generated. Not 6% of the total revenue in Dali, just bed taxes that are unrelated to the revenues of, of the Dali. So, uh, I, I know that you have a report that argues, look at the average that's been contributed to other uh, capital improvement uh, opportunities for other uh, investment opportunities. Look at uh, you know, other metrics as to how you decide how much. I'm asking you to consider that this is different, that this is so compelling, overwhelmingly compelling, that you should fund what is being requested because we can't have the same project if we don't get the funding that's, that's been requested. We would have to cut it back. And that the benefits to the community, to our little destination defined as St. Pete Clearwater, uh, are so overwhelming that again, just the dollars coming back will fund so many other projects in the future uh, that we really would be remiss in not um, approving this. It's within our defined destination, St. Pete Clearwater. Again, you can argue, well, maybe it should be more up here, and well, it, we, we've already established the Dollies in St. Petersburg. It's easily accessible by I-75. It's proven its capability with its overwhelming success over the last 12 years. And I, again, I don't think you'll find any other opportunity or you'll, you're, 
uh, chance to see another opportunity like this is very unlikely. Um, so please consider that. Um, a rising tide, as Hank said, floats all boats. Um, in our defined destination, the Dali has helped everybody, whether it be in St. Pete, in Clearwater. If St. Pete's filling up, then Clearwater's going to fill up as well. But there's going to be overflow flow from St. Pete to Clearwater, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so I urge you to see the difference, the very compelling bird in the hand, if you will, opportunity that this is, you know, we're not talking about, well, maybe the rays could produce this or maybe spring training could produce that. This is, these are all po potential, you know, uh, projections into the future. This is, we have numbers. We've proven what, what can be uh, produced here. And so I would ask you to kind of look beyond um, some of the limitations that are uh, expressed in the uh, county's report and uh, not be short-sighted uh, in taking advantage of what I think is a, just an overwhelming opportunity. Okay, thank you, Tim, very much for that uh, presentation. I want to save time for questions, though. So um, if we could... Any questions from the board? Bill? The original building, can you, um, does anybody recall what the actual cost of that project was? Yeah. 37. Okay, let's, let's answer yeah. at the mic. <clears throat> the question was the cost of the original Yes, the cost building. of the uh, construction all in was $40 million, first building. And the county provided two and a half million. That's correct, two and a half million. The 11th hour. <laughs> well, that's when things are needed. And if I could just make a point real quick, if you take that uh, 40 million plus our request now of 68, so we have a total of 108. In many ways, I'd ask you to look at the you project. Can't, you can't. Please answer from the mic. We're on. We're on the record here. So, yeah. come on. You know the drill. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you take the 40 million dollars Hank mentioned for the first building, add it to the 68, and you look at this as sort of a phased project, the Dolly being, uh, you know, completing the, that phasing here with phase two, that we have $108 million. The total funding, if we take the two and a half million uh, plus the uh, total of 34 million that we're asking for would be at 36.5 versus the 108, or as a percentage of the 108, we'd be less than 35%. And I know there's a, a metric in the uh, county reports, it suggests that maybe we're asking for more than, you know, other projects. Uh, again, if you look at it on a combined basis, that's really not the case. We're we're below. Thank you. Okay. Anyone I, I else? Asked that, <clears throat> yes. I asked that question. Mike. Sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Phil. Were you still talking? <laughs> yes. I apologize. Continue, <clears throat> please. I'm following up on that. The reason why I asked that question was, I spoke on their behalf when they asked for two and a half million. And we knew the value of having the Dolly Museum just in the area, in the smaller building that was at. And <clears throat> if they had come to us and asked us for 50% of what that project would have cost, we would have considered it. We might not have given 50%, but we would have certainly given more than 2.5% or 2.5 two million uh, because of what we perceived the value could be. So why wouldn't we give them two, you know, if they'd come to us ahead of time, we would have done it. Why wouldn't we do it in the 11th hour? And we only gave 2.5 million instead of half of, of that project. Um, and as they've demonstrated, you see where it went, and that's, that's why we did it. So I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to have that historical perspective that, that they, we didn't have a program in place, and we were going kind of out of the box to do it, but it was an extreme success. And now they're coming back ahead of the game and asking for 50% of a, of a bigger project, which according to our own um, analysis uh, and our own consultants uh, appears to to uh, be a very good investment as well. So I'll speak okay. more to that as Mike. we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, gentlemen, um, a great presentation. And, and certainly, I think we all agree that um, what a wonderful contribution that the museum has made and will continue to make to our community over the years. Uh, a couple questions. Um, first, has a construction company been identified? All, all our estimates are from uh, Beck, uh, Beck Construction, and we've been working closely with them uh, continuously since actually 
uh, 2011 when they built the first phase of the museum. Uh, and they are the ones who have their finger on the pulse of materials inflation and labor inflation, uh, so we can be very confident about that 68 million. Great. And uh, glad to hear that they're the same ones that built the first phase, so they know a lot about it. Um, I think as I read through it, there, there is a performance bond that is on the construction company to ensure against defaults or, or what have you. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Next. For the good of the order. Mayor Pajowski. So thank you for your presentation, by the way. Thank you for your passion. Nice to see you again. Um, so my question, I know you're not doing the parking garage thing, which we all talked about back in 2019, but what are you doing about parking? I just want to make sure it's just not lobbed off. So this is a, uh, uh, it, there's been an interesting transformation in the past, you know, several years even with the success of the Sunrunner, you know, downtown that we've seen, you know, just tremendous usage of uh, the growth of alternative forms of transportation in downtown St. Pete have really taken off. And I think that, you know, even uh, in 2019, a lot of these things were sort of unproven and the supremacy of cars was uh, really more critical than it is today. I'm going to say that solved 10 or 20 percent of the problem, but it hasn't solved 100 percent of the problem. But I think we all should be very happy about some of these early, you know, uh, trends towards public transportation, alternative forms of transportation that are taking place in our communities. That's all part of the problem. We've had very good discussions with the city about what is the ultimate parking solution for what I would call that entire plaza of the arts there, which involves the Mahaffey, it involves uh, the Rays team, you know, ownership of the Rowdies uh, Stadium there. And the good news is that actually in the Mahaffey garage, there's enough spaces. There are enough spaces there uh, for the needs. It's simply how do we make sure that the access between the different groups works and I think uh, with the city's help, we're in some very positive discussions to be able to use the Mahaffey Garage uh, on a more consistent basis when there is overflow, um, so long as it doesn't disrupt the Mahaffey's operations. And then eventually, right, there may be the need for a plaza-wide, so taking the Rowdies into consideration, taking the Mahaffey into consideration, and taking uh, the dolly into consideration, sort of a new parking garage. And, uh, you know, the city has in, been in various discussions about whether or not that's a possibility. But we're confident for now that with the access to the Mahaffey, the existing parking garage, and the surrounding parking that's available, we'll be able to accommodate the visitors um, that uh, this, this new building uh, will bring. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Would we have loved to do all the parking? Yes. Did that work for everybody? No. Right. So this is the compromise position we're in, but I think that it is a good one, and it's been aided, probably 10 or 20 percent by you know the alternative transportation that's developed over the past four years. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gerdes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to just to back up what Trevor said, and I think he did a really good job of kind of explaining where we are. Uh, from the city's perspective, cur currently on the site, there is plenty of parking. We're working with Mahaffey Theater to make sure that, you know, agreements are in place um, and, and mixed use of that parking garage is, is applicable to the site. But we're also looking at, like Trevor mentioned, a, a real kind of complete study of that, of that large parcel, because it's one big parcel that the city owns that Al Ang Stadium is on, the Dolly Museum, the Mahaffey Theater, it's one large parcel. And so we're looking at um, really a, a, a complete plan of that area, including parking. And so uh, I, I would anticipate that to happen over the next year or 18 months for the city really to develop that complete plan and what that's gonna look like uh, going forward. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on that from the city's perspective, but I just wanted to back up what Trevor had said as well. So Thank I, you, Madam I Chair. actually have a question with regard to what you just said, if you don't mind. 
I hope in that study that you're doing that takes in all of the things you just identified is parking for the benefit of Albert Witted. I spent a day down there recently <coughs> um, and had lunch at the hangar. I was stunned at the amount of air traffic coming in and out of the airport. I mean, while I was sitting there, there were four or five Pilatus jets that came in. People got off, went on their way. Then they took off, and then right behind them came some more. It was just, I mean, I was blown away <laughs> by it. And so um, when I did go down there, though, the parking is very limited if you're trying to get to the airfield. Yeah, so uh, the city currently has um, uh, a study that's about to go underway about Albert Witted Airport included in that is parking uh, for Albert Witted and and uh, the current use and what future uses might look like. Yeah, no, I don't like it. <laughs> well, uh, and so they're looking at that separately. Uh, but but what I would say is that listen, parking is an issue in downtown St. Petersburg as a whole, and we're continuing to evaluate that. Uh, both comprehensively and uh, uh, as each parcel as well. All right, I see you're turning into quite a diplomat here. Good for <laughs> you. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I was just uh, mentioned that the study was done three years ago, an, an earlier study by the city, looking at what was available, and they said there are 1,200 uh, spaces which would accommodate because of the different time uh, needs of the different organizations. That is, the, the theater it has most of its events in the evening. We have most of our activity during the day. There's some overlap. And then the, the rowdies have their activities as well. But they said the 1,200 should be sufficient for the enlarged Dolly Museum as well. OK. Any other comments or questions or thoughts? Yes. Chuck. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Great presentation. Um, that was a lot of work. Um, the $34 million, do you see that? How do you see that being drawn? Is that a, a lump sum next year? Is it two payments over 25, 26? How are we going to budget on our side for that? So we had uh, proposed a quarterly payout schedule to match, you know, the, um, uh, match the you know, expenditures that the museum uh, was making to actually build uh, the building, you know, to go out, as you know, to go out now and borrow 34 million to get back from the county at the end of the project is just gonna add another 10% to the cost given the interest rates, right? Yeah. So um, doing a funding sort of as uh, the building is drawn is, is, our, is our request. And the, the follow-up really would be, whether it's mayor or um, chair, we really have two large asks pending this one, which is extremely important. The Phillies is out there. Um, obviously, the Rays is, is the, the big one. We're going to talk countywide, but when I think of, we talk so many times about North County, South County ask. We, we've got a North County ask with Phillies coming. So uh, obviously, we're discussing today a, a South County ask. Do you know when the Phillies is going to have a, a, a final ask? So I would uh, respectfully request that we park that part of the conversation for right now because, <laughs> you know, there's another subject matter that okay. has fallen in the lap of the county commission, which we are going to, this is me talking as the chair. I have asked for a very deep dive discussion on policy. We have to develop a policy for our commission on how we value the way we spend our dollars from the TDC. Because, as you may know, I think it certainly hasn't been a secret and it's been highly publicized that we have a major issue on our beaches with beach renourishment. And there are, there are about three or four of us countywide that have been seriously digging into the options for how we move forward. And last week, I think it was last week, so much has happened, I've kind of lost track of the timing. We had our third annual 
summit on resiliency and sustainability at the Clearwater Beach Hilton. It was the largest attendance we've ever had, 432 people, or 37, <coughs> yeah. One of the keynote speakers was a world-renowned uh, geologist who had been studying the coastline of the United States. And some of the information that he gave to us has really caused me to have almost a panic attack because he said the, the coastline of the United States has been um, moving and changing, coming and going since the end of the last ice age. And if you are working in public policy and you're trying to envision what your coastline will look like 25 or 50 years from now, if you think it's gonna look like it does today, you are living with your head in the sand, literally. So we, a study is ongoing right now to determine what it would cost us if we had to be responsible for the 35 miles of beaches in our county in terms of that we still have a beach. So that is gonna have a very direct effect on the TDC because I think you know, one of our commissioners has suggested that we take a look at that formula. And I know, I know you were there, Tim. When I first came on the commission, we had a joint meeting between the commission and the TDC. Commissioner Seal was the chair and led the discussion about the formula, the 60-40 split. That turned into quite a, a discussion, if you remember, and there was a lot of different opinions on what that split should be, and so we ended up with the 60-40. Well, you know, that has the potential to change, and so that leads me to the last point that I wanted to just put that out there for you to be absorbing while we are in the midst of making these big decisions about the asks that we already know are on the table. You know, a couple months ago, I had a staff change in my office. So I know I must have missed the invitation to go to that beautiful museum, Tim, that you so eloquently spoke of in Spain. But I do know from the opportunities that I have had to go to the world travel conference. I came back that year, you remember the last time I was chair? And I couldn't speak enough about how much we have to pay attention to who our competitors are. I don't know if you remember that, but at the time, our largest competitor to tourism for Florida was Dubai. I mean, little did I know or even dream. My point being is there is no thing that uh, strikes a person more than a visual opportunity to see what we're talking about. And so I'm just gonna put it out there and I'd like your input what you think. I think, I know I've done this with other boards and it has proved eminently successful. That's how we eventually ended up getting the dollars for the Sun Runner. We had taken a field trip to Indianapolis, Indiana and I'm suggesting to this board and to the DALI that it might be very appropriate and timely if over the next couple of months we all had a visit to the DALI, uh, including the members of the county commission. Because as we keep these big projects in mind, I think having an opportunity to actually see what they're doing, to, and I know probably all of you have been many times to the DALI, but probably not with this in mind that you would one day be making a decision about funding um, the expansion. So what would you think if we did that? Mike? Uh, I'd be all in favor of it. I think um, going there uh, and looking through the, the lens of what the gentlemen are asking us for now makes great sense. Uh, I know I would view things differently. Um, 
looking at it today. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, just to, Chuck? Just to finish up. So we don't know about the Phillies, but we do know about the Dolly. We've already approved 17 and a half million. So we're talking about today, 16 and a half million dollars um, over arguably about three years. So um, a $5 million out of our budget over the next three years is how I look at it. Um, we have determined as, as a group, we have to support the arts. And over the last two or three, four years, we have had a greater focus on that. Here's an example, and those don't always make economic sense, but it's the right thing to do for tourism. Here is an art ask that is the right thing to do, but it also makes financial sense to do it. So um, five million a year is a lot of money, but we're talking about the Dolly Museum here, which is, is so important. Like you said, number one museum in the world for a single artist. So this, we're, we're just so fortunate to have it. So um, that's how I'm looking at it, is, is five million over three years. Um, we're blessed that we have a huge surplus right now. We have a lot of, a lot of things coming up that you just mentioned a couple of them. We have some more, but um, I'm just a big supporter of this uh, project. But the question on the table is, would you support a field trip to enlighten those folks that may not be at the moment in the same mindset? 100%, that, that museum, um, words can't describe it, the pictures on the board can't describe it. You go there and have a docent fill you in on a, a, a cubist <laughs> image that makes no sense until you walk all the way across the room and you realize, okay, now I get it. But Yes, you, you have to see it in person. The, the architecture is beautiful. The artwork obviously is, is priceless and it speaks for itself. So um, I love it when important. a plan comes together. Anyone else, Russ? Um, does that include lunch, Chuck? Or, uh, I was thinking uh, more uh, of Is a that going to be a box lunch? Uh, Warm beer and lousy food at the Birchwood. Coming oh, up. Oh, okay. Got <laughs> <laughs> Great plug. I, I'd like to ask, uh, and I'm very much a supporter of the Dolly. But we've also, and I'm not sure we want to ask this conversation right now, but we also have uh, crossroads that we've hired, and there's a recommendation there of the value. And, and we got other projects coming up, and we have to say, are we going to use a consultant or not for the value of that? And I'm not sure how we answer that, because we did hire them, and we got other stuff going on. But Trevor, can you help me to put the value of your ask versus this letter to justify how we can look at additional and maybe ask Crossroad to look at a piece of uh, also of the difference? There's a marketing value we know. Is that part of it or not? What will you, as your background, what do you think how we address this? So, yeah, we got the Crossroads report yesterday, and I think that in general, what I would say is it completely agrees with all the numbers that we've presented in terms of the ability to create, you know, value for the community, which is fantastic. I think there's a methodology question, which jumped off the page to me uh, immediately, which is the averaging of a couple of projects. And as someone who runs a data science company, what I can tell you is if you average a very small number of numbers, one number can have a very large influence. And so when you average in the percentage that went to the American Arts and Crafts Museum, which was a very tiny ask at the end of a you know, billionaire's project that he paid for the museum himself, right? that's going to throw off all of the other numbers uh, that exist. And in fact, if you take out that outlier, then everything else falls just in line with what the dolly is asking. So that's number one. And then number two is, as you know, so the discussion before had, you really have to think about this as a $110 million project, right? This is just the second phase of it. And so we're really looking for you know, a total of about 35% of the grand total, right? The fact that we've done this in two phases is, hey, that's smart business, right? You don't go out and build you know, a 1,500 room hotel without knowing that you know, you're gonna be able to fill it. Maybe you do that in a couple of phases, and that's what we've done here. And so it's turned out that we're going to request you know, about 35% of the total. 
So I think when you take those two things into consideration, I think we're in perfect alignment with the consultant's report. I got one argument with the methodology of averaging in the American Arts and Crafts Museum, which if you take that outlier out, the math makes perfect sense. And then the second thing is to say, uh, you know, let's really look at this as an overall $110 million project. So I think we'll actually say we just agree with the consultants, you know, and, um, but you have to take those two things into consideration. Thank you. Ryan. Yes, Madam, Madam Chair, may I um, address the Phillies? Well, I just want to. I just want to give an update. I'm meeting with the Chief Financial Officer tonight, and I've told them I need a proposal yesterday, so I think it's imminent. But I will let you know. Um, it makes me a little nervous when you're talking about the percentage changing, uh, if that's going to impact going forward. And that's why I suggested adding the commission into the invitation for going to the Dali. Because as you know, my predecessor hammered home the North versus, versus South County and the feeling a lot of times that most of the money went South County. I'm not saying it has, I'm new to this, but I just want to make sure that the Phillies get their due consideration when the time comes. Duly noted. And I will support the Dali, but again, I just want to make, put that on the record. Thank you. So well, Madam Chair, I, I absolutely want to um, make sure that we do, you know, what you've suggested and have everybody here, you know, down to the Dolly, including the County Commission. I know over the past couple of years, Hank has actually had everyone individually, you know, down and, and met with everyone, uh, which, which was great. But I think having a, a group together is fantastic. What I'll also say is that we're hoping to leave here today with a recommendation, and if that's possible. And the reason is, Time is getting to be, you know, of the essence. We've got the city uh, ready to go with the lease amendment, and we've got the money, and this is a shovel-ready project, and so we're ready to get to work. Uh, we'll, of course, take your lead and your recommendation, but, you know, we are, we are ready to go, excited to get this building built, and, um, you know, there's obviously, we've got to make it through here, and then we've got to make it through the county commission as, as well. So... Mike, you look like you have a question or thought. I, I was just going to ask, Madam Chair, if, if you would like to entertain a, a motion that we support this and recommend it to the BCC? Well, yes, as, as long as we're done with our questions. Mayor Bojowski? Sorry. I'll support that motion. But I, I, I do want to know, I mean, usually when we're looking at a funding request, um, Jim normally gives us a little spreadsheet that shows us where we are with our money moving forward. And I know there's not a bunch of stuff there because we're kind of done with all that stuff. But we, we know there was an old ask from the Phillies. We know how much that was. And I mean, so I can't, I, I can't see where the money is. I want to recommend the project. I'm not worried about the percentages per se. I, I'm looking at it from a whole picture perspective. And I don't see a reason why not, but I'm sure there's somebody that can argue that. So if I may, but ma I'm, I'm, What I want to know is when are we going to see that money thing? I mean, it, how do we recommend something without the money document? If I may put this in the proper order and position us for well, a recommendation. My whole point in sharing this background with you about where the commission is is because we are just now starting our budget cycle oh, yeah. for 2024. They weren't asking us to so look at this. The, the numbers that you're looking for, Mayor, we haven't even begun to plug those in, uh, and we don't know how the commission is going to go with regard to the subject matter that I've introduced. So if you can give us until, not for the recommendation, gentlemen, but on the money piece, if we can maybe schedule that for June, perhaps, if we might be ready by then. Um, I, I, I understand. I'm just talking about based on the old budget. I know it's in the budget. I mean, I've seen it. It's just, I, what I, can tell I don't want to hold you guys up, but I also think it's not responsible of us to not see it financially right, and then can, make a recommendation. I can tell you we have the money to fulfill this request. 
And so, Jim, do you have anything to add to what I have just said? I know you don't, you aren't privy to the backdoor conversations, but. Okay, so let's uh, have a motion if I, oh, and by the way, just so you know, I have already had a discussion with Michael on ensuring that we can take a field trip and not violate any sunshine issues. I mean, we certainly have done it for the Phillies. We've done it for, you know, everybody else that asks us for money. I'm sure that they'll find a way. But for right now, can I please have a motion to accept the rec? Yes, Mike. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept and recommend to the Board of County Commissioners and I'm support seconding for it. this. Okay, we have a motion, Stacy, and a second to recommend approval of the Dolly request for funding. Uh, do we have anybody in opposition? How about we start there? Anybody? All in favor? Aye. 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 Stacy, do we need a roll call vote? Yes. yes. Phil? Yes. Trish? Yes. Mike? Yes. Kofi? Yes. Russ? Yes. Yes. Mayor? Yes. Aye. <laughs> yes. Aye. Yes. And yes. Okay. Good job. That was easy. That's the easy part. Now we got to build a building. So we'll, yes. we'll, we'll see you in front of the County Commission. And thank you all very much for your support today. You're welcome. Nice to see you all. Great job. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we okay. look forward to your visits anytime. And we do too. Okay, now next is the Crossroad Consulting, Susan Ziegler. Ziegler. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, um, Susan is with uh, Crossroads Consulting, the consultant that we have hired related to our, our projects. Um, and so this is the report that she prepared related to Dolly. Okay. Where did she go? There she is. Susan. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, so the purpose of this discussion is really to tell you what we did, how we did it, discuss the methodology, and the results of the analysis to evaluate the capital project request by the DALI. This is important because we'll spend a little bit more time on methodology than normal because this is a process that we we'll use going forward for other, um, other projects. So with that, you have the full report, but um, we're gonna skip through. Uh, Dr. Hine and his team covered a lot of this. So this is really um, just, again, on the methodology perspective. We're, we wanna focus on this and other projects uh, as it relates to the criteria that was adjusted and approved recently as it relates to annual tourism economic benefits, the number of projected tourism room nights, tourism attendance, marketing and sponsorship benefits, which we talked about, contribution of the project to the overall strategic planning efforts for the county, and then the extent to which the capital project achieves geographic distribution. Dr. Hine and his team hit on this a little bit, but looking at the last six years of attendance, um, you know, this has really varied about 445,000 in 2017, which was impacted by a blockbuster exhibition, and then a right around 372,000 after that before COVID hit. And there was obviously a decline as pretty much everything um, experienced. So when we look at that, 2022 numbers are starting to rebound, but we're still not there yet. So um, that'll be something that we want to consider when we're looking at their projections as they relate to historical activity. Dr. Hine covered this, um, you know, really what the application uh, underway is to add that extra programmatic exhibit space, the conference center space, which I think is going to be exceptionally marketable in this community. Um, and, and just how much it's increased and, and taking the, the parking garage out of it. These are some graphic displays of what that looks like. Again, they kind of went through this in their presentation. One thing that I think is going to be important will be that rooftop space that's going to be exceptionally marketable, um, and, and that holds true to any type of public assembly facility. So the cost. Um, 
As part of our evaluation, we looked at what the Dolly and its advisors has provided, as well as the original application um, to provide perspective. So we're really looking at the numbers they gave, testing for reasonableness, and really just helping give you information to guide your decision-making process. So we've talked about that in 2019, the TDC recommended the county approve the 17 and a half million. So that was about 50% of the estimated construction cost at the time. Right now, uh, for the reasons that Dr. Hine talked about, this amount has increased substantially to about 68 million. We talked through that 80% uh, of the public supported the um, amendment or the referendum to amend the lease. One thing that's important as you go back to the overall qualifications and criteria is that the 99-year lease will still go through 2106, which meets that 20 years remaining on the lease uh, criteria. What are the expansion impacts and the overview? Because this is a pretty substantial increase um, from that in 2019. Falls into category D, as you all know. Um, you know, one thing that the Dolly did was hire research data services and they wanted to update that previous analysis. They had also done a visitor impact survey back in 2018, which gave solid intel on insights, visitor trip, how long, spending, uh, and those types of, of factors. Um, RDS has a lot of experience in doing these types of studies and including a lot of work for Pinellas County. Uh, one of the things when you look through the report, and again, we're just hitting the highlights and the, uh, the page numbers on here actually refer to your report, but we want to understand a couple things. When you're looking at attendees in those numbers, that's everybody. That's your day tripper, your overnight attendees that are staying and lodging, whether they came specifically for the Dolly or for another purpose and attendees that are staying in unpaid lodging, such as friends and families' homes. RDC notes, RDS, excuse me, notes that when they look at the calculations for economic impact, they wanna make sure that those are incremental. The, the goal is to make sure that you're trying to capture that that's specific to the Dolly existing. And so they don't include any of the impacts from Pinellas County resident spending. They include all of the overnight spending that would be attributable to specifically coming to visit the Dolly. And then they do one night of spending for those that are coming for other reasons, but use that as an added experience. And then one day of spending for people that are staying in unpaid lodging. And so that is just on the economic impact side. They're not attributing obviously any hotel room nights to that. And then any of the day trip spenders spending that is coming from outside of Pinellas County. So again, they really want to focus on the incremental estimates. So this is a lot. It's all in your report. But you know, as we talked about, we really want to focus on those bottom line numbers. And we're going to have some graphics that do that. But in terms of attendance, as stated previously, it's 3.6 million over that 10-year period in attendance, 968,000 room nights, and about 11.1 .1 million in tourist development tax. Again, that's specifically attributed to Dolly Museum uh, visitation. This is showing the incremental. So the first one, skipping back, this is really just the base, um, the base of operations. So if you did nothing, this is what that would be. When you expand, this is what that uh, means. So in the first year, it's about 33% more in terms of attendees, room nights, economic impact, everything that goes with that. And that increases to about 37, 38% in the remaining years after that year one. So again, this is all of that increment because of expansion. This table is really just showing the addition of the base museum plus the impact of expansion. One thing that's important to note is again, kind of circling back to the overall requirements for funding, is that this definitely meets the threshold in terms of both attendees, which is 50,000 minimum, as well as the tourism room nights, which is 25,000 annually. So we've met the criteria. We're gonna show some graphics and, and just hit some high points. So again, this is the attendee estimates. What you see is the attendance is relatively modest in year one. That happens for a lot of uh, similar facilities in case it doesn't open on time, people getting their operations uh, under, uh, under wraps uh, with a new asset. But then it increases pretty substantially in that year two. So it's about 14%. And then more modest, one, about 1.2 to 1.4%. 1 
So why that is, it's taking into account the historical trend when they moved into the new building or the current building, as well as all of the survey results that RDS did. So again, a pretty substantial increase. Uh, the important thing is we, th we believe that these uh, assumptions are reasonable. Um, Dr. Hine hit on this, but again, three quarters of the visitors are coming from out of area, and that's really going to be the focus. This graphic is really showing what that attendee distribution is for those uh, groups that we talked about, those subsets. <clears throat> so as you can see, 35% are day trippers, and 9% of all visitors are here specifically to see the dolly. It's their primary purpose of the visit. And some that are coming for the added trip, that's about 35% of the total visitors. And those staying in unpaid lodging, friends and family relatives, is about 10%. So pretty substantial um, that are coming from out of town. <clears throat> when we look at the room nights, it's a similar trend to that of attendance. It's a 15% increase between year one and two subsequent to expansion, and about 35 to 44% um, increase over fiscal year 2022 numbers. So again, where we are now, still haven't recovered from COVID, but a pretty substantial increase over doing nothing. Um, we think these are reasonable. The other thing is with the expansion of the convention and conference space, um, there really was nothing added into that. So they could be conservative from that perspective because that would be marketable space that could bring extra groups. Um, economic impact. So what are we really talking about? Um, this is a crux, and this is really focusing, again, on that incremental only. So the new direct spending is about $19.9 million, increasing in year 10 to $29.9 million. The total output, which is indirect and induced, which is commonly referred to as a multiplier effect, is about 39.6 um, million in year one. One thing we want to look at is the overall economic multiplier. So this is saying for every dollar that you put in, direct dollar you put in, you're getting a dollar 99 back, so 99% incremental. So we believe that the methodology that RDS used um, is reasonable, it's research-based, and they are really trying to keep with the incremental, which is really the spirit um, of, of the ask. This is a lot. If you have good eyes, you can read it. But this is really meant to just give you a snapshot of the level of analysis that they did for all 10 years. Um, this is a snapshot of just the base museum. But as a point of reference, so for day trippers, it's about $82 per person per day. For those where the museum is the primary visit, it's about $204 per person per day they're allocating and about $200 uh, where it's an added museum experience. This is the same thing. So they did this for base museum operations, and then they did that to show the impact of expansion. So this graphic is really meant to just be a snapshot. So it's showing what the projections are for 2023. As we mentioned, the likely opening is, is scheduled more for quarter four of 2026. So uh, you know a little bit of difference just in the years. But uh, looking at years one, five, and 10, if we look at the bottom graphic, right? So as Dr. Hine and his team uh, discussed, in aggregate for that 10-year period, we're looking at 4.9 million attendees, 1.3 million room nights, 954 million in direct spending, 1.9 billion in total output, again, direct, indirect, and induced, and 15.2 million in TDT. Of that, we've kind of talked through what's incremental. It's still substantial. So if you'll remember back from that graph, of the 4.9, it's about 1.3 million is attributable to the expansion project and about 356,400 room nights because of the expansion. And circling back to the TDT, it's about 4.1 million, again, uh, attributable to the expansion. The tourist development tax, um, you know, we've kind of talked through this. This is certainly um, a conversation that you were just having in terms of how do we allocate these dollars? Um, our job is really to give you more guidance, not make decisions for you. But, you know, just on some current information, Jim may talk about this in more detail as well going forward. But the current funding request of $34 million represents 36% of the total gross collections in 2022 at the county level. Uh, the city of St. Pete represented about 10% of that. Um, and this ask would be about 16% of the forecasted amount for the 40% allocated to capital projects as of right now. 
for 2023 to, through 2027, um, just as a, a, a point of reference. We talked through marketing and sponsorship benefits. Um, the Dolly management did a good job in the original application in terms of going through what its strategies are, allocating 48% of the budget at that time of its advertising budget uh, to out-of-market spending, looking at continuing to team with and partner with Visit St. Pete Clearwater to continue to drive visitation to the museum. And it really estimated that the uh, 50 million impressions they valued at $20 million at the time. As mentioned earlier, with the international exposure, that's really 6 million impressions over the past eight years. And in its new information, the Dolly has committed that they would invest $2 million annually on strategic marketing beginning the year prior to the expansion's opening. This is checking one of the boxes on the overall um, criteria that was discussed earlier. Um, so, you know, how does it factor into the overall strategic plan for the county? So it obviously generates significant economic impacts, as we've talked about, through visitation, incremental room nights, job creation. Um, and one of the key points of the strategic plan that was done is unanimous, unanimously stakeholders agreed that the arts and culture are an essential part of Pinellas County. So kind of, again, trying to, to consider sports and arts and everything that goes with that beach renourishment, um, it was considered to be an important part of, of the county. So it's clearly an asset. We've gone through historically what it's done um, and, and then also, you know, what's anticipated with this expansion. So as I said, really, um, you know, this is a big ask and it's important to consider within the context of other potential asks. So it's still one half of the project cost. The 34 is half of the 68. It's just 95% higher than the original um, ask of $17.5 million. So the purpose of this part of the, the report was to help guide some metrics that you might want to consider as you as you evaluate what amount to, to provide for a capital grant. So we looked at different things. One is an obvious question, what's the payback period? So this is the investment. We're looking at what we're going to get back. So we've looked at it in a couple things. We think looking at it holistically is probably a little bit better approach. We've really focused on the TDT tax, but also looking at the local option sales tax and then combining those. So we've looked at it two ways. One is an unadjusted payback period. So if you look at it just in today's dollars at the 34 million, if you just looked at the TDT tax over that period, it would be about a 19 year payback. If you combine the two taxes, it'd be about a 13 year payback. If we looked at a discounted payback period, we, where are we accounting for the time value of money? It's about 20, 27 years combining those two tax sources. So that's one common um, metric of just how long until we get paid back for our investment. So then we started to look at a couple other things that was referenced earlier. So one is to consider the percentage of incremental new attendees, room nights, economic impact, TDT, um, relative to the base operations. So we know we, we have an estimate of what's going to happen if we do nothing, and then we have an estimate if we expand. So if we look at that, it's about 37% more in all of those uh, metrics. So if we were to apply that, that would give you a capital uh, grant potential request of $25.2 million. The next one, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, there have been capital grants that have been awarded in the last cycle. And so one is certainly just to look at historically what has been awarded versus what the development cost is. So as was mentioned, the average is about 35%. So if we were to apply that same average to the new development cost, that's about $24 million. There is definitely an outlier. Um, and so again, this, does, this isn't um, referring to what the ask was. This is referring to what the award was. So decisions were made, you know, that outlier for 9%. So if we were to take that 9% out, it would be about 44%, which would yield about 29.9 million. So one of the things that we'll talk about, um, this is a little bit busy for a slide, but this is also like, okay, we went through a detailed application process. It was approved. Why don't we look at how our ask now compares to what that was in the original application? So 
it, it's interesting because the base, because of COVID and everything that's happened with that, the base numbers are actually lower on the attendees and the room nights generated, but the incremental is much higher. And so when we look at the differential between the current request and the previous application, it's about 58% more in TDT revenues and in other metrics as well, um, economic impact. So applying that would yield an additional 10.2 million over what had already been approved, which would be about 27.7 million. So that's a lot, it's a lot of numbers, and it's always hard to follow really cool pictures of a really cool asset in the community. But having said that, again, our job is to try and av advise you based on numbers. There's a lot that you have to consider as has been previously discussed. But just to recap, if we were to look at these three different methodologies, you know, the, the spread is not that great. You know, it's somewhere between 24 million and 27.7. Um, even if we looked at that other one and we took the outlier out, it's somewhere around 29.9 million. So, um, you know, that's kind of the snapshot. That's the information we gave, again, to help with your decision making. And with that, um, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Questions? Bill? Um, <clears throat> thank you. It's a very thorough um, deep dive into their numbers and uh, a great report. Um, when you're looking at this, are you, are you considering our capital guidelines project, which really you know, is a point system? And I didn't really see that in your, in your report and how you would have allocated based on that. So for this particular one, we did not utilize the point system because this is a very unique situation, right? There's already been an application, it's already been approved. You know, this is another request. Where we tend to use that, which was recently approved, would really be when we're comparing projects. It has a lot more value, for instance, when you went through the last one, you were looking at five, six, seven projects, then the point system makes more sense. So our role for this was really to look at what the new data was as it related to the previous application, test for reasonableness, and come up with maybe some, some analysis that would help you guide whether to approve the complete 34.4 million, 34.5 million. This is probably beyond the scope, but did you, in your analysis of, of comparing with other grants that we've awarded, did you look at the return on investment of those, or just strictly how much we gave them. We did not look at the return on investment of those. Yeah, I, I think that's really important in this case. Um, I don't think any of their projects meet what this one does as far as return on investment. That's a really good point, and I think that that's something that was um, a discussion in the update of the guidelines and the revisiting of the point system moving forward is, you know, we've given these, these grant awards. Now what happens and kind of following up after that to see, you know, what that return was. So I know that Steve and I have talked about doing that for future awards. We can certainly talk about, you know, potentially doing that. Part of that is actually going to be getting data from those people who have already been awarded those, right. you know, grants. So there's that. <laughs> I think it's real important if you're going to compare to other projects that you, that you have apples to apples, so to speak. <clears throat> when you look at I those totally numbers. agree. And, uh, you know, as far as our actual guidelines go, it checks every box at 100%. Yep, it that's does. Right. So I think everybody realizes that, and that's why they already put a motion through. Yep. I do appreciate all the, the information. This helps us a lot, and it will help us a lot for future um, asks to, to better understand exactly where the numbers fall. So thank you for your efforts. Anyone else? Anybody? All right, thank you so thank much. Thank you, appreciate it. And now we are on our <clears throat> budget presentation. Jim, I know we've all been anxiously awaiting your comments. This is an action item, so if you'd like to come up to the podium, that would be great. Why are you looking at me like? Oh. Um, Madam Chair, I know we're talking about the budget as a whole, and Jim will be the first thing on the agenda. So I just wanted to say thanks to the group previously uh, for the discussion we had on, on the Dolly. Uh, again, you got a chance to hear from Susie, so how she's looking at, at things, and I think makes a lot of sense in the, how she's reviewing all, all of the data. Phil, on the ROI, just real quickly, that is in the, the scope going forward, but what we would go back and look at is probably look at any project that's five years old or more that we funded, and then look at ROI based on that. So again, that was something that has been added. 
So um, on the budget uh, on the budget process, um, this is you got a very thick binder with a lot of, of detail, and we'll have uh, presentations uh, from uh, uh, from the staff, and, and we'll go through and, and, and walk through that. But I wanted Jim to kick everything off because I think more importantly is to understand a the revenues, you know, coming in, and then b. Um, and to Mayor Julie's point, is on the, the capital side as well, the, the money that, that's there. So I, I will turn that over to uh, Mr. Abernathy. Uh, thank you. Jim Abernathy with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the revenues continue to be strong in the current fiscal year. Uh, right now we're estimating that we're going to collect about $95.8 million in TDT tax. And that compares to the, uh, the adopted budget of $91 million, so that's about $4.6 million um, above the budget that is projected at this point. Um, again, we've only, uh, collect, or we only have information through March um, for our, basing our uh, estimates on so as we get more information, uh, we make adjustments to this number. Uh, but when the, uh, uh, when the budget will be presented to the board, it'll be around the $95 million or $95.8 million range in FY23. Um, for FY24, we have a, uh, the, the budget request is going to be uh, basically flat at $95.6 million. Um, the, the way we budget is the revenues are at 95% of what we're projecting, so we're projecting uh, around $100 million in revenue, um, but what we budget is at 95%. So that, that, um, that is a, a, a $4.6 million increase from the current fiscal year's budget, and it'll be right in line with the current fiscal year's projection. Um, so that's about a 5% increase from FY23. Um, the, on the expenditure side, uh, the departments will get into each of their requ individual requests, um, but in general, the, uh, the reserves are projected to be at $222.1 million in FY24. Um, of that, uh, the operating reserves are $112.3 million, and the capital reserves are uh, right about 110 million. Um, as a percentage, um, each percent of the TDT is uh, projected to be worth almost $16 million. Um, so when we look at the beach amount, um, that'll be about, um, about almost $8 million would be dedicated to the beach, or eight and a half million, uh, and the, um, the amount that we have budgeted right now for the beach transfer in FY24 is $10.3 million. And what that is, is the proje projected half of the third percent in FY24 plus $2.4 million that was collected for the beach purposes in FY22 that were not allocated because when we do the budget, we don't know exactly how much is going to be collected. So we, we do a catch up. Uh, the following uh, budget process. So in total, it'll be uh, $10.3 million uh, at this point will be um, transferred for beach, uh, beach projects. Um, go to the, the capital. Um, there's been questions about the chart that we, I provide on a regular basis. Uh, it is in the book, it's page 16. Um, of the, the binder that each of you have. And as you can see, there's the only project that we have um, that's been approved and the agreement has been signed is um, the Florida Holocaust Museum, which was approved um, a handful of years ago. And that is for uh, improvements to the safety, I believe, uh, at the museum. Um, there have been issues with that of, of getting it completed uh, this is a reimbursement grant, so we don't pay it until they actually expend it. Um, so we keep rolling it forward until they're actually able to, to get that project complete. Um, so what we do have identified in here 
is the original request from the Phillies uh, from a handful of years ago, and that is for $40 million. Um, we keep pushing the time frame out for reimbursement because the project has not been finalized. The, um, the ask has been approved um, in, in concept, but the actual agreement with the, with the Phillies has not been um, reached, has not been brought back to the board for final approval. Uh, same goes for the St. Pete Historical Society of 2.8 million, and then the original uh, Dolly request of uh, 17.5 million. Um, I, I do want to point out that while that has been, um, it's been recommended by the TDC and it's been approved in concept by the board, it has never been, there has never been an agreement that has been reached and it has never been in the actual budget. So any request that is approved ultimately would be new money added to the budget. It has not, it's just been identified as a potential future project at the original price of $17.5 million. And what is it you're talking about right there? The, the Dolly, uh, oh. their, their original request. Um, the board approved the concept. Uh, the agreement between the county and, and the Dolly has never been finalized, so it has never gone into the actual budget. Same with the original Phillies con uh, request of $40 million and the Historical Society. Uh, I've, I believe that there are a couple other projects that are um, in a close state, and I'm not referring to the, to the Rays, um, but other uh, smaller projects that may come forward that have not been captured in here. So if there are things that you hear about or know about and they're not in here, it's because I don't know about them. Um, as new projects uh, come on, come onto our radar, we will add it on here so that we're able to keep a, a pretty good accounting of uh, potential future needs. And considering we only have one project other than Beach, uh, there's not a whole lot to, to go over in detail on this. For clarity, so you're on page 16, um, your forecast does not include those potential. Correct, uh, I, I only have the, what is known commitments uh, and the, yeah. Yeah, the, the BCC every year commits half of the third percent uh, for beach renourishment. So we, we continue that into in the forecast and anything else until there's been an agreement, we don't include it. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jim, on, on page 16, and we, I think I brought this up last year also. So we have, for instance, the American Crafts Museum at six million long since funded. Um, and all these lists of 10 or so items um, with no money, when do we get to pull those off of this? Because it's, right, it's already paid for. Right, it, this is an informational document so that you can, you can look back and, and remember that we paid uh, the Craftsman Museum $6 million or we paid the city of Dunedin $41.7 million for, the, uh, for the, the Dunedin the state, or for the Blue Jays Stadium or, the, or Eddie, Eddie Seymour at a half million. This is a historical document so that you can continue to see what we've done uh, as, as the program in general. How about Tampa Bay Watch? Has a, it doesn't have a number there, but it has no projected um, expenses yeah. going forward. I think, there, it, I think there was, but when they put it in here. Oh, somehow it was, just, it's fine. I think it was removed. Um, it might just be a formatting issue. But we paid it a long yeah, time ago. And, it, so. it's, it's been paid. Um, I don't think it was a, a, a lot of money, I mean, Compared comparatively. To, yes. um, but it is uh, something that we've already paid. So those are projects that have uh, come through here, adopt or agreed to by, with the board, agreements have been signed, projects have been completed, and payments have been made. How long do you project these staying on here for five years, 10 years, one year? It's I could take them off today. It, well, I mean, as I said, this is just asking. a document to give perspective of what we've done. Uh, so when you want to compare mm -hmm. other projects, you can, it's a, I mean, if, as we get more and more projects, it's not going to be um, feasible to keep that on there because it, it's already spilling over on the two pages here. So, you know, I can remove them at any, at any point. It's. Commissioner Gardas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, my only request would be if we're going to keep them on there, if we could add the year in which that funding occurred. 
that would be that yep. would be helpful. Otherwise, I I, I yep, I, I, that that's a fair request. Yeah, relative. You know, I don't know whether it was last year or ten years ago. Yep. So. Uh, that would be my only request, if possible, if we're if we're going to keep them on there. If that's I can, what. I can also move them as a as a footnote, so that they're not in the in the middle of the page. A footnote uh, would be awesome with the yeah. year of funding. Yeah. I think that would I, I think it would probably make the spreadsheet a little easier. Yeah, this was a, a spreadsheet that was adopted several years ago and has been mainly used for internal purposes, and um, it makes sense to me. But I'm not the the ultimate consumer of it, so I should uh, listen to your request. No, I, I like having it. I like being able to see it. I just want to know when it happened. And I think as a footnote, it would make a lot of sense to yep. That's all. Thank you very much. Commissioner Henderson. I was just going to add to that and say, why don't you pull them off and have a separate sheet on past yep. fundings that have been complete and then current on one page and past on another and yeah, with a year. And that'd be uh, I'll make the updates for the, the next time it goes out to everyone. Quite. Question. Uh, Russ. How much is in the uh, uh, beach renourishment account now total in reserves? Um, I believe we started the fiscal year with like $32 million. Um, it's, that, is, that has been transferred and has not been used. Um, I, want, I don't want to stake everything on that because that might be the number that is going to be in there in 24, but it was um, it's 20, 25 to 35 million dollars has been is in the account at the beginning of this this fiscal year. It, so you're saying 25 and through 22 or 23? Yes. Yeah, we, we started 23 with that amount in the account. Um, that has not been spent, that had previously been transferred. If, if you could, could you give us the, for the, the meeting somewhere along, the reserve amount, how much is there is through 22, what we're adding in 23, what we also increased it to, and then our forecast for 24 to know where we are, because this is a major discussion that everybody in is making a lot of press, so we should know. Where yeah, I, so I do have it. I just I, I, I don't have it. I mean, I, I could probably if you can look it up, that'd be great if we yeah. could have that for the meeting. Any other questions from the members? Um, Jim, in the cent that we have been setting aside dollars for the raise, how much is in there now? We have not been setting anything aside for any specific project. We have been setting aside the 40 percent each year in the capital reserve account, which could be used for any capital project. We have not split anything out um, for any particular project if it's not been committed to. Okay, but hypothetically, maybe I'm not asking no, the right question. You are. What, oh, thank you. <laughs> what has been set aside for capital projects at this point is just under $80 million in ending fund balance for capital reserves. What we are projecting at the end of, uh, for the 24 budget would be about $110 million in capital reserves that could be used for any allowable uh, capital project that is, a, uh, is approved by the board in agreement reached. So of that, in that money, it could be for the Rays, it could be for the Phillies, it could be for the Dolly, uh, any and all of those projects uh, up to the amount of funding that we have available. Um, okay, thank you very much. Hold on just one moment, Mayor. Mayor Oggs, the Phillies, you said you got a letter last night? No, I have a meeting this evening. Oh, you have a meeting this yes, evening. Yes, and it was, if I may, um, Mr. Hayes and I met to get caught up a couple of weeks ago, and we discussed the fact that their project has immensely grown with their investment and what they're doing there. We haven't seen the final yet, but I will tell you the ask is going to be more than $40 million. It's and, what? And the, it's going to be more than $40 million, and they're going to be able to justify it by the scope of the project. Now, I haven't seen it, but I know the investment by them is going to be upwards of $200 million. 
because they bought the whole shopping center. They're doing probably going to build a hotel, mixed use. There's a whole lot of different stuff going in there. Um, again, I haven't seen it, so we'll talk. But that just, uh, I just want to put that out there that, and we discuss the fact that, that we understand the scope of the project has changed dramatically since they came forward before. Well, that's really interesting because um, I didn't get my invitation either when they did their fly-in this last year. So I have no idea in the world what they're thinking, what they're doing, or. At that point, this hadn't gotten to that point. I didn't get an invite either, so. Well, you weren't there yet, I don't think. Well, I usually go every year, <laughs> so. Okay, but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's changed dramatically since then, ma'am. So, from what I understand, again, I haven't seen it, so I'll, I'll learn more this evening. Well, I would appreciate if you could find out, hypothetically, a time frame that they intend to yeah, come forward because we're I need, I need in the process of so budget right I talked right to now. their owner two weeks ago and he told me it was imminent, John Middleton. So we're going to find out more this evening. Okay. And um, to answer Russ's question, uh, we had $32.8 million in the, the beach um, portion of the capital fund at the end of FY23. 32.8? Yes. That does, that does not include the money that we have in the budget to transfer this year. That was what we began FY23 with as, um, I, we'll call it, beginning fund balance for beach projects. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Henderson? Is that included in the, or the uh, projected no, the ten million. No, that so it's a completely separate. It's a completely separate. Plus. Well, this the money, the hundred and ten million dollars that I'm talking about here, is what is in the tourist development tax fund, which is separate from the beach where the beach money is. The beach money is every year is transferred from the tourist tourist development tax fund to the county's capital projects fund. So it's it's gone. It's we count it in the in the tour, tourist development tax fund as being spent because it's it's removed. It's not part of um, the reserves, reserves right. right? So it, it's it's already allocated for beach. It's already been moved out of the fund spent. and is not related to the capital fund that we're talking about within the uh, the TDT fund. So we have 32 million and 110 million. Correct. Great. So when you're talking about the reserves that were mentioned earlier, the capital reserves, yes. is that over and above what we see on our document? Like, for instance, if I look at, you know, beginning fund balance for the, right. for the capital, I'm just looking at the beginning of 24. It says the beginning fund balance is 81.8. Correct. That's the reserve you're... No. The so the 80 million that you're referring to is part of the total, the total resources for the fund. We start with the beginning fund balance. We have projected re revenues, which give us the the total resources that are available uh, for the fund, which is in FY 24 would be 274.6 million dollars. Um, and then we we on the expend on the expenditure side, we have all of the personnel all the contracts, all of the uh, capital needs of the department, such as computers, displays, things like that. And then we also have the transfer to the capital fund, which is $10.3 million. We also have uh, the cost of collecting the taxes that we pay to the Pinellas County tax collector. Uh, and then whatever's left, that is the reserve. So to be clear, the money that's available for us to allocate to projects, that's what I'm trying to get at does not include that $80 million reserve you're speaking to. So for instance, if I'm just looking at page, sorry, uh, 16, right? And you've got, the, you've got the beginning fund balance, you've got the revenue, you've got our expenses, including beach renourishment, and then you've got ending fund balance. That, this page does not include those 80, that $80 million reserve you're referring to. The, 80, the $81 million of beginning fund balance that you're referring to is available to use 
if we use that above what is on this chart, then the reserve level would be lower. Because the reserves are whatever's left over after we start with the beginning fund balance and add the revenue and take out whatever expenses. So we have potentially. Uh, so potentially. I'm so so you, so it is the reserve. No, they're not the same thing. Uh, beginning fund balance is what we have on hand on October 1st of of 2023. The reserves are a piece of all of the resources that we have that we're going to set aside and not use. So, right. That's why I'm trying to get at what right. I'm trying to understand is, the, is there really $81 million floating out there year after year that's not being used in the question about the raise? That's what I'm asking. There, there would be. And that's not part of what we're currently spending, talking about spending on Dolly, Phillies, and anything else that comes out. The, the $110 million in capital reserves, or what's on here of $111 million, um, includes the $81 million that, of beginning fund balance. Okay. Okay. So there isn't some fund of $81 million just sitting out there? No, no nothing is just sitting out there. It's either going to, going to go to an appropriation such as the beach or a capital project, or it's going to go into the reserves. Okay. So the, the reserves are what we expect to have at the end of the year. Gotcha. That's what I'm trying to get at. So there is no special set aside for the raise, which had been talked about, which is what you were asking about, um, Madam Chair. When that, fir that cent got increased, that was the idea, was to set that aside for the raise back That's in the right. day. Um, I don't know where it got decided along the way that that wasn't going to happen, but it hasn't. So. I just want to be clear that there is no $81 million setting aside. It's right, part of our I capital get it. That's thing. That's why I asked the question, because in my head, from the time I've been on the commission, right. I have always heard that sixth cent referred to. Me too. And maybe it's just in my head. No, me I too. I heard the same thing. That's <laughs> why I'm trying to get, I'm trying well, to get that clarified. At what point it just all of a sudden went into a big pot? From the very beginning, it was part of the 60-40 the split. Uh, it was 60% was going to operating uh, promotions, marketing, and advertising, and 40% was being set aside for any future project. Uh, there was there was there was never a time when we set aside money for any particular project that was not agreed to. Whether it was the Clearwater Mar Marine Aquarium, the Dunedin Stadium uh, for the Blue Jays, um, previously for the Tropicana Field site. The fourth percent was automatically sent to the city of St. Petersburg to, to pay our commitment to um, to their debt for the the Tropicana Field. Um, once that commitment ended, it all became one one bucket of money for capital projects, uh, as agreed to by or as when the when the projects are approved by the the BCC and an agreement is reached. And I'm I'm not trying to be argumentative, Jim. Please understand. It's just that in my head, the argument for in, imposing that sixth cent was for assurance that we would always have the dollars for a new request from the raise. That's just the way I understood it, and I'm only one person. But, okay, did you have something? Commissioner Henderson and then Doreen. <laughs> um, I think what happened when we imposed this, the six, it was, <clears throat> we weren't counting it as something we would spend until we determined what our breakdown of capital and marketing would be. So it was a short time that we were kind of just holding off on using that six cent <clears throat> until we determined the 60-40 split, in which case it became one bucket or the other. So I think that's what you're remembering is, uh, when we first imposed the six, it was like, okay, we're going to set this aside until we figure out how much we're going to spend where. And uh, once we determined a 60-40, I think, is uh, when it went into the two buckets he's talking about. So that's why it was in your head, I think. But it didn't last very long. Just confirming what Phil's saying and, you know, relying on historical memory of things at the time, because 
there was no ask at that point. You know, we knew that there was an end date coming, and I recall that it then just kind of went into the fund without it being specifically earmarked for the raise. And Got so it. I'm agreeing with, with Phil's, yeah, you know, background and perspective. Did you have something, Mayor? No? Okay. Any more questions for Jim? No? All right, then we are on uh, Steve. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. And Katie, we need to introduce Katie, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, to start on the department budgets, um, and what I'll do as I introduce each of the different speakers, I'll refer you to the pages within the budget book even though there's a, a binder tab for the different departments, just, just so it's easier uh, for you to go through and, and see that. Uh, first up is gonna be uh, Katie Bridges, and Katie's gonna go through and talk about our advertising and promotions, and that is on, uh, oh, actually, before, actually for Katie, I've got a quick overview, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I want to just do a quick overview, kind of set the stage uh, for everything. Okay. Um, in that, um, if you will refer to, uh, some of it's not in, oh, actually, uh, next slide, please. I'll let the guys in the back drive. There we go. All right, next slide. There we go. And, and this is just kind of elementary, but I kind of want to set the stage for everything else that we're going to go through and see. So looking at the vision of Visit St. Pete Clearwater is how do we inspire travel to St. Pete Clearwater, a destination of unique communities, cultures, and experiences. Next slide. And then looking at the mission itself to develop and implement innovative global sales and marketing initiatives that will bring sustainable visitation to the destination for the economic benefit of our residents, businesses of Pinellas County, its number one employer, uh, tourism. Uh, next slide. So yeah, I think if you go back and look, you know, take into those two things, I think our mission critical job is how do we grow direct spending by visitors to St. Pete Clearwater? And in 2022, that was $6.8 billion. That does not include, you know, the economic impact, the multipliers. This is direct spending by our visitors. And then to uh, grow jobs that are supported by tourism. And in 2022, that was over 100,000 uh, people. Um, and then look at the who benefits when we're successful in making that happen. Well, one, businesses, especially local and small. And I really, I really want to point that out because even though tourism is a major employer, major business here in Pinellas County, it's small business that is the beneficiary. Think about, you know, whether I'm a local shop, a restaurant, um, you know, he, he, you know, you have someone like Dali as being a major venue, still is small business when you look at um, uh, you know, go through it and, and, and put it into context. Also, local communities, and you know, part of it is, and, and also for residents, but part is that quality of place as we talk about capital projects. Um, think about you know, the beach renourishment. The fact is that our visitors are paying for that renourishment to be done. Uh, look at the amount that the visitors contribute to for a uh, penny for Pinellas. Um, and how that helps with the infrastructure. And then, you know, the fact is that we've got places that visitors can, can go to. So really, if we're successful in doing the growing of the spending, but also the jobs, it's, that, that's really the three groups of folks that it's going to help out. Um, and then next slide. All right, how do we accomplish that? And this really gets down to the, this is where we, you know, the rubber hits the road. And really, we're, we're doing this through the development of sales and marketing programs that increase overnight visitors staying in paid lodging. And I know some people you know, talk about, well, why is it you're only you know, looking out for the lodging industry? Well, it, well, the one item, even though it's 30% of our total visitors, it represents 75% of this direct spend in the community. And so um, the other 70% generate 25 percent and that's basically you're coming here for vfr i'm coming here as, as, as a as a day trip so that's why it's you know going out and finding that visitor getting them to stay the night because it's going to go through and increase that that spending uh, next slide 
and looking at four pillars and principles providing guidance in our programs, activities, and key objectives going forward. One is, as, as mentioned, increase the economic impact of each visitor. Two, developing the assets of the region. Three, increasing the economic benefits of tourism to the communities. And then four, deepening partnerships across Pinellas County. So really looking at the different departments, how can things, how can the things that they're looking at doing or have been doing impact those specific four um, areas? And then looking forward into uh, 2024, um, just some things that, you know, that I kind of want to point out. Next slide, please. Uh, one is uh, room in inventory. Um, and I, you know, again, I think it's been a while since we have seen a large increase in the number of, of room supply in the market. But right now you're looking at roughly 2,000 rooms over the next uh, two to three years. Looking at that, um, and again, when I say the St. Pete submarket, that includes the beach and downtown. So really the southern part of the county, if you look at Clearwater to Clearwater Beach, it's going from um, the beach over to, over to the bay, the, really the northern part of, of the county. The only exception to that is there is one where it does include um, uh, Tarpon, but it also then goes up into Pasco County and then goes over a little bit into Oldsmar. Um, and I can, you know, uh, pull that in there, but then I get PASCO da data. So this is strictly, you know, Pinellas County looking at roughly about a 9% increase in new room inventory, um, which is roughly about 2,000 rooms. 12% uh, of that really in the St. Pete, St. Pete Beach submarket, and about 6% for Clearwater, Clearwater Beach market. I think one of the keys to point out with that is the types of properties that are going in. Um, and a lot of them are unique brand, uh, 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 um, brands like, uh, you know, uh, like with Marriott having auto, you know, the autograph collection, um, or like, you know, Moxie, they're more lifestyle brands. But if you look at what's happening, not only on Clearwater Beach, but also in the, the St. Pete submarket as well, you've got a variety of, the, of these different properties. The other thing we're seeing as well is uh, we're starting to see the number of keys per property starting to go up a little bit. And, and there is a difference between the Clearwater submarket and then the, the St. Pete submarket. Um, also looking ahead, uh, return to normal competition for the visitor dollar and, and attention. Um, and, and I say that because, uh, you know, there was a, a I was at a, a U.S. travel meeting and they talked about international travel, but they looked at it from the outbound standpoint. And I think the number was like 75% of the seats going to Europe for this summer are already sold. And so you think about that as compared to last year, those are people that, there, a lot of those people were, they were traveling within the United States because to them, some of that international market w was closed. Well, now they have the ability uh, to go to different places. I, I can't tell you how many times on Facebook I've seen friends that are in Spain, Portugal, Italy. I mean, it's like this, they're all going to the same place. I'm surprised they haven't like, had like a family reunion or a friend reunion at some of these places. Um, but again, the competition is returning to what, what I'll call to normal. Um, international travel inbound is still not expected to fully recover until 2024, even though we've seen gains in 2023. And again, looking at that nationally, um, you know, that's what we're seeing. Florida, I think, is a little bit different, so I think we're seeing a better business. But again, it's still not to the levels that we saw pre-pandemic. Um, looking at corporate business travel as well as meetings and conferences, it's still slow to recover. It's coming back, but it's still slow. And what that's doing is putting more pressure on properties on get. Uh, of, of keeping that leisure vo uh, visitor uh, volume because uh, they don't have the group business. And then as far as meetings and conference business, and we'll, we'll chat about that a little bit later, um, that business usually books two to three years out. Our pace right now, and I'll show a chart with that uh, for FY25, 26, is good, but it's a little bit below where we need to be. And as you get new properties on and, and some of those have meeting space, you know, we need to make sure that we're trying to fill that now. I know, I know we're not thinking about 25 when we you know, are building the budget uh, for 24, but you still need to be able to have, have the programs um, out there. 
All right, next slide, please. All right, now we'll get into uh, just preliminarily from the budget, and this would deal with page, um, these next two slides will be page 18 in the budget book and page uh, 22. So page 18, um, and this one looks at our expense area, and the three areas are operations, and then really promotions, direct programming, and then personnel. Um, in there, you can see what the operating actuals are, were for fiscal year 22. So previous years, when we've presented the budget, we've had where we are to date for the fiscal year. And typically, by the time we submit the budget, we're only five months in, so it really doesn't give a, a, a full picture of where we're at. So what we did this year is we went back and said, what were the actuals in fiscal year 22? Since we've moved through the pandemic, we're starting to see you know, a lot of things return to normal and what we're doing. Um, and so I, I think it's good to go through and add that information in there. And then so we did put in the operating budget for fiscal year 23 and then our request for fiscal uh, 24. When you, uh, and then if, so again, you can look at operations, promotions, and then uh, personnel. So you can see at fiscal year 22, grand total, our budget of 32.6 million. Uh, last year, we were at 41, or this current year, 41.3. And then the uh, request going forward, 41.1 million for fiscal year 24. Uh, next slide, please. In, in this case, and this will be related to page 22 within the budget book, and this one is looking at the department. So one of the things um, strategically is, is really dividing the organization up into, into four groups, um, marketing, business development, community engagement, the last one being ad administrative. But I wanted to go through and show what was being spent by marketing, business development, and community engagement, and then the, the sub areas. So marketing still 79% of the dollars that'll be, that, that we're requesting for uh, fiscal year 24 go into marketing at 23.4 million. 15.9 of that is uh, advertising promotions, uh, 7.1 is digital and data, and then uh, uh, 256,000 is communications. Um, under business development, that's where we have the film commission, meetings and conventions, sports and events, and then global travel. Global travel is combining both what we previously identified as leisure travel, and then uh, and Latin America is all combined into what we call global travel now. Again, representing 18% of our expenditures or our request for next year. And then last is community engagement in there. It's brand activations and then community relations. Um, and that's 3% uh, th uh, of, of our budget. So I wanted to put that into perspective because this year was the first year from the budget where we've gone through and have those uh, uh, departments and breaking those out. Um, so it was a little bit challenging. I applaud uh, Terry for working with Jim and the budget office to kind of divvy those up so we can make good comparisons. Um, and page uh, 22 of, of that kind of does, does that by showing if there were dollars in, let's say, another area um, and we, we moved it, you could still look at, at what, was, what was being spent. So that kind of, um, and then also in, in the budget book, um, and we kind of give more of, an, of a summary of really where we see things are, are happening. It's more of a narrative. And again, with the budget book this year, what we did is we went through and worked with um, um, with BVK, and I, I wanted you know I wanted similarities by each of the different areas. So hopefully, as you read that, you went through and saw you know each of them gave you know a SWOT analysis for their department and the audiences they're trying to reach, things that are happening, key priorities, um, and so every, I wanted things looking the same so that as you look at it, the, you could see the commonalities to it, and I you know I think it would also help kind of clean up compared to how how, how we've we've done it uh, previously. So on that note, the very first um, uh, department. Uh, would be advertising and promotion, and then uh, that would be Katie Bridges, senior advertising manager, and her information is in pages 25 through 33 of the um, budget book. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, 
Good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to share with you um, some highlights and updates and some initiatives moving forward for FY24. So we are well on our way with our FY23 media plans. I uh, presented the plans for October through March last fall and the plans for April through September at last month's TDC meeting. As you'll recall, we have extensive broadcast, digital billboards, print media bias spanning our target markets, which we have broken down into developmental and maintenance. Developmental Chicago, Atlanta, Indianapolis, New York City, and new for this fiscal year, Minneapolis and Detroit. And our maintenance markets, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, St. Pete, Nashville, and Cincinnati. I also shared with you that we uh, did an activation in New York City on January 31st in partnership with US Travel Association's National Plan for Vacation Day. It was um, our first large presence in New York City in um, several years. Um, and then we also wanted to share with you a reminder that we continue to focus uh, on highlighting St. Pete Clearwater as a premier arts destination, targeting arts enthusiasts and some of their favorite arts-focused magazines, such as Art in America, Playbill Magazine Chicago, Encore Magazine Atlanta, Flamingo Magazine, and Florida. And although we have identified these highly targeted tactics, tactics to promote the arts, we also run arts-focused ads nationally in Condé Nast Traveler, Afar Magazine, New York Times, and several city lifestyle publications. And new this year, we have partnered with Creative Pinellas to develop an arts and culture co-op advertising program that will reach in-destination visitors, paying off on the, the advertising that we're doing out of market. And like past year's uh, follow-up campaign, uh, post-campaign advertising effectiveness study with destination analysts will be deployed um, the next month. And we look very forward to sharing those results with you later this summer um, in my book uh, on the uh, key performance indicators. Um, I have some of the stats from our previous uh, annual post-campaign advertising effectiveness studies, and we will look to um, to, to be comparable with those metrics and really understand um, the, the markets that we're in and how, how they're um, growing and the media tactics that we're using. Also this year, um, we published the 11th edition of our Gulf to Bay Destination magazine. Um, it will uh, release next week. The um, 116 page glossy magazine um, will offer potential visitors a resource about uh, planning their next getaway to St. Pete Clearwater. Um, this year, we've infused our Let's Shine brand creative and kept the content features and layout similar to, similar to previous issues based on outstanding feedback from our Golf to Bay uh, reader surveys that we do every year. Um, this year, we have a, a robust print distribution of 500,000 magazines currently planned with newspaper inserts, brochure distribution, global direct mail, international domestic trade shows. And we're also collaborating with several social media influencers with aligned interests from key markets to raise awareness that St. Pete Clearwater is a vibrant, well-rounded destination home to world-class arts, culture, and outdoor adventure offerings. Each trip will have a different theme and seek to highlight an array of activities and excursions, um, but they will all have one thing in common, which is a local, authentic immersion both on and off the beach. So those are just a few of the highlights that uh, we've been doing this fiscal year. Um, as we look to next fiscal year, one of the main things that we use for our planning is our Marketing Agency Partner Summit, which actually starts tomorrow. Agency participants include um, our ad agency BVK, Miles Partnership, NJFPR, destination analysts, other research partners like Adar and Zartico, and our international agencies Rooster and Kaus. And that is a true strength of our, of our organization is the collaborative relationship we have with our advertising agency and our other agencies that help deliver innovative ideas and solutions. Um, and we have a budget for research tools that inform data-driven marketing decisions. And having the, those meetings this week will be crucial um, in understanding you know, how we, the insights, trends, updates, and how we look uh, to form decisions for FY24. Um, and as Steve mentioned, there is some great opportunities um, for us to, to think about in those meetings, such as the new luxury hotel product and how we can be sure that we're reaching that audience. 
Um, and there's some growth opportunity to reach our out of, uh, number one out-of-state origin market in New York City. How can we uh, get our message into New York City, um, which we know is a very expensive market, um, so how can we um, be visible and come up with some, some creative ways to be in the market? Um, uh, weaknesses, we do have a staff, a one staff position in our department um, for filling and then Obviously, the, the chief marketing officer position, we look forward to for, for that to be filled uh, shortly. <coughs> Threats, um, something that will definitely be as part of our agenda this week at our agency partner summit is, is looking at the research in regards to American travelers, financial sentiment, sentiment and its impact on travel, um, political environment um, with the election next year, how does that affect our budget? Um, environmental issues, as uh, as always, um, the threats for red tide hurricanes, and then as Steve mentioned, the increased interest in international travel for U.S. residents. Um, how can we uh, promote our destination as an international destination for uh, U.S. residents? Because um, we know we have um, Greek uh, up in Turpin Springs. So um, as we as we meet with our area agencies, you know these are some of the, the top priorities we're going to talk about. Is how can we focus on essential programs with a high ROI and high value? Um, how can we grow direct visitor spending? How can we grow and sustain tourism-related jobs um, with our marketing programs? We're going to focus efforts um, to increase awareness and intent to travel during periods with the greatest need, um, where we can bring in uh, in visitors in those uh, slower times. Um, and identify opportunities to elevate the brand uh, through partnerships, activations, unique media opportunities to really stretch the dollar. Identify ways to further promote the value of tourism to local residents and non-hospitality businesses. Um, that's something we've been uh, working on this year as, as a campaign, a value of tourism campaign that's geared towards our local residents. Um, to, to, again, promote the value of tourism. Um, last week was National Travel and Tourism Week, and, and we did some of that then. Um, so how can we continue uh, making that uh, presence um, known throughout the year? Um, and then our department is, is uh, key in providing support for our business development and our community engagement teams. Um, so with the Film Commission, Global Travel, Sports Events, Meetings and Conferences, um, Brand Activations, Community Relations. Um, and we'll look also with our, uh, we let, just launched our Let's Shine brand campaign last year. So we um, have amazing photography and video assets that we gathered last year. How can we um, continue to put those assets into effect um, like we've been doing um, and let that brand really shine um, through all of the, the assets that we create? So um, the total budget request, is, as Steve shared, is $15,980,000, with approximately 97% of that directed through BVK and our advertising and promotional services contract. So that's just um, some highlights of this year and what we are, are working on um, and will be key talking points at our agency meeting uh, for the coming year. I was just going over your um, weakness and threat page. Um, you mentioned you were about to fill a position. Yes, we have uh, one position on the advertising um, and promotions to fill. Because it says under weakness, several vacancies and key leadership staff positions. I'm assuming maybe that's across all departments. Yes. And so when you have missing people in all of those departments, it's affecting Everybody. Yes. And so I was going to look at Steve because I did see on that chart there's still a lot of open positions. So can you give us an update on that? Because I can, that's been a problem for a long time. Yeah. So, and actually, a quick update on that. So, right now, as of, to, of last night, I pull, uh, Terry filled out the last report we've had. And I'm not sure of the start on this, but we've hired five people on board. Um, in, di in different positions. We currently have one offer that we're waiting on a response back. We currently have a finalist um, that we need to extend an out, um, a offer to. Then we have one position we're in the process of 
of interviewing. So there's eight positions right there. And I'm, I'm going to say this is within, Terry, the last three, three months, four months. Yeah. It, it, anyway, it just, it's a, it, in a very short period of time. We still have, um, we have one we're about to go advertise out for, and that is a senior position. Um, and then we have two others that we've got a class change on. And at that point, so that'll bring us up to three. That'll be a total of 11 positions. So, so I, I, that's great to hear. Um, it looks like the one, two, three, four top positions. It's page 23. Four top positions in on your executive summary are all vacant. Are any of those filled in that? what you just described? Uh, they're not. So one of those would be in the advertising, which would be at the end of this month. The one thing I wanted to go through and do is, again, realizing the staff and some of the stuff they needed to get done is make sure they had the guns um, hired to, to do that and then concentrate on going through and getting the, the leadership. OK. Um. The other, the other question I had is it talked about a weakness as internal communications. Yes, just um, more communication with our, between our departments. And that's so something what are we going to do to on work on that? And um, actually, we have been, it does, and it can be improved. You know, and again, one of the things is how, how, do, we, how do we avoid doing things in a silo? Um, so this year, there's been a number of projects where it's actually involved not only a advertising and promotion, but also it involved um, sales. It also involved activations. Is doing more of that, and I know that there's uh, different meetings that we have with the agencies where you're pulling people in. So it's it's growing, and then organizationally, just keeping everyone up to date of things that, that are happening. And then finally, on that, it says the long-term strategic direction. Now I know we just more or less completed our strategic plan six months ago, eight months ago, whatever it was. How do you see that improving all of this? Um, I think part of it is, that, and as I went through and looked at the four pillars, is, and it's one of the things we keep going through, and like even this year with the staff, is say, hey, what are we doing around these things here? Um, so if you go back and, and look at up real quick. So you go through and look at uh, um, e increasing the economic benefits of tourism to the community as one of the items. Well, in brand activations, they've gone through and, and said, okay, when we go do local activations, we're looking at it and saying, is that a, hey, come visit message, or is that here's a value of tourism message? So you know, starting to add those things in. You know, same with the partnerships. Now that we have Oliver on board as our community relations manager, developing deeper relationships with other entities and organizations, but it's bringing them into the fold of the things that we're going through and doing. Like on the impact of the of the visitor, that's working with our agent, you know, our marketing partners, so that we understand who that is and what that is, and what do we do to change or change or what things can we do to that will help impact that so it there it's built in there um it, it'll actually go a little bit more in depth and we'll be talking about that um over the next two days when we meet with our different marketing partners thank you and i'll just say that like going back to that chief marketing officer position i know i just jumped back but i was going to say that's been open for i don't know five years it's been a long time it's been open. I mean, it, it was open when I first got on the board. It might have gotten filled briefly, and then it was open again. Yeah. It, it was originally a VP of marketing position. Yes, which, yes uh, it was. Which I, I believe at the time the CEO did that, uh, that position. This, as we've come up with the, strategically from the plan, is to say to put all marketing under marketing is actually identifying that position. So... Hopefully when we look at this next year, it'll be filled. Uh, hopefully in about three months, then you can ask the questions for that. There you go. Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mayor Buchalski, uh, thank you for raising the question about these openings. You, you beat me to the punch. 
Something is systemically wrong here. For us to have our four key senior positions Thank open you. for as long as they have is untenable. Um, whatever the constraints, whatever the, um, whatever the challenges are with filling these positions, we need to take a hard look at it. I think it, in a time where we need senior leadership um, the most, we haven't had it. Steve, I know you've been handcuffed in many ways to fill these positions, but the fact that we've got chief marketing officer open for over a year and a half, VP of business development open for over a year and a half, community engagement three years, VP of finance one year. How does that work? How does that happen? It's a rhetorical question, but one that we need to figure out why that is. And we cannot go on allowing this to happen. You need to have best-in-class talent to help you do your job. And for whatever reason, it's not happening here. So if I may, I know I'm not the smartest cookie in the jar, but my whole entire background has been in senior administration and management. And as Mike so eloquently stated, and thank you, Mayor, for bringing this up, Organizationally, this is a piece of crap in my head because this is a very large agency. There is no chief of staff. There is no senior administrator looking out for the internal day-to-day -day operations. And I don't know, I mean, is it supposed to be you, Steve, who was the outward face of the organization? Because in my head, from the experiences I've had with the TDC, there's that outward facing person taking care of all kinds of activities going around the country and the world, but there's an internal person responsible for what we're talking about right now today. And this is a failure of leadership. I'm not pointing the finger at you yet, but I am telling you that this cannot continue. And as a board, it is irresponsible for us to bury our heads in the sand and not take responsibility for this. I don't want to cast any disparaging remarks on anybody that's been in this seat from the time I left it, but to allow this to go on is just, like you said, untenable, irresponsible, and a failure on our part to raise the bell, the flag, or whatever you want to call it. So don't think for one minute I'm all, not all over this in a heartbeat and have been since January when I became the chair. So, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and totally agree with you. If I could just make one one further comment we can't be we can't be jaded by our success that we've had coming out of the pandemic we've succeeded in spite of ourselves yeah. how much better could we have been if all of these roles had been filled with best-in-class talent helping Steve do his job so let's not, let's not have our head in the sand, pat ourselves on the back thinking, boy, look at these great numbers, look at the attendance, look at the raise in revenues. We got that because we've got a great destination. But how much better could it have been if we had leadership in these roles? So I've said enough. Me too. Commissioner Henderson. Um, <clears throat> Steve, do you feel like these positions in the, I see the E35 for the chief marketing officer, um, the introductory pay for that's 119,000, I think. Is that when you hire somebody, do you, are you constrained to say, okay, the your your pay will be 119,000 to start with? I'm just looking at online to see what the pay rates are for the class for Pinellas County. <clears throat> when, you, when you go to hire some of these positions, 
are you restricted to that classification, the starting at the minimum amount of that classification, and they have to work their way up from there? I'm just trying to understand how process works. So process would be, and this is what we've had to, to go through and do, is identify what was a previous classification and then change that so that you can go through um, and get a better in a better class of, of person. So example being for chief marketing officer is basically that's an E35. Is that right? Yeah, E3, um, E35. So there is a pay range associated with that um, job classification. Yeah. And then so when we when it comes time when we put the ad out there for it we'll say that it's from this pay range, what, what that is. What happens is between the bottom and the mid, it's easy to, to, to go through and advertise there. If it's anything above the mid, then there's additional approval levels to go, to go from there. Um, so pay-wise, you know, again, we uh, just filled one position just the other day. And from, a, you know, again, a pay standpoint, you know, we had to get, approval to go through and do that, we got it quickly. Um, so as long as we're building the case for it, I feel like we could get the pay for some of the positions. Some other ones, it may, may be less. And, that, and again, uh, the county looks at it from a uh, pay compensation as in the local market. And then they also look at it with internally within the county itself in, in, in those two realms. And then wherever you're at, you're going to have to make the case if it's going to be more to bring some, you know, to bring somebody on board. I know we've, we've lost some positions probably due to pay. You know, a better offer outside, they were, they were great for us. And then they couldn't, couldn't turn down a better offer. You know, you can't blame them for doing that. And I'm concerned that if we have these limits and, you know, you say you, you can buy for a, a higher level for a position, you're at E35 for the chief marketing officer, that's 119 to 155 minimum and, and midpoint with a maximum potential of 191. But to bring somebody in for 155 or less, if we want a real quality, true quality marketing officer that really knows his stuff or her stuff, is that enough? And, and that may be, again, when we were out advertising four months ago, um, I would have said there was probably more, uh, there was less applicants for positions. In one recent position where we did go through and just hire somebody, I want to say we were at close to 100 people that applied for the job. And if you looked at the folks that were interviewed, um, um, the, the, I want to call them the finalists, but the ones we had the face-to-face, the -face, um, what they were asking for, we were right at the midpoint or just above where um, or j just above that request. So, and again, not, se not senior position, but just, you know, a, 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 a newer position within the organization. So these classifications you have right now, you think you can attract a superstar <laughs> it, in, that, in that area? Was one of the, any of those few that you interviewed face-to-face, -face, were they considered superstars in, in that category or were they? just the best that applied? Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I think there will be some people that would want to come here because of the destination and what we have and what the budget is. There's a, I mean, I, you know, there was, you know, one person that had expressed interest, you know, but they were at north of 300. Um, there's somebody else that is less than that, but, you know, they wanted to commute, you know, which you know is not really not an option. So again, it's going to be depending on you know who's out there and who has who has the interest. And again, you know, I think we will fight for the different positions uh, to get you know the best that's out there. But again, if you know someone's offering more and it's in the private world, you know they may go and and, and take that like some of our staff have that have left. Yeah. Well, that's, I just want to make sure that that's not a concern that we're not. A that we're not constrained by what we're offering, we're not getting the talent that, that we should have at this high level management because we're not able to pay the amount that the market dictates. Russ? Um, 
I have to tell you, this conversation's been on for 30 years, 25 years, uh, and it's not going to change. Uh, we are part of a government, uh, and we are Pinellas County. It was chosen that way by the Board of County Commission. I don't think it's going to change. They have an HR department. They have a couple other regulatory ways of how they determine wages and, and blocks of, of, of hiring and everything else. And the director has to go through every time to help work at that. I'm not sure it's going to change. I think we just went through another HR director, I think the county did recently uh, in the last few months. And so I think with all those things, uh, we can ask the questions. I think it's great that the mayor says we need these four filled. And Mike says, I agree 100 percent. But Mike, but Steve has to go basically each category and then go after and, and get approvals in order to get the wage rates he does. And we are competing with a private enterprise, a private companies and everything. So we can all have these suggestions, but I think also, um, I don't think it's gonna change, but we have to make sure that he's backed up by industry and us with this board to be able to go to his boss and to the administrator to say, we need this at this level and we get the best that we can for that money. But, but this has always been part of it. And I don't see us changing, being able to change it. We can only put the suggestion and the pressure to say we need these four spots filled. Am I right, Michael, legally and everything, the way the county works? Yes, I think you've described it, yes. Well, I wouldn't agree with you okay. in, in one point because we are changing, everything is changing, the whole world is changing. And from the time I've been on the commission, I have seen a lot of change and it's going to change more. And there's always been a recognition that this agency is different. So I don't know, maybe I dropped off the turnip truck between last time I was chair and now, but you've got to fight for what you need and what you want. And if you just sit back and say, oh, well, this is the process, that is not going to cut it. So. But that was my, and that's my point. We have to go I, I, staff person by staff person. We did with the administrator every time and all, and meet with and try and make sure we back him up 100% uh, on it. And, and, and HR is changing within the county, too, on certain heads of it's who going to change so again. Forth. Yeah. Want, yes, Mike, and then Doreen, and yeah, Madam Chair, thank you, um, Russ. I, I, I think what you've stated is is correct and accurate, um, but I don't think we can accept that. Um, you know, if this was private enterprise, we would put a deadline. We'd say you've got 90 days to fill these slots. I don't care what it takes. 90 days, let's get it done. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here 90 days from now and we're probably not going to have them done. And perhaps it has to be handled or, or spearheaded at the BCC level and, and make it a mandate from the BCC to whoever's involved, we need these positions filled now, and it's costing us money not having them filled. Um, we've got to sunset this thing. Uh, Doreen? Thank you. Uh, Agreeing with all the prior comments, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that our county administrator was here a few months ago, and he very pointedly uh, made the, the the point that that this was going to be expedited, and I've not seen that happen. Um, I do appreciate what Russ is saying, and having been here in years past, and but we just can't accept the fact that the the wheel turns slowly. Um, and that there are these procedures because it's a governmental agency. I mean, you know, the world is, as you say, uh, Commissioner, has changed dramatically, and we have to make those, those uh, same steps and same moves. We are constrained because we are a public entity operating under governmental guidelines as opposed to private industry. And we, but I, I feel for the frustration of the staff. Um, as you say, many have come and gone, and we're in the process of trying to hire, 
and step up the, 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 the playing field. And we're just not getting there. And we have to find a way to make that work. Also, I, I know, Steve, and, and it was instrumental for the changes when you came on board three years ago. That strategic plan, um, you know, excellent idea. It, it, but it, it took us two years to even get to this point um, of implementation of that strategic plan. And has it already changed from what we, we started out with? So, I, and I agree with the comment that, you know, that maybe it goes back to the VCC level that we just have to find a way to get some deadlines and to get some urgency um, and co more cooperation from HR to, to move this forward. So, thank well, you. Here's a great idea. You're all board members. There's nothing that precludes you from talking to the county commissioners, the chair, or Barry Burke. I mean, I haven't talked to a lot of you in the last, since I was chair last, about issues involving the TDC. And there was nothing that stopped you from being able to say, hey, are, are, is anybody paying attention to this? So we have a little work to do as a board, I think, in stepping up to support whoever the person is that's leading this agency, because the squeaky wheel is what gets the grease. And I think we're all adults, and we've worked long enough to know that that is the case. With all that said, I promise you uh, there is a new day coming, and um, stay tuned. Our lunch has been delayed, I understand. So, uh, Katie, <laughs> you've just been so patient. Thank you so much for continuing to, yes, Clyde. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, um, to say first, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the SWOT analysis was probably the best part of this budget um, process. I'm, I'm glad the mayor brought it up. And I just really hope, hopefully with leadership, I can imagine working all the departments do such a great job with the limited leadership they have now um, in those positions, but that the SWOT is really looked at and addressed, especially the weaknesses and the opportunities, because um, I think that's where we're going to see more success this year. Very well said. Thank you for those remarks. Chuck? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Katie, when I first joined the board, our, it seems like our tax revenues were 70 million and then 80, and, and now we're at 95. But I remember your budget being, seems like it was 12, 13 million, 14, now we're at 15, well, almost 16 million. But yet, percentage-wise, it hasn't kept up with how successful our business is. Do you think, this is an opinion, don't look at Steve, do you think um, the $16 million is enough what would you do with more if we re not this budget, next budget? I just, I, I'm not seeing you getting more money, even though we are all getting more money as a county. Sure. Um, that is actually an exercise that we did put together and it's something we're going to look at more at our um, agency partner meeting is what we would do if there was a budget amendment. Um, and part of that is looking at New York City and what we can do with New York City. Um, also looking at international markets um, and to see kind of, you know, Previously, where were we spending in international and, and what do we need to be doing now? Um, relying on our international agencies to understand a little bit more about what our competition is doing um, in those markets and, and so that we can make sure that we're um, on pace or exceeding um, to get our message out. Um, so, so yes, I think there is an opportunity if, if for more funding, um, we could definitely do a lot more. Um, and explore those new markets. And like Steve mentioned, you know, this, the, the new inventory that we have are luxury properties. And to advertise to a luxury clientele, you have to do different publications and medium that are typically more expensive. Um, so that's, that's something we definitely will consider. Thank you. Sorry, I got a little distracted. Surprise, surprise. She just, she just doubled her budget, but y'all keep talking. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What? Is that it, Katie? Yes. Any more questions for Katie? No? Great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Steve, 
you have any remarks to make after this illuminating conversation? Um, yeah, so again, I think, you know, Katie does an excellent job of putting everything together and really driving um, uh, BVK and, and what they're putting together for us. The comment I want to go back to is um, more on the, the HR side. And um, my commitment to this group is um, at the June meeting, uh, which is the, uh, um, the next, our, our next meeting, is not only to tell you where we are in the interview process or the hiring process for those senior positions, but I also wanted to reiterate too, um, in the last several months, um, in terms of HR and workforce, they, they have been bending over backwards to move things quickly. Um, and, and, and again, as an example, uh, we recently uh, got, you know, confirmed somebody yesterday um, that normally would take a couple of weeks, took like two days. Um, so that's through that, that process. Um, I think the other part is, and again, process standpoint, when it comes down to some of the changes that we want to make internally, we've got to go through and make those changes to submit to HR and or workforce. So for instance, if we're going through and taking a position that was identified as X and we're going to move it to position Y and here are the changes to do that, Terry on the staff is the one that makes that happen. But Terry's also the same one that every time we have a contract because we're going to a trade show and she's got to get that and push that through council to get that signed off on, um, she's also doing that. When it comes down to the budget process, which we're in the middle of, she's also behind that, that as well. So it, you know, again, from a help standpoint, that is one of those choke points. Um, and so the, again, looking at the positions that we have to fill, how can we get those done where we also get help for the staff in some of the things that they're doing? And then it, again, trying to set things up, uh, up in, in order. So if there is a, um, if, if I have done that process wrong and should have concentrated on the other, then that's, that's my fault uh, for going through and, and doing that. I just know that, you know, Terry, you know, does, one heck of a job in trying to make those things happen and push things as, as strong as she can um, so that we, you know, again, have, have the staff that, that we need to. But for the June meeting um, is we will provide an update of where we are on those senior positions. And with that said, Steve, um, ensuring that your staff have the resources that they need to get their jobs done in an appropriate time is part of the responsibility of leadership. And I think clearly you've identified a couple of areas where it sounds to me like Terry needs some help in terms of people to get her work done. You know, you can only put so much on the top of one person before they can't do anything well. So enough said on that subject. Yeah. I think you get the idea. All right, so um, let's, I hate to ta tackle a new subject while we're still waiting for lunch because it's hard to think when you're hungry. Um, do we want to move on to digital and data? Can we get that done in the next 10 minutes or so? Yes, no? Okay. Eddie, you're up. All right, uh, what a thing to follow. Okay, um, I'm gonna start out with, uh, from digital and, and data, um, kind of a recipe. This isn't, uh, unfortunately, butter and sugar and, and chocolate chips, but we view this as sort of a recipe for success for uh, our, our digital team. And um, the first step forward is looking at our data and listening to what our data is telling us. Uh, we use intercept surveys, website and first party data, economic and visitor origin indicators to help us tell us where our visitors are, but most importantly, how they're planning their trip and what resources they're using. Um, so an example of this is we know from our 2022 visitor profile study that 50% of visitors 
utilize social media or our website when planning their trip. Really indicates the importance of those channels. Next, we look at how we reach these audiences. From a digital perspective, there's a ton of different ways. Um, you know, demographic profiles, such as household income, you know, family size, uh, digital behaviors, what they're doing when they're browsing the internet, uh, their real spending habits, where they're going, how they're spending their money, what sort of entertainment they're, you know, purchasing, um, conquesting, so looking at, uh, if they're looking at competitor destinations, um, and then also matching our first party data uh, to lookalike audiences, um, and, and really, based on any of the um, opportunities we have in the trip stage their, of, of their planning, uh, we will deploy any of these different um, techniques to reach that audience. And then lastly, we measure performance with tools like Adara that uh, Katie mentioned, um, and we see some really great indicators and results. They're not a complete picture of the return on our investment from advertising, but they do indicate, you know, like a five to one return on ad spend when we're looking at uh, hotel bookings that were ad targeted. Um, so, you know, we, we have some really great measurements that, that, that we're able to draw from when we don't have a booking engine or a point of sale and that wouldn't anyways encapsulate that total economic impact. Um, kind of talking about some key figures and, and indicators that we look at. Um, last year we saw 12.3 million bookings or $12.3 million in observed hotel bookings. Again, that's um, someone saw one of our ads from a tracked campaign and uh, that was based off of a $2.4 million spend. Um, we also see an estimated economic impact of 70 million uh, of our uh, visit stpclearwater.com. We have a uh, annual website ROI study where we're doing intercept surveys on the website and then post trip to really generate that number. And based off the total traffic that we see on our website, we can estimate $56.42 uh, per website visitor. So we have some really great statistics that really help us track a, a dollar amount to the marketing that we're doing. But that's not all. Uh, there's oftentimes uh, places where we can't track media, like social media, um, YouTube, things like that. So we look at other indicators. And Katie brought up the um, ad effectiveness study. There's some really great takeaways from previous ad effectiveness studies that, that we've run. Um, for example, um, digital marketing and video marketing was the highest percent recalled um, when we looked at all of our channels in our previous study. And we also know that being in a market with multiple channels of advertising, radio, digital, um, broadcast, is, helps increase that awareness, which then increases the likelihood to travel uh, pretty drastically. Uh, also in this study, when we look at unaided recall, so we asked someone, you know, if they remember seeing an ad and where they saw it. Um, social media takes up one, two, and three of this, which I find really interesting. And again, it's not necessarily a place we can always track with ROI dollars, but we can see that most people recall seeing our ads on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, uh, higher than any other channel. And then kind of jumping into the, the SWOT analysis um, for digital, there, you'll see a lot of commonalities between us and, and uh, advertising and promotions. Um, I feel, and I, I don't feel, I, I know we have a good sense of direction with our marketing. Uh, you know, we have a confidence in where the future of marketing will be, uh, what's important to that, including first party data, a robust content plan, and careful measurement of knowing what we know and also knowing what we don't know and, and working on ways to learn more about that. Um, there's several opportunities that we have and they're not expensive opportunities for us. They're, they're more relationship building. So, um, you know, developing the relationships with local influencers to really utilize them, um, you know, grow the team. <laughs> that conversation that we had, um, I'm actually happy to report that the offer that was sent was already accepted. Um, I I'm the hiring manager for that position, so we're, we've got a content person on our team. Their start date looks to be June 14th. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, that person will help us really overlay a, a content plan that addresses all the needs of, of different departments. And then as Katie said, 
um, you know, out-of-state markets. We know the um, spend of an out-of-state visitor is, is much greater than those coming from our drive market destinations. So um, as Katie mentioned, growing Detroit and growing Minneapolis, you know, we're looking to grow those out-of-state markets because we see you know, places like Indianapolis and, and um, some, some other Midwest markets leading uh, in terms of average visitor spend. Um, so so that, that's, a, that's a great strength. Uh, in terms of weaknesses and threats, I, I kind of put them all together. But uh, we have some issues of having siloed experiences from, from users. You know, people go on their phone. They don't look at all the same sites. They don't have all the same experiences. There is a plethora of streaming services now. So people are consuming content that fits what they want to see. And just the diversity of that means it's more difficult to reach those audiences than before. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there are limits to our budget and, and how much impact we can generate in that budget. But uh, if there's ever opportunities to grow that, then we would definitely look at that. And then political and environmental issues. Um, I don't really think I need to go too far into those. Um, so for our top priorities for, for the next year, um, you know, it, it's, it's basically to continue the plan, but then to sharpen it too. To, um, you know, continue to look at and, and, and really um, look at more often the, the figures and indicators that, that tell us we're in the right direction. Um, and really optimizing that on, on a monthly basis and giving people greater access to that information as well. Um, content, as I already mentioned, this is going to be huge, um, especially with the generation of AI tools that we can begin to implement into our content strategies. Uh, I, I see a drastic change in, in how we approach content and how much content we develop. Um, and then also measuring in data. So again, kind of going back to um, knowing what's working, but then also how do we utilize our data? Can we segment our first party data um, into different audiences for even higher effectiveness? Um, I have some, some good news. We, we've been using a data consortium with our own first party data, and, and we're starting to see some really effective, great results um, with inputting our data into this consortium and, and really outperforming some of our uh, previous ways that we were marketing digitally. And really, this is the last slide for me. So, you know, from a budgetary note, our budget has, has pretty much stayed flat. Um, I believe it's $7,191,050. Um, so there, there's not really too much change for, for us. There's some different priorities uh, that we'll address next year, such as the redesign of our partner site. Um, there's different technology services, as I've mentioned, uh, with, you know, in particular AI tools that, that we'll begin to figure out how to integrate and activate on. And then there is always the potential for, for a greater impact uh, with you know, more money to, to put into those out of markets, out of state markets. And that, that's it for me. So any questions? Slide. Yes, I noticed on the meetings and conferences, one of the um, <clears throat> excuse me weaknesses was no website for meetings. Is that something that would fall under an opportunity for you? To expand on the meetings available, the meeting space in a county? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can you um, re repeat that? Yeah, uh, under meetings and conferences, one of the weaknesses is that there's no meetings website. There is a meetings website, um, uh, but there is a great opportunity to expand the content of the meetings website to make it more informational and inspirational. And again, with the hiring of this content person, um, one of the main priorities for next year is looking at the uh, department websites and, and improving them uh, and meeting with those teams to, to see what they need to really sell the destination. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some bigger plans at, at work there. Okay, because I know with the uh, meetings growing towards 2024, as discussed earlier, yeah. I think that's a big priority because people are looking now for that 24, 25 years. Yeah, and I mean, to, to get super nerdy, I, I think that some of the um, AI tools out there can really help us um, create a, an effective plan for building out um, the, the meetings content. You know, oftentimes the meetings team is out there selling. So, you know, we need to get information from them, but we can't always sit down, you know, at, w with a weekly meeting. So, again, kind of just looking at that from um, how can we effectively build on the content there while also not taking up too much of their time because they're out there doing their thing. 
Anyone? Mayor? Hi. So I'm, I'm looking at the, weak, the weaknesses and threats and all of that. Um, I just, again, not to belabor something we've already discussed, but two out of the four positions in your department are vacant. I know you've just said you're going to fill this one, but there's still one more that's been, you know, vacant for a year. So I want to point that out. But it says um, in your weakness, budget limits are reached to key potential growth markets. Um, that's under weakness. And then under opportunities, it says we have growth opportunities in un untapped out-of-state markets that align with our visitor profile. So we're saying it's an opportunity, but we haven't added to the budget to get there. That's what that says to me. And so I, yeah. I don't know if it's you that answered that or Steve that answers that. Um, and I understand it probably takes bodies to do it too. Yeah. But we should always plan for success, plan for filling those positions, plan to reach your opportunities versus just leaving it flat. So let me let me jump to the first part. Sure. Um, so yeah, we we are there's uh, for the second position. I believe I'm not the hiring manager for um, the market intelligence specialist position, but I believe that that offer has been made. I think um, I, you know we talk about squeaky wheels. I might be the squeakiest. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I personally feel like I, I'm, I'm trying to do as much as, as I can. Um, I, I, there, there's been added responsibilities uh, to, to my plate, so, you know, that's really being here is, is, is one of those added responsibilities. Um, but with regard to, to the budget, you know, I, I can't necessarily comment um, on that because I know that there was a lot of changes, um, but Steve, if, if that's something that you want to touch base on. So Steve, my thing was is that it said under weakness it says budget limits are reached to key potential growth markets. But then under opportunity it says growth opportunities in untapped out of state markets that align with our visitor profile with incremental budget. It's saying we have growth opportunities but we have a flat budget. So I uh, on that and I think the part was the inc the incremental budget part or, or money for that. I think for us is to go through and say, this is what we're doing. And then from there, let's go, if we're successful in doing that as we have been, let's go ask for those additional funds. But I'm looking at maybe a much bigger ask versus just digital. Is that also traditional, uh, you know, with Katie's budget? Is it as we also bring in brand activations, more holistic approach going after let's say the New York City market or the Boston market or something like that. Yeah. And, and I get what you're saying. I understand that's the politics side of it to me. I think if we're planning for success and we're saying that we have an opportunity for growth, then we should plan our budget around that opportunity. I can't tell you how much money that is. That's, that's really in you. So that, is, that would be my recommendation anyways is if there is growth opportunity there in these other markets, on the digital side, then we should at least put some amount of money in saying we are going to challenge ourselves to create that growth opportunity and see if it really pans out the way we think it can. Doesn't mean you can't ask for more. Yeah. But I just think we don't plan for flat. You plan for success. That, that's my feeling about it. I don't know how anybody else feels about it. OK. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much, Eddie, very much. Um, I believe that we are ready to take a break now for lunch, which is being served out here. And you feel free to bring it back in and consume. And we will reconvene at between 1230 and 1245. How about that? Is that long enough? Yeah? All right. Thank you, everyone, for a very robust and poignant conversation.
job, Mayor. Thank you. I think we're ready to begin our afternoon portion of our meeting today. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, the communications angle of our budget, and that is Marlene Camera. Uh, what? Did I get that wrong? It's oh, Mackenzie, I'm sorry. I didn't put my cheaters on. Okay. Comer. Hi. Comer. Yes. When Comer. I Comer. Like I know. I would love it to be like Comer or something really <laughs> fancy, but it's just Comer, like a comb. Okay. Nothing Got fancy. It. Hi, everyone. I'm Mackenzie Comer. Hopefully, my name looks familiar. I was standing here before you, maybe in September, October. I was previously senior uh, media relations manager at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. I left and joined Lou Hammond Group. They have an office here in St. Pete, and I'm the VP there. But <clears throat> with my departure, there was nobody, as you'll see on the org chart, in the PR communications role. So I've just been kind of filling those shoes until the director is hired. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and start things off. I don't have a slide about this, but I wanted to just address the three contracted agencies, and we actually have represent, representatives from all of them. So we have NJFPR. That is our PR agency that is based in New York, and they handle all of our um, PR efforts for the U.S. and Canada. And so I'd like to introduce Maggie LaCase, Kylie Thomas, and Alexis Whitley. They are here from New York and um, ahead of our agency meetings this week. Um, we also have Stefan Hager, who is here from CALS. They handle all of our Eastern Europe PR efforts, as well as um, they work with Rose for the sales and marketing. And then Jane Brooke is here representing Rooster PR, and they handle, again, our PR efforts, uh, as well as sales and marketing in um, the UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia. So what I'll be showing you today is a combination of all of our efforts together collectively. So some key figures, kind of our KPIs for public relations, um, impressions. So I just wanted to, this is just for fiscal year 23 to date. Um, we've far exceeded our impressions from last year. Um, and the same goes for stories placed and hosted writers. Hosted writers, you'll see in your budget um, deck that that's a number that we're kind of growing back up to where it was before the pandemic. And that is really a way that we are able to secure the larger feature stories. Seeing is believing. That's really what we try to articulate to anyone that we're working with, partners in the destination. We have certainly do a wonderful job getting coverage about St. Pete Clearwater through just our pitching efforts and, and media relations, but when we bring someone to town, it makes that bigger impact. So I just wanted to share, again, these are links, so you can't necessarily see them all, but I'll go to another slide and you'll see some highlights. But just really top level some of the storytelling successes, and this is um, just a huge part of all of our collective efforts. So Mother's Day getaways. This was a piece in Good Housekeeping that featured no one in the US except for St. Pete Clearwater. So really amazing that we're able to get our name out there in front of um, that large audience. Forbes, I'm sure many of you have seen this. I think the local media picked up on this as well. St. Pete Clearwater was listed um, for best places to travel in the US in 2023, according to experts. And we're very lucky to have an amazing freelance writer based here in Tampa, Terry Ward, who contributed to that piece. And we have wonderful relationships with her. Again, more good housekeeping. The Charleston Magazine is actually a print piece, and I have it, and I will pass it around for you all shortly. We. Um, I'll, I'll kind of touch on some of that niche publications a little bit broader than just national travel, but this was a 10-page print piece from a trip here in Charleston, has nonstop flights into Tampa through the Breeze Airways. House Beautiful, um, again, this is an example of syndication as well, this story about best small towns in Florida, which featured Dunedin and Tarpon Springs. We don't forget about you, I promise. Um, was also syndicated on Yahoo Life and Yahoo News, as well as Country Living. Um, Midwest Living, this really parlays and, and kind of piggybacks on a lot of our advertising efforts in the Midwest region, so we're using the opportunity to complement the paid efforts with earned media efforts. And then, of course, not to forget the, the Canada market, Toronto, as well as Express and Star in the UK. And there's plenty of stories from the UK and Germany Germany, obviously, there's not going to be in English, so I, I left them off here just for ease. Um, and here's some highlights. Um, 
some examples, kind of this is Germany, UK, US, and you'll see it's, it's beach, it's art, it's food, it's LGBTQ. So we really are able to um, cast a really wide net with our PR efforts. Um, speaking about top priorities, so from all of our uh, PR conversations, we feel really confident in what we're doing and getting the destination on these large scale roundups or having St. Pete Clearwater considered when someone's talking about Florida beaches and where to travel. But we really wanna hone in on those niche angles because we're seeing the culinary scene just really expand and grow more so than ever before. Um, we're seeing a lot of smaller uh, restaurants opening up in St. Pete, maybe with nine seats or 20 seats. So we're utilizing some of these more niche angles to um, just really push hard on culinary. Arts and culture is always a main focus of ours as well. We always are keeping the, the beach top of mind, but making sure we're being considered for other angles, that small town feature. Um, and then destination characters. This is, this is something really crucial for PR efforts and, and it can be utilized for digital and um, traditional advertising as well. But knowing and finding out about a character in the destination that can really speak to something unique. It's, it's like the uh, George Belirus in Tarpon Springs whose family has been in the destination for ages and we're able to have him chat with Southern Living coming up who's working on a multiple page feature for Tarpon Springs. But pinpointing those characters is crucial. So if you ever seem to run into someone that you think would be really great, doesn't have to be on camera, but someone that can just talk about a history or a unique angle, please let us know. Um, another thing that we're going to prioritize, and Eddie has been so crucial in making sure that this is happening from a LinkedIn standpoint, but merchandising our coverage locally. We obviously share the coverage with any partner included when we get stories, but I think there's an opportunity for us to um, parlay that into more local coverage. We saw a lot of that from the Forbes piece, the top 23 places to visit. WFLA and Daytime did whole um, segments about that with Terry Ward, but I think there's room for us to really make sure that what we're doing, what our efforts are doing, are also leading to more stories from the I Love the Bergs, the Tampa Bay Times, the different broadcast channels. Um, measurement and reporting, we're analyzing some other DMO styles and processes to tr streamline this, determining whether we want to establish a Barcelona principle style KPI, which is totally different instead of using kind of vanity metrics like we, like we do now, advertising value and impressions, we would look at key different um, areas that we want to focus on, whether it's making sure every article mentions beaches or arts or culture or culinary. Um, but that's something that I really want to help um, the new director work through. Experiential media events, this is also another way of touching uh, media in their market. So it's developing unique in-person event events for media in target markets. This is really not necessarily going to yield coverage, but more so an opportunity to gain relationships and make sure that they're aware of our destination and some different calling cards. There's a number of examples that all of the agencies can uh, share, but the BVK um, execution in New York that Katie spearheaded was just a, one example of one of those experiential events. And then partner relations. We are so fortunate to have so many partners, like many of you, who support our PR efforts, but without those partners, we're, we're not able to host journalists and provide them with these unique experiences. So just making sure that we're, we're able to articulate exactly the benefits of working with Visit St. Pete Clear, Clearwater to partners that maybe aren't aware of our efforts and what we do. I didn't include my SWOT because that is in your folders, but I'm happy to address it. I think I've got it right here. Um, Strengths, I think we do a really great job of collaborating and that's only gotten better. BVK, Miles, NJF, all the teams we meet together. And since leaving, uh, I used to have calls with all the agencies, NJF, Kaus, and Rooster separately. We've decided to bring that together and have our PR calls with all the agencies together. And this has really turned into a, utilizing what someone else might be pitching and just using that press release in another market. So really seeing some great success there. Um, I think I've touched on some of the weaknesses and similar threats as a lot of the other um, folks have shared, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions, members? Anybody? And I just want to note, the communications budget is the smallest line item you will see 
in your budget book of $256,000. And we do a lot with what we have. Um, I think we could certainly do more if there was more room in that budget, but um, just a really great example of the difference between earned and paid. Yes, Commissioner Henderson. I might have missed something there, but um, we went from 3.2 million impressions in 21 down to 831,000. So you'll see the impressions for that year that was extremely high was when we had the Super Bowl. I think I might have noted that, or maybe okay. I didn't. Right. So that was the reason for one of the, that, I think it was fiscal year 21. That okay. was when the Super Bowl was in Tampa and the amount of impressions that we got from that and what the team did behind the activation with Clearwater Marine Aquarium were really out of this world. So that would, that would be why that crazy number skyrocketed and then it kind of came back down to reality. And then between fiscal 22 and what we've done year to date, what changed to make it so much more? I think we've just been getting a lot of national coverage that is being syndicated and there's just more demand and interest in covering the U.S. destination than last year. You know, borders opened up last year and maybe some of that interest from fiscal year 21 kind of subsided and now again it's, it's kind of coming back up for a lot of different media. Great, thanks. Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk to me about your um, your SWOT analysis? Uh, uh, I think very well done. But let's talk about the weaknesses and what can we do to fix those things? I think the lack of mer merchandising VSPC's efforts is something that I was trying to expand on when I was in-house. And I think that just right now you'll see two positions in the PR um, kind of communications bucket. And I think having a lead and also an assistant would be extremely helpful. And it doesn't just mean our coverage. I was really urging all of the teams, and, and this kind of goes to the second bu bucket of collaboration. I think all of the different departments within the CVB, we do such great work. And we send out a monthly industry update, and I do you know, my best to can kind of gain knowledge of what they're doing. But I feel like that communication with partners could certainly increase. It's it's Miles going out and filming a new YouTube video. And then what happens when that YouTube video comes out? Are we then following up with partners and sharing that YouTube video with them? Um, it's Visit Florida even in their efforts, making sure that we're just, it, it requires a lot of lift because there is a lot of results. We're, we're all, I mean, PR is just one part of that, but making sure that we're just sharing what every department is doing, I'm, I'm passionate about because maybe sometimes people think of what we're doing is a bit flashy and it's just the out of home and it's just the ads in New York or Chicago, but there's so much more than that. So um, I think gaining those two positions in communications and even the position that Eddie just hired um, that's going to be kind of taking over some of the industry updates just will help expand that, that reach. So you have two open positions? I think in that, um, I think in the, I don't have a, Right, so I'm, well, and, and when I left, there was just one position, and I don't know if Steve has, I know he's got two listed here, but um, I do think that communications and storytelling is something that Steve's very passionate about, and he'd like to increase the size of that, that team. Steve? Are there people in mind that you know could fill those roles? Well, the director of communications position actually has already gone out and Steve has all of those applicants and is in the process of, I believe, interviewing the top six very shortly, if not within weeks. Great. Thanks, Mackenzie. Of course. Okay. Mayor. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I think it's, and I do wanna be kind of clear as to what your, your group, I'll call it a group, you department yeah yeah um does i mean it, obviously what you do is get free recognition for our destination free not paid that's correct and that's you know that's what pr is all about and that's really important to understand um because it's a lot more work to get something for free than it is to just write somebody a check um for any one given story i'm talking about yeah. Um, so what, what you do is really important, but it does really involve the entire county. So having said all of that, does your area also 
uh, deal with the communication like internally in the organization? Are you are you a part of that as well? I mean, I'm trying to understand what you're talking about. Whether there's an internal communications role, and and that when I first started at VSPC, and even when I left, that wasn't necessarily a. I don't believe that that was a job classification or job requirement. I think that that naturally happens as a communicator, but you're one person or two people in one of the many departments. Um, I think having someone higher up that maybe is aware of what everybody, with what all the departments are doing and can disseminate that down would be valuable. Um, okay. That was it. Thank you. One else? Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, and now we have Lisa Dozois uh, for the Film Commission. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members, and our other present presenters. I am Lisa Dozois, and I'm the Film Commissioner for Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in our department. Um, I was here last month, so uh, some of this is repeated, but as you may recall, uh, we still have and have always had big brands with big budgets coming to St. Pete Clearwater to shoot their projects. That could be anything from a still photo shoot, uh, film, uh, made for TV, um, film, uh, digital media projects, or print work. Um, so we have some of the brands that have come through Recently, TD Bank, GMC, Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, Snickers, HCA, and HSN. Uh, they do a lot of, they do all of their um, campaigns in our area. And now moving on to our incentive program, our business development program. Um, for our fiscal year 23 budget, we had allocated uh, one point, we had budgeted $1.7 million. Um, as of right now, we have already allocated $1,675,000 um, over 16 projects. Uh, so that's going to leave only about $24,000 left unspent. Um, so far, because the data is not all in. Some of the projects have shot and have been paid out, but not all of them, so it's still in progress. But right now we're looking at um, an approximate local spend of $6,776,000 uh, and 2,246 room nights and 476 local hires. Um, the ask for next fiscal year for the, our business development program is the same, $1.7 million. Um, and already we have a growing list of filmmakers that are ready to bring their projects back to St. Pete Clearwater area for fiscal year 24. I've got probably 10 people who are just waiting to meet with me to go over their projects and let them know um, how they can qualify and talk about more details um, of that nature. We just uh, wrapped the Sunscreen Film Festival. That was um, a couple weeks ago in downtown St. Petersburg. It was the 18th annual Sunscreen Film Festival. We are the headline sponsor. We um, got the economic impact report already, and it had oh, the festival over the four-day period uh, attracted over 6,000 attendees, and they spent, a, uh, they had a $1.6 million impact in the destination. Um, Another big thing that we've done in fiscal year 23 is launched a workforce development program. Uh, it's two different types of programs. The first one is more about boots on the ground, where you can learn um, actual crew skills like camera assist, grip and electric, audio, set design, location management. Um, that was open only to Pinellas County residents, and we had uh, 46 local participants in that program. The first one, they all were required to take a mandatory um, on-set protocol type of, we called it Production 101, which gave the basics of being on set. Um, you, that was mandatory, so we had the 46 participants in that class, and from there, they, uh, participants got to break to choose which of the, um, the smaller hands-on groups that they wanted to participate in. So we um, were just about done with that program, 
And then we, another one that is getting ready to get launched is um, more production office skills. And those are, that's going to be an in-person, I mean an online video, in, video, -led in, video instructor led program where you can learn about things about production budgets, different types of contracts, uh, incentive programs, and that is uh, going to be launching in the next couple weeks. Um, and then our production snapshot halfway through the year, we've permitted 92 projects, uh, they've shot over 244 days, uh, we've got one, over 1,000 local hires already, uh, 1,687 room nights, and $4.5 million local spend. So we're off to a good start. Uh, and now for my SWOT analysis. Um, our strengths and our weaknesses are, of course, our brand recognition. Our destination has definitely become known as an area to come and produce your, your films, and your um, <coughs> digital media series, your print work. Uh, we've got one of the big draws is um, we don't charge anything for our permits. They're free, and we can get them to you pretty quickly. And most of the locations that you can film at in Pinellas County either have no location fee or a very low location fee. Most of the things that someone would have to pay for if they were to come here are if they would need a municipal service, like they needed help with uh, law enforcement or parking. So those are, um, those are extra. And one thing that we've been trying to do, um, back when Tony was still here too, is um, to spread productions out into other areas of Pinellas County. Clearwater and St. Pete, they, they get a lot of action, and as does Fort DeSoto Park. But we're trying to, when it makes sense, push people um, into Dunedin and Safety Harbor. We've just had a very great relationship working with the um, City of Largo Recreation Department. Um, I will work with them as much as they want. They went, bent over backwards to, do, to accommodate the production that was there yesterday, uh, doing a still photo shoot. Um, so that's something that we're, um, we have more opportunity in that area to definitely spread, spread the love around. Um, we are one of seven counties in Florida that does have a regional film incentive program. Um, I'll, I'll get to it later on my weakness side, uh, talk about the state level. And we have opportunities to partnership with other film Florida, Florida film commissions. So for example, Hillsborough County also is one of the other counties that has a regional incentive program. And so you can um, film in both sides of the bay and tap a little into our incentive, uh, our business development program and into Hillsborough counties as well. So we look forward to more partnerships that make sense um, to work that way. And of course our uh, workforce development program is definitely a strength. Not a lot of the counties in Florida have um, such a program, and they're actually reaching out to our film commission to, to learn more about it so they can start their own. Um, of course, along with the success and all the production that we have been seeing, um, some of our locations are being overused or misused, and that is a little bit of a, a pro problem. Um, it's interesting, we have a very small um, production community in Pinellas County, so they talk a lot to each other, and everybody's quick to blame those people from Los Angeles that come in and, you know, are rude, but it's, it's, it's not just one group of people, it's a lot, and um, I have met with the county parks uh, on this already, and I'll have some more meetings with, with some of the bigger cities and the St. Pete Pier, but one thing that it came across, it was very, it was explained to me so very basically that um, our production companies, the production crews, have adopted this sort of an entitlement attitude. So they come in and they have all these expectations and they, they make demands and they've forgotten that they're guests at these locations. So we're going to have to uh, work with our local people, um, our local location managers, and make them understand that um, you know what they do matters at a location because maybe they can get their shots and go away um, and get what they need, but then they make it a little more difficult for the next people who are trying to use that location. Um, so it's a work in progress. Um, our unpredictable legislative support, uh, we just came out of session, session as you all know. Um, so they, there was a piece of 
So ever since the um, state film incentive sunset in 2016, it has not been um, replenished. And every year, legislation gets proposed and it gets shot down, and that happened again this year. Uh, Florida First Partner proposed some great legislation. It had some decent momentum. It got some conversations started and it had some support, but it ended up dying the day before the session started. So that obviously didn't go anywhere. Um, one other item that was on the chopping block was um, the state offers a Florida entertainment industry sales tax exemption. Um, <clears throat> so the strategy, and, and that was really um, wanting to be, a lot of people wanted that to go away. So the strategy, um, our lobbyists, they actually pulled that piece of um, the that, that piece of legislation out of it, a bigger bill and made it into its own bill and they positioned it as a um, tax increase. So then nobody would touch that because it was labeled as a tax increase. So that got saved. And that is um, uh, a benefit to, to filming in Florida. Um, uh, the, the State um, Advisory Council, the Florida Film and Entertainment Advisory Council has been eliminated. Um, and we have a state office of um, the Florida Office of Film and Entertainment, and um, some big changes are happening there. Uh, they are going to be moving to the DEO, which is going to become the Department of Commerce. Um, they're going to serve under their governor. Their name is going away. And there's still a lot of unknowns, and the, t the timing is unknown. And all of this is, this is all as of last week. So um, they're still waiting on the governor to, um, to, to act on this. And Nikki Welge, who is in the director of the, the Florida Office of Film and Entertainment, she's been um, asked to be part of the transition group. So. Uh, hopefully by next month we'll have an update on what's going on with the state office. And, and that's going to be a, a bit of a problem because especially when the out-of-state productions come to the area, they are uh, usually going to start at the state level to find out um, about filming in the state. And then the state level often will always will um, refer the person to the individual film commission in the jurisdiction where they're looking to go. So um, I'll have more updates on that later on. Um, we've got, uh, there's a little bit of a negative perception on our local crew. Um, our databases need to be updated because um, of the changes that have happened in Florida. A lot of our production people have moved out of state. They've gone to Georgia uh, or they've stayed in Florida but they've taken other jobs. So um, there's a perception that we don't have skilled crew, which is not true at all. We have great crew here, and um, our workforce development program is helping to train even more people um, to change that perception. So uh, inconsistent outreach to our stakeholders, that's more of a staffing issue, which all of us are experiencing. Uh, we just have it, we've been so busy with the incentive program and our busy season, and um, we just are uh, not outreaching to our stakeholders either, whether it's in our electronic newsletters or our social media posts. So that's something that's easily fixable, and we're going to deal with that tomorrow um, at the meeting tomorrow. And um, just some, we need to tighten up our economic impact reporting. We get a lot of the information in advance, but if there's a, we're going to try to come up with some ways that we can follow up after the fact to, to make those numbers a little more accurate. Um, nothing too serious, though. Uh, so the priorities for the Film Commission are to hire and train new Film Commission staff. Uh, we had a department of three. Uh, we had two full-time employees and one temp worker, and it's down to one right now, just me. But we um, will happy to know that the Film Commission manager position has been advertised. The um, advertising deadline was on Monday. I received 60, 60, 60 applications for that position. Uh, I've got some really good candidates and I'm hoping that by next week we start in-person interviews and by next month uh, Steve can come back and report to you that there has, is a new film commission manager and that'll, that'll be wonderful news. Um, 
there's also, and when we are fully staffed, uh, we're just going to get out there and um, participate in industry-specific learning and networking opportunities. There's many in-state, and there's some out-of-state that are already in our, that are listed in our budget. We're going to work on updating that crew database and the support services, uh, and our uh, filming locations databases. Those are some big, some main tools that we have that people can tap into. They're keyword searchable, so whatever they're looking for, it's easily found. It just, it just, it just is important that the information that they find is accurate. Um, we are going to make some small tweaks, nothing big, to the film uh, business development, development marketing program. Uh, we're going to just add some definitions, tighten it up a little bit, take another look at so that we have the minimum 10% and it can go up to 20, 25, and 30%. So we're going to look at those higher percentages to see if they're still making sense. Where we'd like to set aside a uh, a chunk of the new budget for um, first-time participants, and um, some more news that will come down the line. Um, uh, one of the things that we want to do is also the people who are going through our workforce development programs, we'd um, like to help them find work whenever they can, so uh, that is going to be a priority as well. And. Um, continue our marketing partnerships with local film festivals. Uh, Sunscreen was the most recent one, but we've already had five so far this year since January. We've got Gasparilla that we worked with, um, Dunedin International Film Festival, the Sunshine City Film Festival, um, and more are coming. And those are just great opportunities for people in the industry to come out, not only just to see some great films, but they always have um, panels and workshops, so it's a learning opportunity and a networking opportunity, and, um, and people love them. Uh, so moving forward, again, this is just the outreach. Uh, we really, I would really like to make a push to share um, with all of our stakeholders all of the many things that are being produced here in Pinellas County. Uh, just last Friday night, uh, a hotel renovation, the hotel was in Indian Shores and it was featured on HGTV on the um, 100 Day Dream Home Hotel Renovation uh, Edition. And they did a phenomenal job of um, showing where Indian Shores is and talking about it and they had these great sunset shots and drone shots and it just looked really beautiful. So, you know, it's one thing to come here and make the make the projects, but then you need to see them when they're done too and, and just appreciate all that's going on in the film commission world. Um, Yep, just keep building the brand awareness. Tony Armour was doing a great job with that, so I wanna just continue the momentum uh, by promoting our business development marketing program through our advertising or through going to the industry trade shows. Uh, Movie Maker Magazine is a, is a very popular magazine in the industry. They do a section each year on the best places to live and work as a filmmaker. So for the last three years, St. Petersburg has made it onto that list. Um, it started out as number 25, it's jumped up to 24, and this year in 2023, it's gone to number 23. So I'd like to keep that, um, keep that going. Uh, we'd like to create some more videos, video content that's focused on filming tips and filming locations throughout the destination. Um, partner with some industry influencers to um, have them help us promote the area as a great destination for filming. And then um, explore some film tourism opportunities. Uh, and that can be um, something that can enhance our world-class arts scene. Um, it's, film tourism is big in other states where they have a lot of production. Uh, Georgia, is, there's trips all over different parts of Georgia. Uh, you can go to New Zealand or to Ireland, um, and just see where things have been shot, and people love doing that. And it'll just give them another uh, fun thing to do while, while they're here in destination. And that wraps up my presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions, uh, Commissioner Kimball? Yes, um, Lisa, uh, you say there's seven counties uh, in the state of Florida that have a film commission? A, f a film incentive type of program. And, and tell us 
where do we fit in that size? We're like 1.8 million. Uh, what's other ones comparable to us uh, in size, what their incentive is total? Yeah, that, I don't have that information. I haven't been able to spend a lot of time researching. That is on my list of things to follow up with, um, and I sh should probably know that answer. Um, do you Steve? I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I know from a county perspective, Hillsborough has an incentive program, Lauderdale has an incentive program, Dade, Miami-Dade has one. So those are comparable destinations size-wise. And then their programs, the amount of the incentive varies by each of the, of the counties. So I think we're probably the, we provide the most opportunity than the others, if I remember right, from something I saw here, here recently, and I'll try to look that up. So the highest, we're at the highest at 1.8 million? I believe so. Okay. On the uh, filmflorida.org website, there is a link to the different uh, counties in Florida that have the incentive program. I don't think, though, that they list the, um, the amount that's been budgeted for those counties, but I'll, I'll find that information out and bring it back to you. Anybody else? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Lisa, great presentation. Thank you so much. I know uh, you're new in the role and uh, jumping right in. Um, so many of your priorities seem to be things that are out of your control. They're either uh, a state issue or just larger issues that you can't control. And, and you know, certainly we need to help you out with get some more staff. Mm -hmm. but to focus on those things that you can do, identifying you know the top two or three that yes we can we can knock these out. They're in my control. I've got the money and the and the bandwidth to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, is is a great way to tackle this. You've got a you got a big job ahead of you, and you got to take that bite one small bite out of the apple at a time. Yes, I have learned uh, I'm only one person right now, and there's a limit to how much I can do, but uh, that's all going to change next week when I get help. And then, oh, we're also getting next, uh, I mean, next month, next week, we are also getting some interns, so that's going to help uh, to some degree also. Are individuals like David Yates um, helpful and influential in, in promoting Pinellas County as a, um, as a destination for uh, Location? Yes, absolutely. If David, uh, if uh, David Yates had his way, uh, my budget would be ten million dollars for that program. <laughs> but I told him there's no way I can do that without a lot more staff. <laughs> I agree with David. <laughs> you agree with David? Okay, thank you. And and the staffing part as well. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Well, I look forward to that day. Anyone else? Doreen? No. Anybody? Thank you very much, Lisa. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> and now we have Rosemarie Payne. Oh, there you are. So good afternoon. And I actually have some guests that are with me today. Um, I have Stefan Hager, who is from Kaus in Hanover, Germany. And we have Jane Brooke, who is with Rooster. And so in our presentation on global travel, let me see if I can get this, there we go. We're gonna be presenting, um, I just wanna make sure that it's clear that the budget summary and the um, budget benefits that are in your book, that is a combination of the domestic and Canada and Latin American markets that we put into that request for $567,300. And then of course, um, PR and marketing out of Central Europe and out of, um, UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia, those monies come out of the contracts that we have with these two companies. So the newly formed department brings together a unified team focused on leisure sales and marketing initiatives across all domestic and international markets. Working through the travel trade, media, and tour operators across new and developing domestic and international markets, global travel will foster relationships that invite visitors to experience everything the destination has to offer. Sales initiatives will be conducted throughout the USA, Canada, 
United Kingdom, Ireland, Scandinavia, Central Europe, and LATAM markets, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina. Global Travel will also host inbound FAM educational visits throughout the year from these key markets so clients can acquire the tools to inspire new and repeat vacation travel to St. Pete Clearwater. The team will continue to focus on specific areas of expertise and the staff based in St. Pete Clearwater will assist the sales effort of the team in the UK and Central Europe. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about some key performance indicators. Global travel has, been, has seen the domestic leisure vacation business continue to be the strongest market for St. Pete Clearwater. Our growing partnerships with travel advisor organizations like AAA clubs in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Auto Club Group, which includes Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee, CCRA, which are home-based travel advisors, and ASTA, the American Society of Travel Advisors, continue to show results. As a matter of fact, VSPC is partnering with AAA for the first ever AAA national campaign with Visit Florida that just launched. Visit St. Pete Clearwater was part of World Travel Market Brazil. This is the second largest trade show in Brazil, and we were part of the Visit USA Florida booth. And we've got new sales opportunities, I'm sorry, sales initiatives and co-op advertising as a result of shows like Anato in Colombia. We also meet with domestic and international tour operators at trade shows like Florida Huddle and IPW to discuss room night production and market trends. As rebounding markets continue to grow, we meet with partners from the UK, Germany, Brazil, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia. We also meet with operators from emerging markets across the US and international operators. The team has trained thousands of tourists and professionals across all markets, and we've created a robust sales plan for fiscal year 24 that will allow us to continue to influence new business to our destination. We partner with Visit Florida for missions in key international and domestic markets, and we oversee co-op marketing opportunities with Brand USA, tour operators, and we often partner with other Florida DMOs like Visit Tampa Bay on initiatives and marketing when appropriate. We have seven new sales initiatives in the 24 plan, including Be to Meet Workshop in Brazil, Travel Leaders Domestic Edge Conference in Orlando, trade workshops in Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and Brazil, and the Luxury Travel Ultra Summit in Arizona. So looking at some of our, as you look at some of the, um, this, there'll be a lot of similarities across all domestic and international markets when it comes to our SWOT analysis. Exchange rates, fuel prices, competition, hotel rates, and weather can impact domestic and international travelers. And some challenges are unique to certain markets, like visa requirements from some Latin America markets. We have a lot of strengths keeping St. Pete Clearwater successful in bringing domestic and international leisure visitors to the destination. We have a very talented team across all markets, and the staff has strong relationships and a reputation for excellence and expertise in the tourism community. The global team is also proactive in working with other Visit St. Pete Clearwater departments in key markets to build on brand awareness. And ongoing product development in the destination keeps the story of St. Pete Clearwater on a forward trajectory to attract new visitors and a changing landscape for return customers. So moving forward, priorities include strengthening relationships with key trade partners, including travel advisors, tour operators, and airline partners. Frequent correspondence and face-to-face -face meetings on a regular basis to increase leisure visitation. The, same, the sales plan we have proposed will support this vision. Global Travel will also focus on enhancing brand awareness through targeted marketing campaigns with travel partners. Increased FAM educational opportunities will showcase the destination to partners from new and developing global markets. We also want to increase exposure through media outreach and press visits, especially from our LATAM markets. Global travel will continue to develop niche markets to showcase the diverse offerings of St. Pete Clearwater. We are also very excited about partner training development through platforms with Brand USA's Discovery Program 
and our new Visit Florida Specialist Program that will be available to domestic and Canadian travel advisors and will be translated into Spanish, Portuguese, German, and French. And that platform is on track to launch in June. And finally, the team will continue to look for reliable research to support our sales initiatives and key performance indicators. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Stefan, who's gonna talk about Central Europe. Stefan, guten Tag. <laughs> guten Tag. Thank you, Rose. Um, I want to introduce myself again very briefly. I'm Stefan Heger. I'm Director of Public Relations at Chaos Media Services. So I basically oversee all PR and media relations activities for St. Peter Water in uh, Central Europe. So in the next couple of slides, I would like to give you a brief overview of our FPR, of our efforts in all different fields uh, of this current fiscal year and an outlook on our proposed activities for the next fiscal year. But uh, before, I would like to also briefly introduce the rest of our, the Sampi Clearwater team in Central Europe, which is headed up by uh, Axel Kaus, um, who unfortunately cannot be here today as his fiancée just got a baby a few days ago. And then we have uh, Mika and Ralph, who both are responsible for B2B and B2C marketing activities of our area in the Central European countries. Since the borders of the United States opened back up in 2021 in November, we experienced a very strong demand for travels to the United States, to Florida, and obviously also to our region here in St. Pete Clearwater. Uh, in order to support this travel recovery process, we implemented a large number of B2B and B2C campaigns in the current year. So, for example, we promoted our destination uh, on the occasion of the Tampa Buccaneers um, NFL game in Munich last November, where we hosted several promotions prior uh, and during the actual uh, game day. We also had the chance to promote St. Pete Clearwater uh, for an entire month in more than 700 McCafe and McDonald's restaurants in Germany, uh, where we uh, were able to place a destination video. The promotion resulted in about 35 million consumer contacts with a media value of approximately $2.6 million. And thanks to our negotiations, this promotion was completely complementary for Sampi Clearwater. Our media promotion efforts resulted uh, in this fiscal year alone, uh, so yet to date, in a total of 297 articles with a reach of 145 million impressions and a media value of $8.4 million. With these numbers, we were able to double the media value and increase the reach of our media efforts in the first seven months compared to the entire fiscal year uh, 2021 and 2022. We also carried out several trade and media fam trips to St. Pete Clearwater, including also the training of our destination uh, at the Campus Live event uh, hosted in Florida by Germany's leading tour operator, Der Tour. In addition, we promoted St. Pete Clearwater at, uh, during several co-op promotions with tour operators at, uh, at a large number of media and trade events in Central Europe, as well as uh, certain co-op functions uh, in collaboration with Visit Florida, Brand USA, as well as the various Visit USA committees in the Central European countries. However, um, as you might know, we are facing also many headwinds in our promotional efforts uh, due to the strong competition from other destinations uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic but also due to other factors which we can't control. For example, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has led to a very high inflation in our, area, in our area, higher than in the US. We have much higher energy costs, uh, very high airfares currently uh, across the Atlantic, and uh, as, as well a very strong US dollar. All of these headwinds represent a risk in the number of visitors to the US, but also to Florida and our destination. At the same time, we still see a very strong interest in travels to Florida. Due to the aforementioned challenges, we see the need, but also the chance to increase our promotional efforts of St. Peter Clearwater, also with other Florida DMOs, Visit Florida Brand USA, 
and the Visit Florida, the, the, the Visit USA committees in Central Europe, who are also a great asset. Um, in addition, of course, we see the continuously very, very strong interest in our destination as we receive many requests from both tour operated but also media um, for fam trips um, to St. Pete Clearwater. So due to the strong competition from other destinations uh, and the economic insecurity currently, we will have to work even harder moving forward in next fiscal year um, and increase our, in order to increase our visitor numbers from Central Europe again. So what we plan to do is to put a really strong focus on consumer activations uh, in the next fiscal year to influence the travel decision for St. Pete Clearwater. And this will also include um, a strong collaboration with organizations such as Visit Florida, Brand USA, and the Visit USA committees in order to stretch our marketing budget, but also increase our visibility at the same time. And in, the, in addition, we will select the most important travel producers for our region uh, and conduct co-marketing activities, activities with them. And last but not least, we will also put a strong focus on um, the media outreach we are doing in Central Europe and the number of media fam trips. So, so we um, really reach the consumer at the end, increase our media exposure, and stimulate the demand for our destination. Thank you. And now I will hand over to Jane Brock. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, the team. So the team, first of all, are very, very passionate about the destination. Um, they absolutely love it. It's, it's a key point of selling any place. And um, yeah, we're very, very fond of it, as Rose knows. Um, our key objectives are to increase air arrivals, educate, engage, and inspire the travel trade, the consumer, and the media. We want to strengthen brand recognition. We want to show a picture and people say, that's St. Pete Beach, that's Clearwater Beach, that's the Dali Museum in St. Pete. We work closely with Visit Florida and Brand USA. We secure frequent targeted exposure to influence holiday decisions and we ensure all activity is integrated. So it's very important that when we're doing PR and we're doing marketing, we're doing sales, we're all working together. We're accountable, ensuring that every pound that we spend is well spent. Now, there's a huge pent-up de demand for travel. Consumers are cutting back on essentials in favour of holiday. That's a repercussion of, obviously, COVID. Holidays are a spending priority. But it is a highly competitive market. Commissioner Long mentioned it earlier. We're not competing with just the, the Mediterranean. We are competing with Dubai. We're competing with the world. We really do need to stand out. So I'd like to now share with you how Rooster works hard in our market to ensure that we, or Physics St. Pete Clearwater, stands out. Highlights. We collaborated with The Telegraph, which is a main publication in the UK, on a six-month awareness campaign, which was both digital, print, and online. And it was through Brand USA as well, which is one of our big partners. We do frequent collaborations with Visit Florida on events such as World Travel Market, roadshows, and tour operator partnerships. That ensures that our pound, or your dollar, goes further. We seek out consumer events which are high profile, with a high footfall, that reach our core audience. We're always looking for opportunities to stand out. We went to a festival called the Big Festival, which I will show you at the end. Mackenzie was there as well. Um, we were the only travel partner there. And what we did, we did an activation where kids could come along, they could put hats on, they could colour them in, they could do bags. We were speaking to the adults. We were convincing them why they should come to this destination. And as, as the only travel destination there, we really stood out. We had such great feedback. We met over 20,000 people. And, um, yeah, it's something that we're going to be doing again this year. Virgin Atlantic inaugural, as you know, happened last November. Um, we worked on a press trip over here, as well as a, med uh, as well as a fam trip. We brought over 38 key selling agents over here. Um, plus, we did training evenings in the UK as well to really, again, inspire and educate the travel trade on the new route. We write and send out consumer and trade newsletters. We've grown the consumer 
trade newsletter, the, the, sorry, the consumer newsletter by 89% in the last year to over 18,000 people. So these are 18,000 people that we're speaking to on a regular basis, educating them, building those layers. They know everything about the destination and what it has to offer. We've also grown the trade database by 125% to 543. That's through networking and our own industry contacts. We generated 110 pieces of coverage. That's a 39% increase year to date. And we've still got four months to go. We've hosted nine journalists and bloggers, and we currently have five journalists in the destination as we speak. The media value is currently over 4 million US dollars, and we have a strong presence at IMM and other media events. We've hosted numerous trade events as well. 75 trade visitors have, have featured visited this destination. And again, as mentioned before, it's, it, we have to get them out here. We have to get them seeing the destination. We have to get them seeing the attractions, the hotels, so they're, they're engaged and then they go back and then they sell it to their clients. It's hugely important. So here lists our strengths and opportunities and there are weaknesses and there are threats, but here are the strengths and opportunities. You have a great tourist infrastructure the diversity of your attractions, we heard about the Dali this morning, that's hugely successful in the UK market. They love that, it's a huge selling point, and I'm so glad that you are supporting them on that. Um, warm weather, I know for you, it's, a, it's an everyday occurrence, but it's a guaranteed warm weather destination, which is very important for the UK, Scandinavian and Irish market. There's great twin and multi-centre destinations, both in the USA, um, and in Florida. Now, as you probably know, Orlando is hugely popular here, hugely popular in the, in the UK, should I say. And we are trying to get more people that visit Orlando to then come over to the best beaches. Um, that's a big drive for us, and I'll talk about that going forward. We've got regular good quality direct flights with British Airways flying in daily and Virgin Atlantic also now daily. Um, and you've also got great service staff and tourism sector in the destination. There is a trend of discovering the lesser known destinations, a trend of ecotourism and nature-based tourism, new hotels, openings and renovations, which you've got abundance of, and it's really great to see, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of those while I'm over here. Ongoing tourism, strong development, and home to um, Florida's largest pride festival and other events that are, again, a big draw. And we do sell those a lot in the UK. People, are, people want to know why they come to the destination. Yes, they can lie on the beach, but they really do want to see other things. They want to be involved in other things. They want to spend their money. They want to go to the attractions. So that's all very important. So priorities moving forward is to continue to grow brand awareness through targeted brand partnerships, outdoor activations, as the one that I mentioned, and through key trade partners. We want to increase exposure through media to drive positive endorsements, ensuring targeted media outreach and press trips are reached. We want to grow the UK consumer database to allow frequent communication. As I mentioned before, that is our communication tool. It's key to building loyalty to the brand and all online activations have opt-ins. We want to develop the niche markets to showcase all the diverse offerings the destination has. This is done through consumer and the trade newsletters, press trips, campaigns, all to drive that awareness. Now, I didn't mention them, but you may want to know what I think of the, the weaknesses and threats um, from our market. And I would say the cost is one of them. Um, the Far East has opened up later than the rest of the world, and they are very competitive on their pricing. Um, so that's something to, to be aware of. Um, Obviously, hurricanes, red tide, all things like that do get picked up in, in the UK press. Um, obviously, the competition for the rest of the world. The price of things like accommodation, car hire, it is quite expensive. I think post-COVID, we've seen a noticeable increase in the price, and that is being reflected through the tour operators. So again, it's, it's just one of those things that we've got to work harder to overcome. Um, and also another thing from the perspective of hotels and accommodations, not getting the rates early enough. The tour operators in the UK sell the destinations well in advance, 12, 12 months in advance, and sometimes they're not getting those rates quick enough, in which case they're going to get rates from other places who are then going to, and then they'll, they'll be sold before us. We've just got to be aware of that as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane, and um, thank you, Stefan, for coming last minute. Um, Axel, um, his baby came a little later than expected, but um, Axel and Jane are going to be joining Steve and myself and Andrea and Jose and Liz and Mackenzie at IPW starting this Saturday, which is U.S. Travel's largest trade show, and this year it is in San Antonio. So we'll be heading there with some hotel partners, and it should be an excellent show. So that is our presentation from Global Travel. Are there any questions, either for myself or for Jane or for Stefan? Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Rosemary, Stefan, Jane, thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, over the years, I've seen great success at a variety of hotels in Florida where we have partnered well with international air carriers coming into the market. Um, talk to me about what efforts we have underway to work with those airlines that have nonstop service in from uh, Western Europe uh, or UK, Ireland, and, and how can we improve that? Because I think partnering with them is a great first step to growing our uh, our market share there. And we have great partners at the Tampa International Airport and at St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. I just received an email um, from Tampa talking about some markets that they're looking at growing um, direct service from into our destination. I met with WestJet in Canada, and WestJet um, just bought... Um, um, Oh, it just went on my head. Sunwing, thank you. Just bought Sunwing, and Sunwing used to bring in flights into PIE, and we're very successful, and hopefully that might be something that's coming down the pike. But yes, definitely, anytime we can get involved in a conversation with the airlines, we are there. Um, I actually sat in on the presentation um, to pitch Tampa International Airport to Virgin Atlantic, and we won that service, and it was it was fabulous, and such a, such a, a big... Um, win for the destination. So anytime global travel can be part of that conversation, we'll be there. Yes, Jane. Jane. Sorry, I can add to that. Um, so I frequently speak with British Airways and Virgin um, in the UK. Um, we, work, we work very closely with Virgin Atlantic Holidays and British Airways Holidays, which obviously, as you know, is the holiday arm but working hand in hand with the airline. Um, I was re recently approached with Virgin for a campaign it was quite expensive, if I'm honest, but it is something that we're going to try and do next fiscal year. Um, they put these campaigns out last minute, and it was 40,000, and 40,000 for the UK budget is, is, is a fair share, one third. Um, so we can't all of a sudden just turn that on and say, yes, we can do that, but it's something that if I'm aware of it, then I can put that money for the, for the next fiscal year, if that makes sense. But Virgin Atlantic is on our, is on our radar, but we work very, very closely with Virgin Atlantic Holidays and different campaigns, different campaigns that we do with them as well. Are you aware of any other, um, any other airlines that are considering uh, Tampa or PIE for direct flights? I don't know any. I, I mean, I've, I've heard some countries mentioned, but I don't know if any of those have come to fruition. I'd like to get more information before I said that. I know several of them are from LATAM markets, which would be wonderful. And I don't know if you have any intel. Yes, come on over. Sorry, <laughs> just hover here. So I recently had a meeting with Norse. So Norse, um, we just noted in the press that they're starting to fly to Orlando again. They came. So I had a meeting with them to try and work out if we can do a campaign with them, again, getting people from that are flying in with Norse to Orlando, getting them to buy that, but then coming over to here as well. So that's, we're, we're in negotiations with talking with them as well. So just quickly touching base on any efforts we are doing with airlines flying directly from Central Europe to Tampa. So currently, there are only two airlines flying nonstop. So this would be Eurowings Discover from Frankfurt and Edelweiss Air from Zurich. So we are working very close with them. Um, so currently, what we are mostly doing are, for example, joint road shows where we, um, where we attend them. So do, I think just a couple of weeks ago, there was a Eurowings Discover road show where we also attended together also with a uh, visit Tampa. Bay. So this is something we are already doing and looking uh, to continue in the future. Similar with Edelweiss Air, we are also looking on potential B2C activities which we could do together with the respective airlines, especially the Swiss market, for example, is a similar situation as 
Jane had quite expensive, so it's hard to, um, to get the, the funds for that. Uh, but we are in discussions there. And obviously, and this is also something what we are trying to do, but it got very difficult in especially uh, Central Europe to get, for example, complimentary tickets um, for journalists or bloggers who would fly over in, uh, as a fam trip. Um, in the past, they were more generous as they are now, so we are on it and in continuous meetings, but it's uh, very hard to get through them. Um, yes, and speaking of other airlines, um, Jane mentioned Norse, and there are also other airlines which are in discussion. Actually, the Icelandic um, carrier Play, um, which is also quite new in the market since uh, two years, they considered starting flights to Orlando already last year. However, they needed to postpone that as due to the quite high fuel prices, they focused on shorter routes, like for example to Washington. Uh, but play flights to Berlin, Hamburg, and um, Stuttgart in, uh, in Germany, for example, this is also an, an option if they would come back to, to their Orlando plans that we try to work with them closely. Do they, do they route everything through Reykjavik? Yes, exactly. So similar concept as Iceland Air. No, you cannot talk without being at the mic. We're on. I feel conscious that I'm coming back and forth. No, I'm just saying that we look after play as well as, as one of Rooster's clients. So we're on. So as, if there's any inkling of them coming to Orlando, we'll be on it. Yeah, but they do. They fly everything fast. Rec, 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 yeah. Thank you. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? You yeah. done? Yep. Can I ask a couple of questions? Yeah. And, and that is, um, knowing where we were in 2017, 18, 19, and using that as a base, do we have any idea of where we are in 23, of the percentage of business back, where we think we are when we say it's going to increase in 24? Is it 50% of that business that we had in 19? Where do we think it's going to be in 24? And, and then, just to get an idea of where you I mean, Europe one time was a million visitors a year in Pinellas County. Where are we today? We don't see those numbers. And what can we do is my question. I hope Steve is challenging you the next couple of days to say, here are the additional things that we should be doing. Here are the things that we did in 17 that was success. We need to put back into place. This is all our markets, Rosemary. But, but, but I think in Europe and in the UK, both, we need to challenge you all to help us with that and say, okay, here's the budget additions that we need to be looking at. And, and, and whether it's an airline, how much of the business is tour operators today that was in 19? And how, where's that fallen? Or is the people booking direct? And all the, that's what I'm, I would like to get some information if we can. So I, <laughs> I just start with a couple of points. So I don't have the exact numbers yet, but I know it's still a recovery process um, d d due to the, well, external factors we are currently experiencing in Central Europe with all the higher costs, the inflation, and the very high FES, we still have also not the same amount as, um, uh, of flights to uh, the US than we had in the past. But uh, also considering these external factors, we are already um, in, in discussions of what to do and where to even focus our marketing and PR activities on. So for example, given the increased pricing, we uh, need to look at these target groups who have like really the financial needs to, to come here uh, and who are able to fund it. So what we are doing, we are also looking more at niche markets, such as golf tourism, for example, luxury travel, of course. And given that we now have uh, all the new hotel openings here, we have a great opportunity to place these in the market and to highlight this in our efforts. Then obviously also the LGBT plus um, ma market is very interesting uh, also financially. So these are some segments we are working on more in a more um, stronger phase in the next couple of months. Jane? Mm, yeah. um, we don't have a huge handle on the number of exact visitors that we have from here. I know it's very difficult to get. Um, so in answer to your question, I don't know where we are to know where we're gonna be going. 
Um, but what I do know is that talking to the tour operators that feature the destination, definitely figures are on the way up. Um, as mentioned before, I, you know, it's the global competition as well that's out there. We are spending our marketing spend on collaborations with tour operators, outdoor activations, different brand partnerships. We're not spending any of our money on advertising. So I know Katie alluded to the fact that there's not an advertising budget as such in, in, a, in, in the UK, Scandinavian, Irish market. I think it's the same with you. We could spend some of that money on adverts. Um, I'm not inclined to do that at the moment because it would be great to have additional money, I guess, to do that. But if you're, we need to st start talking about selling the destination. We're, we're, we're telling a story. We're, we're educating people. People know about Miami. They know about Orlando. We're trying to educate them about this area. And, and I just think a, an ad, we can do advertorials. We, you know, the PR obviously does a great job. And, and, the, and the job of the PR is, is to ultimately sell, sell the destination and write about it. But um, with the figures, it's a difficult one. We are obviously talking closely with airlines and tour operators and trying to get those numbers back up. And that's what I worry about for the years that I've been had gone and everything is those regulars that would come every year or a couple times a year they came that I know where they are. They're down the Mediterranean. They have a house down there now, and they haven't come back yet. Mm. And they're the ones mm. that can afford to come. Those are the ones, how do we get back to those people the regulars that had came, and that was a good population that spent money in the cross section of all the hotels. That post COVID are not coming back. Maybe they'll never come back. So, what's our percentage of the UK? I think is one of the challenges we need to say, or the Central Europe. Yeah. Steve? Uh, Madam Chair? Yeah. So, in looking at data from tourism economics, and this would be visitors, mm -hmm. and you look at the UK and look at 2019, we had a little over 65,000 visitors from the UK. In 2022, well, the uh, 2021, you had eight, a little over 8,000. So you saw the drop because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. In 22, that number has gone back up to 29,000, but it's not to the level where we were uh, in, in 19. Germany, 37,000, a little over 37,000 visitors in 2019, 2021, 4,500 visitors, and now we're back up to 17. So again, about half, half of uh, where we're at. So, and I think if you go back and look at each of the different international markets, you're gonna see where we're not back fully. And when I say international, you know, the, you know, France, Netherlands, Mexico, Brazil, all, all of those. So that's that, I think, you know, what we've mm -hmm. talked about before, we're not there yet. Um, and that's where they think 24. U.S. Travel um, or, or Brand USA at a recent meeting went through and they looked at the, the international travelers and their intent to travel. Um, and they looked at it at the same time period pre-pandemic -pan and then post-pandemic. And the only markets they saw where there was an increase, and this again is the whole U.S., not, not just Florida or our destination, uh, was uh, Canada and Mexico. The rest of them were almost even or below. Mm -hmm. So it shows, again, you have the, the, the recovery and the work we still have to do. Some of that, I think they identified when it came down to the you know, weaknesses, um, it came down to, uh, well, there were really three things. One was visa wait times for the uh, countries where you had to have a visa, like Brazil. Um, and in that one, I mean, they were like at 300 days to get a visa, um, was over 600. Um, and then they also, the cost of the, the vacation, so coming to the States was more expensive than going to, going to someplace else. Um, and then the, the last thing was um, concerns around safety. So there's what you're seeing on, on, the, on the international side. And so where are we going to go back to? And is it time to hit for 24? Is it time for us to put more money into those PR yep. efforts and everything with the tour operators and retail and everything else? Where do we start hitting that to go forward? Yeah. I think another thing is to, to consider is that post-pandemic, um, well, before the pandemic, the tour operators could get great rates, great availability. Post-pandemic, the rates have soared and the availability is not there. But as it sounds like the US traveler that were coming down here and using the destination, which obviously you still want, are now 
travelling abroad, that's going to free up some rooms for our city. Because what we're hearing is everywhere is full and everywhere, everywhere is really busy. Well, we want to bring people, but if there isn't any rooms and the right. prices are so high, it's, it's difficult. So, you know, it, it is a process. And I do think over the next coming years that that will change. And I think more you know, the domestic market will go overseas a bit more. Hopefully the, the, the prices will will come down a bit, even car hire and things like that have been hugely affected and, and very, very expensive. Um, so I think it is a, it's something that will, will change, but we need the, you know, it's great we've got new, new hotels arriving, so there's going to be lots of infantry there, so hopefully more. I, I think what's going to happen is you're going to see the availability a little bit more softening. I think we're already starting to see that and everything. You're, we're, we're not certainly, you won't see going back to the rates Mm. were so we got to pick that market mm -hmm. that will still travel and come that will start coming again is what we have to do i think it's somewhere in between but that turn for demand and for hotel availability i think is just starting to happen all those who went to europe we're going to europe this summer aren't staying in our hotel this yeah summer, okay our cruises so i think it's that's why i'm asking is it is the time and these, I'll be glad to have coffee with you. Yeah, and, the, and these, these are going to be some of the discussions we're going to have tomorrow and Friday in our partner meeting. In Canada. In Canada. be on that list, too, because that's, that's Absolutely. the market we have not seen. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor? Just a couple of things. I was curious to <clears throat> just get a sense from you about um, Scotland travel. Scotland? Mm-hmm. All that change. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about Dunedin, but I know a lot about Dunedin. Okay, well that's why I'm asking. Because we had the we had the piece, didn't we? It was great. We had who did we have speak? We had somebody a local. Who was it? I can't remember. Yeah. Don't please don't, please don't carry on a conversation oh. that's not on the record. Sorry, I think it was with the Scottish song, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're focusing a lot of our Scottish efforts on earned media results. So we did do a Dunedin focus pitch where we worked with uh, Michael and Bryant from Dunedin Brewery, um, Tina from Casa Tina, I know and one uh, and one other um, business owner there. So that's where we're really focusing our efforts. And I want to yeah. say that we even have a writer from a Scottish pub Scottish publication here right now. We do have a UK group fam. He um, did fly over on right. We do. Okay, that's we've what got I thought. One from Ireland, we've got one from that's what I thought. Okay, so just so you know, next year is Dunedin's 60th anniversary of our sister city relationship with Sterling, Scotland. We also have the number one pipe band in the world in our city as grade two. They have been elevated to grade one. They will be competing at Worlds in Glasgow, and we have a whole contingent of Dunedin people going to Glasgow for Worlds and Sterling and doing some tours. So y'all just get in on this with us because we would love to talk with people over there. Um, the former provost of Sterling has a home in the city of Dunedin. He comes back and forth. I mean, you know, so we really think that there is an opportunity there, even though I think there isn't a direct flight that's part of our problem. but. You know, also I can tell you that the whole Sterling region has continued to con talk about the bed tax. I think if they could actually get themselves to pass it, and I've sent them plenty of information about it, if they could get themselves to pass it, I, you know, I think we could also get a lot more done. But I think there's something there. We'll definitely look into that information. Yeah, no, definitely. All, the, all this information is what we need. Yep. Because, and, and the bigger time frame that we have, right. the more we can do with it, and we right. can, more we can create something out up in Scotland and things like that. So, yeah, just definitely keep us, keep us in the loop. Yeah. And I, I'll just want to point out again on the uh, weaknesses, lack of public transportation for international visitors that are not comfortable or do not drive. I just want to point that out even if it's just getting their butts out of the airport and into the general destination, 
And I think one of the needs things, to be a focus. And one of the things that we're talking a lot about is the success of the Sunrunner bus that we have, making sure that all of our um, international offices know about the trolley systems throughout Pinellas County that are available to customers that are in market. Uh, I guess one of the challenges we're hearing as far as transportation goes is the new Brightline service, which now is nonstop train service between Miami, West Palm Beach, and now Orlando. So are we going to lose any business to customers that are flying into Orlando and instead of driving over to St. Pete Clearwater, are they gonna hop on the Bright Line and head down to Miami? Oh, so Pete that's- Rosemary, that train is coming right into downtown Tampa. They already are building the tracks. Yes, it, it, yes, we know that. It's just for, the, the, for right now. Well, it won't be right now, but within the next year, We've got a big yeah. problem just making sure that we can get folks from downtown Down Tampa to St. Pete across the bridge. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Very, very thank good you. presentation. And thank you to our visitors from the UK and from Germany. Very nice to have you here. Come back again and we'll teach you how to do the conga on the beach. Right, Russ? You got it. We can have a party whenever you want. Okay. All right, uh, Hortensia Simmons, please come forward. Good afternoon. I am Hortensia Simmons, Senior Sales Manager at Visit St. Pete Clearwater for the meetings and conventions. So some of our meeting highlights, in, as you can see in, 1999, in 2019, we had 999 leads. We booked 401 meetings with 159,780 room nights with an economic impact of 58.8 million. And in 2020, as we all know, the pandemic hit and the meetings started to cancel but I think we did pretty good for the pandemic. And then in 2021 is when we had more meetings that canceled because people were still not comfortable traveling during that time. And then last year in 2022, we booked 408 bookings, 126,329 room nights with $74.7 .7 million. And we actually had 1,742 leads. That was a great year for us being sourced for leads. So a lot of the meetings that we did not book after receiving those leads is due to rates. So we're getting a lot of um, emails from our clients and meeting planners that the rates are a little high, but we're still trying to work with them because we do have a great incentive program. So in our SWOT analysis, our strengths are complementary services that we offer through the CVB, um, our social media presence, and our beaches are one of the most desirable beaches in the state of Florida. And our sales team veterans, as in myself, I've been with the CVB 17 years, and we also have a great incentive program that we offer to a lot of our groups. Um, financial commitments, and we've committed over $237,000 in financial assistance so far this year out to our business and groups in the destination. These funds actually help us to incentivize the groups, help them with transportation, help our sponsors and our stakeholders when it's time to do familiarization tours in the destination. And then our weaknesses, lack of convention center, inadequate advertising, higher group rates. We do get a, quite a few leads that come in that actually have over 1,000 people in attendance, and they actually need probably 500 rooms on peak. And we do get some that have 800 rooms on peak. And then a lot of them don't want to be in the hotel. They want to have space for actually to host trade shows when they actually have a lot of attendees and local people coming to the meetings. So we do, get, we do have to turn down a lot of those RFPs that come through. 
and opportunities, increasing advertising, increase of hotel meeting space size, and cohesive hotel meeting space in hotel rooms. Threats, lack of convention center, trade show space, transient leisure compression, hurricanes, red tide, and state level politics. <laughs> and I'll refer to Steve on our PACE report. Yeah, um, so one of the things I wanted to show from the hotel side is, you know, because I know you guys look at PACE report quite a bit. This is something we can pull from our CRM and looking at where, where we are today. This is, the, this is the raw numbers. So if you look and you can see uh, 2023, you can see historically our average is roughly about 98,000 um, room nights. I'll make sure I'm speaking to the mic. Um, and to date right now, we are, um, our, our target would be at this point in time, it would be 83,000. Uh, we've got 96. We're actually to the plus side. Uh, where we are right now of about 12,000 room nights. When, when I talk about booking forward, when you look at 24, um, again, we should be at this time about 40,000 room nights and we're at 32. So we're about 8,000 down um, at this given time. And you go to 25, we're about 1,000 rooms down, room nights down. And then 26, we're about 2,300 room nights down. So if you go to the next slide, graphically, this is how it looks. So green represents uh, definites, and then the brown would be potential or, or tentative pieces of business. So you can see with the tentatives that we have for 23, you know, if we convert those, we're still going to be um, ab above pace for the year. When you go to 24, uh, again, looking at the tentatives that are out there, if we can convert a portion of those, then we should be good for that. But again, it's going through to turning the business and then the same for uh, uh, 25. But I think it's important to look at it. Uh, again, I think some of the things Hortensia has mentioned, uh, the types of business we're getting, you know, people love, they wanna come here and the first thing they are going through and you know, some of the larger groups is we're not able to accommodate them due to space. Um, and, and that even space within the hotel. Uh, we just don't have the, that vault, that size of business. So we're having you know, to retool in, in who we're talking to, to to get fit the product until that time that there is something. And I, you know, that may or may not happen. Um, you know, again, I know there's um, something in the plans with the gas plant um, district and that development, uh, but that's five, six, seven years from now before that, that would even materialize. So again, dealing with what we have, the product that we have, um, and, and, and reaching them in terms of rooms to space ratio, et cetera. So I, I, I don't think this is something you guys have seen before, but it's something that we can go through and show on a, on a regular basis. So currently we have 1,055 leads um, 170 bookings, six, um, 64,065 room nights with an economic impact of 58.5 million. Priorities moving forward. We plan on showcasing the destination and essential to secure definite business, develop and execute site inspections in person as well as virtual through collaboration with our hotel partners and stakeholders will be our top priority establishing a customer advisory group consistent of our stakeholders, meeting planners to foster creativity, strategic thinking, and overall industry knowledge. Take advantage of marketing and sponsorship opportunities at conferences as a platform to present the destination to a captive audience of meeting planners. And we wanna really focus on our strategic partnerships with our third party meeting planners, organizations, and identify opportunities to build the brand of St. Pete Clearwater. Thank you. Questions, comments, Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair, Hortensia, nice job. Great priorities. Um, underneath this, do you have strategies and tactics lined out to execute against to deliver these priorities? 
So we do have some things in place. So right now we're just trying to do new trade shows and focusing on doing more client events with our hotel partners. Um, those seem to work the best because getting that face-to-face -face and the one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, doing the trade, so, trade shows are also really good, but I think with the one-on-one -on -one and being face-to-face -face with the clients is a bit more for us to, uh, since we're a smaller destination and we don't have that convention center like Tampa or other cities, I think the face-to-face -face is better for us. Sure, and and face-to-face -face, listen is always wonderful. Um, uh, I've seen it work well in the past where we take these priorities and then we say, okay, what specifically are we going to do to establish a customer advisory group? What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? Who's responsible for delivering it? And how are we going to measure its success? To have strategies and tactics assigned to each one of these that, that help you hit these goals. So I'll refer to Steve to that because we have not actually started pulling that together. That's something that's in the making. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Claude first and then Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Hortensia, first I want to say uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, my wife Marie is a meeting planner, yeah. and she, you are always so responsive to her and very thorough, so she sends her best today. She knew, thank you. Tell her. You'd be here. The other is you mentioned that the rates being higher are displacing some business. Do you know where they're going roughly? Do you get a feedback of what yeah. is more affordable? We actually do. We actually um, email out to the planners at ask where the meetings have booked. And I um, hate to say it, but we do lose a lot to Tampa, even though their rates are a little slightly higher, but their rates are a little lower than what we have. Um, Orlando, I've seen a lot from Jacksonville, and either and also other states, um, other destinations. So we kind of track that, uh, where they go. I mean, it's something we could probably pull together if you kind of want to know where, you know, the percentages of where they're know. going. Okay. Other question is, uh, we do have a lot of meeting um, challenges in this area is some of these, I don't know all the programs that you're going to and participate in, uh, specifically focused on the small meeting market because that's where most of our success is. Yes, we actually do a um, couple of conferences um, during the small meeting markets. So attending the trade shows, there are always meeting planners there that are doing smaller meetings, not necessarily always doing the bigger meetings. So some of the trade shows have now started to uh, separate out the different meetings so they have citywide meeting planners they have meeting planners that are doing meetings so anywhere from 50 to 100 rooms anywhere from 250 to 500 so they do kind of partner and pair you up with the meeting planners that can accommodate your destination thank you madam chair um, just kind of building off a little bit of what clyde was talking about um, you know the fact that we don't have a convention center and that our rates are high and I, I heard you mention the name of the program that you do, and I can't remember the name of it, but talk to us about, it feels like you probably don't have enough money to offset those rates to attract meetings here. Because, I mean, that's your program. Your program is to say, hey, we have all this space in various hotels or resort locations, wherever that may be, whether it's St. Pete Beach or downtown St. Pete or Clearwater Beach or in Dunedin. And, and I know this because I brought one of our hoteliers in to meet with your team, I mean, this had to be maybe four years ago. And, and we were described the program because he's looking to add conference space. Because North County, that's not on the beach, there's very little conference space, except for Innisbrook, really, um, that's, that's meaningful. And, and he wanted to get educated as to how many seated space you thought they might need, or your group thought they might need. And it was explained to us that with the rates of the hotels, that that if that's going to make a, uh, a meeting event go away, that you all step in and, and offset the rates. So we don't actually offset the rates. What so we don't do, offset it to them. You yeah. offset it to the, the proprietor, right? Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So we actually um, do an incentive program to our groups when they're in the destination. And it starts at $3 per room per night. And we can go up as high as $5 per room per night. Those are just the parameters that we have been given. But that works really well for us to help us to pull meetings from other destinations. 
And not all the time do the groups know about those incentives, but we do try and get out there and talk to as many meeting planners as we can to make sure they do know. So when it comes to the incentives, we used to do transportation also, as long as it's within Pinellas County. But with the, when the pandemic came, we kind of had to cut back because our budgets have cut back. But you know, if we could be able to do those transportation along with the incentive to the groups that might help us you know, to bring in more group business. Well, this is, this is why I'm asking because, I mean, we had our group meeting with the county a few months back. And, and every time that we do that, every year or other year, we always talk about do we want a convention center or don't we? And it's like you can't have a convention center without hotels attached to it. It's just, mm. you know, I f I'm not saying it's a no, but it kind of feels like it's not going to happen. So if that's the case and it feels like we should, in our budget, be putting more money to the, the program that pays the proprietors the money to offset those fees, the normal fees, add the money for the trans. We should be doing extra and spending extra to get this space filled up and to make us more attractive. We don't have to be everything to everybody. We do not have to be a convention space place, but we do have great opportunities for hotel space. So I, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm not seeing the big increases in your budget that says that that's what's happening. I don't know who to look at. Yeah, so, so if I might, on the incentive program, one is there is there are times when we are going through and helping out with transportation. So we still have we're still doing that on the incentive program for the the meetings. Again, we're looking at is it competition with another destination, not anything with where you're competing against somebody in Pinellas, because that's just moving the the business around. Yeah, the, the other aspect is. Um, I don't believe, and I'll have to, I'd have to go look at it real quick, but I don't believe we've spent all of the money out of incentive the last several years. I think even to go back, go back to pre-pandemic. Um, so again, I think there's still money that's out there that we could use. Um, I think the, and the other thing I wanted to point out too, and, and Hortensia, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, when we'll go to target the different meetings, so example being National Coalition of Black Meeting Planners, they have a national convention, which I don't think we can host. We're, we're too yeah. small for that. However, we, we just ho hosted their board meeting. Now that's just as important because actually you get their board members and that's a more important group. So finding more of those types of meetings um, and then dedicating funds for that to make those happen. Um, we have an incentive, or there's an incentive show that's going to be in town this Sunday. beginning of next week, correct? Sunday. Yeah. Um, on that one, we went through and provided incentive money because it's all incentive meeting planners, and that's a market we're going after. So we're using those funds. We just have not used, totally used them up um, in, uh, out of the fiscal budget. So I guess, I guess what I would say is, you know, I, I can't tell you how to operate your organization. That's not our role here today. I, I'm strictly looking at the budget. But if you're telling me that the money hasn't been spent, then it says to me that maybe how we lay out how we spend the money is part of the problem and maybe new ways of looking at it could be done. And I only say that because well, you say we don't want if they're going if we're trying to stop them from going to a different destination. Well, what happens if somebody from Savannah wants to come to Pinellas County and they have their hearts set on staying at the Sheridan Sankey? That's where they want to be. They don't want to be anywhere else. Somebody's grandmother was there. They knew it was the best place. They don't care what else is there. That's where they want to be. And and you're saying because it's within Pinellas within Pinellas County, we wouldn't provide them with an incentive? No, if there's comp, in other words, if that person said, I wanna to go to the Sheraton Sand Key, and then the uh, trade wind says, well, I'm gonna take the business from them. All we're doing is- Oh yeah, is, no, I'm not, I'm, yeah, no, all, all I All we're doing is stealing the business from an, uh, within the county. What we want is we want new business coming in. Or that was going to go to right. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, okay. exactly. Or Tampa, or Orlando, or well, and I think re-examining the transportation issue, you know, getting people from, and I know you're saying within Pinellas County, except most people fly into, if they're coming from out of state, they a lot of people fly into Tampa. We should be able to get them from the airport to where they're going. Um, 
I just think all of that needs to be looked at, and I would love maybe later on in the year for you to make a presentation on on how you're going to make that better, and maybe the policies are changing, or you're going to throw a little bit more money from one account into another. But it's very clear we're not going to ever, ever get a convention center because we don't have the space. Yep. You know, so I think we have to look at it in a new way, and and I would like to hear how we can do that. Thank you. But oh, just, well. but just a comment on it. Uh, the last two years, as a pandemic, we came out of the pandemic. There's a fair amount of hotels on the beach that just didn't take any groups. Right. The leisure market was so demand, mm -hmm. and the rates were so high. Now they're starting to take it, so it's changing. But some of that money, I'm sure, wasn't spent because there wasn't any hotels available, yeah. and that's that's what we've been going through. I've done very well group side. But my group, my rates have come up. I knew, I knew. My favorite city. And yes, I've been to Sterling, and I've education, and I've been there twice. It's a great place. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyone else for Hortensia? Thank you. Very good presentation. Good discussion. Thank you. Okay, now we have Caleb Peterson, who's going to talk to us about the sports and events. Caleb, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Caleb Peterson with the Sports and Events Department. All right. Um, we have a full staff. Um, I, I, we're doing pretty good on our end. Uh, we've got uh, um, a, a full staff of, of experienced people that have dedicated markets that are, are doing very well. We had a banner year last year uh, where we set um, some record in, in terms of number of events and number of room nights. We're looking to, to meet that number again uh, this year, so we're off to a very good start um, this fiscal year. Um, to go into some of the, the strengths and weaknesses uh, SWAT, um, just a, an overview of, of how we view ourselves within the destination. Um, you know, we have a very desirable destination. Uh, we're not lacking for uh, demand in terms of people that want to come here. Our biggest issue is always being able to check the box in terms of number of fields, types of facilities. As long as we can do that, we've been very successful in, in being able to get people here. Um, we've got a very good brand in terms of baseball, softball, swimming, golf, things that are synonymous uh, with our destination. Uh, we have a, a lot of resources at our disposal. It goes beyond just financial incentives. We can offer uh, to offset costs in, in printing, uh, promotion, uh, in different areas where maybe it's not just money going their way, but it's, it's services that we can offer to uh, help offset costs that affect their bottom line. Um, some weaknesses, uh, like, like I mentioned, facility capacity, uh, specifically just number of fields, uh, number of diamonds uh, needed to um, you know, host different events. We don't do a lot of multi-purpose events, which would be soccer, football, lacrosse, things of those nature, just because we don't have the density of fields needed uh, within a, a confined space. Uh, if you look around the region, um, you know, down at IMG Academy or the Sportsplex over there in Tampa, those are two uh, types of venues where, you know, as an event organizer, you can go there, do your event in one spot, and you've got all these fields uh, at your disposal. If you try to do that same event here in our county, you're going to be spread out. You're going to have two fields here, three there. You know, so those are some of the issues that we always try to overcome and work with the organizers to see if we can find a, a solution. Um, all of our partners are community-based, um, so we're always trying to find that balance with them of meeting the uh, demand for the community and, and all of our, uh, our kids and, and uh, adults in the community playing sports with uh, tourism. Um, owning events, that would just be able to like run our own, have more of an impact. Um, we are purely in a middleman role. We don't control the venue. We don't run the event. So we're always trying to play uh, the closer. So if there's a gap in between um, them coming and finalizing, that's kind of where we try to come in and close the deal. Uh, opportunities. Um, if we ever built a new sports complex, it, it, for me, it doesn't matter what sport it is. There's demand, no matter what it would be. Uh, I would be a proponent of something indoors uh, just because it would be year-round. Uh, but if you built something, we would be able to fill it just based on the demand that we see. Um, traditional sports and non-traditional venues, essentially doing things on the beach. That's our biggest venue that we have. Uh, so we're always trying to ask people, if we don't have the indoor sp uh, space to, to run an event, would they be open to doing this on the beach? 
Uh, some are, some aren't. Uh, we've done some uh, open water polo events, which we've got one that's going to go over to Sheridan Sand Key here in a couple weeks uh, that we've had in the sailing center. Uh, that's an example of, it, of an event that is typically in a swimming pool that we've worked with them to place it in a natural venue. Uh, so always trying to have that conversation and see what we can't create that's out there. Um, we have the LA Olympics coming up in 2028, so we're having conversations with different uh, national uh, sports teams to see if they want to do trainings and, and create competitions here in, in North America while they lead up um, towards those games. Uh, threats, you know, red tide, hurricanes, uh, some of those natural disasters that will affect us all. Uh, inflation and staffing, uh, this is stuff that's coming back to us uh, from some of our partners. Um, you know, we're not the only ones dealing with staffing. I hear it from pretty much everybody, um, something as simple as getting somebody to drag a field. And, and keeping those people in that position and having enough of them to be able to service events. Uh, it's really starting to affect uh, some of our municipal partners. Um, and venue competition would be what I just explained about some of the areas around us. I, I can tell you some of the conversations that I've had lately, uh, you know, there's a new complex up there in Pasco. They're getting ready to expand that and build a new indoor complex. Uh, Tampa has a sports complex. They're in the process now of looking at building an indoor complex, which would add another a competitor in the area, and then the same thing south of us in uh, Nathan Benderson, they're also looking at building an indoor sports complex. So just right in our backyard, we've got a lot of the people in our region that are doing things like this that makes it harder for us to continue to, to pull people uh, to Pinellas County. Um, some new and exciting things that we've got coming up. Uh, we've got a Compete Sport Diversity Summit uh, down in St. Pete coming up in June. Um, that is LGBTQ event organizers. We're going to have about 20 of them in the destination for three days. Uh, they're going to be staying at um, the Hilton downtown St. Pete Bayfront, and they're going to be doing their meetings in uh, Tropicana Field, so partnering up with the Rays there. Uh, been an opportunity to showcase our destination to that demographic and show them what we have to offer. Uh, Suncoast Criterium is a short course uh, bike race. That's going to be a first-time event that they're creating in downtown St. Pete uh, in September. Um, that's one that they want to create as a, a standalone event that's synonymous with St. Pete. There's a great one that takes place up in Athens, Georgia, that they want to um, replicate and, and build from scratch here. So that's one that uh, it may not have huge impacts in year one, but the five-year plan that they've got and the outlook for how they want to build that is something that we're trying to get behind and help them build and, and are excited about. Uh, J70 World Championship is a sailing event. Uh, that event is international, and it will have people traveling here a month in advance of that competition and training for a full month. So that's going to have significant impacts. Uh, that is going to take place down at the St. Pete uh, Yacht Club. Um, excited about that. And then the 40th International Shuffleboard World Championships uh, will be at the uh, St. Pete Shuffleboard Club. It is actually their 100th year of operation, so excited. Uh, for, for our partners down there uh, to be able to celebrate that and welcome shuffleboard players from around the, the world. Uh, some other things we've got coming up, we've got the AAC Baseball Championship going on uh, next week in Clearwater. Uh, we've got a, a handful of World Series between softball and baseball coming up this summer and some, uh, some international um, swimming competitions down in St. Pete as well. So a lot of uh, exciting things happening in the sports world. Um, so some of our top priorities would be partner alignment. You know, sports are facilities driven. We cannot do anything unless we have the fields and, and the space to do it. So we're constantly having conversations with all of our municipal partners, trying to figure out, you know, what it is, what is it that they want to get behind? What do they want to go after and how can we help them achieve that? So constantly having that conversation to see what we can go after and, and uh, how we can align ourselves uh, to make things happen. Um, we, we try to go after high visibility events, things like the ESPN softball um, uh, tournament that is, is broadcast on a linear broadcast that's exposing our destination um, to a demographic that maybe is not reading, um, you know, some of the, uh, the magazines that we're in or, or some of these traditional uh, avenues that we're in. So trying to expose the sports world to our destination um, through some of these high visibility events. Uh, championships, because we don't have the density of fields that I've talked about, we always try to focus on the highest level. And a great example, again, is that ESPN event where we've got the top 16 or some of the top 16 softball teams in the country coming uh, to Clearwater play. So uh, we're constantly having conversations of how can we continue to build on that and move the needle and, and host uh, bigger and, and, and more uh, championships in the destination. Um, LA 2028, you know, the conversations we have with international bodies is that uh, 
Florida is an ideal place for them to come over and train. It's a lot cheaper for European South American countries to come up to Florida than it is to go all the way over to California. So there's some opportunities there uh, in the next uh, couple of years to host them and, and, and as they train and get ready uh, for the, the 28 uh, competition. And then uh, for trade show sponsorships, in terms of the budget, if, if there's an area where I feel we can make more of an impact, it's actually at these trade shows where we have all of the decision makers that we work with in one spot. So if we're gonna spend money to make an impact, that to me seems to be the, the best place to do it because you've got your entire demographic that you want in that place. Questions? Anybody? Phil? We had our joint meeting with BCC. We had a presentation on a giant complex. Has that gone anywhere? Have we, does it been discussed anymore for uh, the Toy Town area, I guess? Or <clears throat> So at, at this time, they are doing environmental, um, I would call it scans, and um, I mean, looking at it from an environmental perspective so they get a better idea of what cost may be uh, to move forward on that. That's happening right now. Um, so yeah, that's. I thought, they, I thought they already did that and said that it was it was it was you know doable that the uh, surface was fine and you yeah I think go the, too I think the, I think there were some limited things they had. This was more of a larger environmental scan. Um, I I can I can get you the information. Well, I just was curious where that was going because apparently you know hold them back <laughs> and it's been holding us back for as long as I've been on the board. <laughs> you know the uh, the. The facilities are spread out. We have a lot of them, but but they have their priorities. They've got their local league play and so forth, and then you've got to try to mix. Okay, we've got these available, but those aren't available, so you can't do it. If we had one big one big complex that they were talking about, then that would really bring a whole lot more, and it brings a lot of room nights. Yeah, so. and there's a balance there. You know, one of the benefits that we have for having that partnership is that our kids get to play on these complexes that are. MLS quality or good enough for these top college teams in the country. So, you know, it, it serves both sides, you know, so there is a community element to what we do that gives back and they benefit from, from some of the work that we do. Well, hopefully they'll, they'll get it done. <laughs> yeah. Julie? It seems like it's all the same people talking over and over. So my apologies, I swear to God, I don't want to be that person, because my question was about the complex too, where, where are we at with that? But I guess my other question is, is um, you know, as you know, we're, to preface that, as you know, we can't be everything to everybody, just like you said. We had to let uh, our softball fields go for the Blue Jays to build their um, player development complex. It was, it was only, we only had three. But we knew that Clearwater, that was their thing. So and we're right next door. So we worked a deal with Clearwater to let our residents, if they wanted to join a softball league, to do it at resident rates. That's how we fixed it. So I totally understand what you're saying. I think a big question now is pickleball. And I ask you this question because every time I open up the paper, a new city, and we have 24 of them, remember, is building pickleball. And we're talking about building pickleball. And we have, I don't know, a very strong community support for it, but again, we can't be everything to everybody. So if you're going to have a sports complex, if you all are talking about where pickleball is going, if you think Pinellas County can be this pickleball empire, we need to know about it because, I mean, we're, Oldsmar just built an indoor, well, covered, I'll say, 14-court thing, which seems like that's pretty good tournament play, I would think. So we're not going to try to emulate that when they're right around the corner from us. So can you just talk a little bit about that and where you see it going and how it might impact your department? Yeah, pickleball is growing across the country. Um, you know, and it's, I, what I'm seeing is, is small venues popping up here and there. I think in the last couple of weeks there's been one announced for Pinellas Park. There's one down in St. Pete. Um, based on our research and, and talking to different organizers, at minimum you need 24 courts in one location to host a tournament. Uh, one of the issues... Oh, we're not doing that. That's for darn sure. Exactly. And one of the issues is, you know, down in Naples, they built the mecca of a pickleball complex, and they built it, you know, six, seven years ago. So they got in front of it. 
And if we're going to build something, I would say build something that you can do several different sports in instead of pigeonholing yourself into one sport. So pickleball is growing. It's growing more on a community thing, if, if, in my opinion, because all your play is going to be taken up by your, your local people here that want to go out and, and compete against their neighbors. Uh, so if we're going to build something, I would say build something that, if it's, if it's rectangle fields, if it's indoor space, something that you can do. So if you're doing indoor, you can do basketball, volleyball, wrestling. You know, you can build pickleball courts in there, but it gives you versatility where you're not just locked into one sport. You can be versatile with that space, and you can now open yourself up to loads of opportunities as opposed to just a handful of events in one sport. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and now we have uh, community and brand engagement by Craig Campo. Craig, where are you? Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve. For the opportunity, uh, we're almost to the finish line here. So thanks for everyone's patience and conversation today. And thanks for coming together on my birthday as well. So much appreciated. All right, thank you, no worries. Um, so we're at the tail end here. I will kind of hustle through my, my slides here um, to get to my birthday party. But um, so, Brand activations, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, some highlights for our uh, team and uh, program this year. So executed strategic out-of-market activations to engage target audiences in alignment with BVK and marketing. So a couple examples here, Fiesta in the Park in Orlando. So that was a title sponsorship of the event at Lake Eola Park uh, in partnership with Creative Pinellas. And it was a great sort of launching pad for their Arts Month uh, last November. Great footprint there uh, in a strategic market. Uh, the Travel and Adventure Show a a slash National Plan Your Va Vacation Day in New York City. So Katie mentioned this earlier, and we uh, presented on this back in February. Uh, highly successful um, three, four-day activation in Manhattan. Um, beyond that, we are actually sending a team to Philadelphia tomorrow uh, through our partnerships with the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Union. We will have footprints uh, at the Phillies game on Friday and then the Union game on Saturday. And this is also a collaboration with Hortensia as well as um, with the meetings team and uh, leisure travel as well. So excited for Philadelphia. And then beyond that, we're also looking at opportunities in Nashville in Atlanta and a few other markets later this summer um, before the fiscal year ends. So that's out of market um, locally. So I would say, uh, you know, 90% of our uh, role here is kind of supporting local events. So elite events, we had 31 events in the program this year. So we've supported uh, each and one of, every one of those. Um, and then on top of that, there's probably a dozen more that are non-elite events. So the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg, massive footprint at that event, technically not an elite event, uh, the Tax Act Invitational in Clearwater, another example. Um, so yeah, a very strong local presence there. Uh, beyond that, we've unveiled two what we call promotional assets with our giant Adirondack chair and our giant uh, let's shine letters. We like things to be giant around here. Um, but the purpose of these assets, whenever we acquire sort of a new uh, tool like this, it's uh, to provide um, maximum visibility for the VSPC brand, A. And then B, it's an, a unique engagement opportunity or experience uh, for the attendees of that event. And then C, it provides some sort of value to our partners. So. Uh, the events are enhanced or benefit from the sheer presence of these assets. Um, so it checks all those boxes. Uh, partners, local partners. So uh, mentioned Creative Pinellas, that integration in Orlando. Um, happy to work with them at a, many other local events as well. So Local Topia, uh, one example, they participated in our National Travel and Tourism Week Travel Rally last week. Uh, we're working on plans for St. Pete Pride next month. So Creative Pinellas has just been a uh, you know, remarkable 
partner of ours. Uh, Tradewinds joined us in the New York City footprint, and then we're actually working on a, a fun project with Ruth Eckerd Hall uh, for their unveiling and grand opening of the sound. So um, I mentioned our giant Adirondack chair. We're doing a fun co-branding with Ru Ruth Eckerd Hall to help uh, promote their new venue. Um, I think the biggest kind of success for me is, is filling out the team. So we've talked about staffing quite a bit today and um, to welcome Jake Herman and Sierra Arana to the team has just been huge. Um, so uh, Jake joined us in October in Sierra just um, two months ago prior to the Valspar Championship. But um, like we can't do what we do or be the places that we want to be without a tremendous team and they're uh, fully capable and, and extremely talented. So uh, excited to have them on board and they'll be traveling to Philadelphia tomorrow. SWOT analysis wise, so strengths and opportunities uh, uh, kind of blended uh, those two uh, buckets together there, but branding, I mean, we are the, the best looking booth. When you go to an event, we, there's just no doubt about it. Um, we stand out with the, the different assets that we have, the boat, the welcome arch, now the chair, the letters, like these are unique. No one else has these assets in their arsenal, but we do, so we stand out. Um, staff experience over between the four of us I probably am the bulk of the staff experience but over 40 years of combined experience in events and um, and yeah that's that's huge right there uh, messaging so more of an opportunity here now that we're uh, ramping up this um, value of tourism campaign geared towards the locals we can be hyper strategic on who we are targeting and when so the locals, they receive that value of tourism messaging. Visitors, it would be, um, we would pivot to a, a, an alternate message for them. Reach, so we mentioned the number of events, 31 elite events locally. Um, we have the opportunity to touch point every community, every pocket of Pinellas County. So that's, that's tremendous and our goal is to get there into each and one, every one of those pockets. Um, customized communications, so that kind of layers into the messaging. Um, when we're at an event and collecting data, we can now use that data to target um, that individual with specific uh, communications there. On the weaknesses and threats front, uh, metrics wise, um, we certainly have metrics. I feel like we can get a little bit deeper in trying to quantify uh, what these activations mean and you know try to give us an ROI on these types of opportunities. Um, partner education, uh, I, I think we can do a better job on just telling our partners, hey, here's an event coming up, here's an opportunity, this is the benefit. We're bringing thousands of people potentially to your, to your brand or your property. Um, burnout, burnout is absolutely real in the event world. I'm sure everyone can understand. Um, yeah, just last week as, as an example, five events in six days. Um, that, you know, you keep that up, burnout is all but guaranteed. Um, and then brand ambassadors, uh, we have constant kind of churn with our brand ambassador program. Um, it, we're pretty heavy on college students. So they graduate, they move on, and now we've got to replace them. So that's a kind of a constant tug of war there. And then staying innovative and fresh now that we have new assets and we're bringing new items into the mix here, okay, what else, what's next? What else can we be doing um, to continue to, to push our brand? Priorities moving forward. So collaboration with Katie and BVK, I mean, that's kind of, that's at the core of what we're doing here. But, I, and this kind of addresses the weaknesses and, um, and some of the threats from the previous slide, but creating with their sort of input uh, an ROI calculator. So that'll help us measure success uh, of our various activations. Um, continue to uh, figure out what that messaging looks like and be hyper strategic um, at the different events. Producing a, a minimum of two strategic out of market events, um, you know, that's probably conservative. We'll end up doing four to six would be more realistic in my mind but as long as it checks all the boxes of 
being a strategic market and audience will be there. Um, we do intend to participate in 100% of the category one through three elite events and um, you know, certainly those are the events kind of per the guidelines that generate the most visitation, the most attendees, the biggest impact. So we want to prioritize those. We still, of course, plan to have a presence at the categories fours and fives events, um, but you know, certainly greater emphasis on one through three. Uh, we'll continue to support uh, other VSPC departments. So you know, I'm pretty proud of the fact that the past five years we've never turned a, you know, a, a fellow um, department down if they needed help on anything. So we want to keep that going for sure. And then engaging slash including new local partners. So we need to grow that stable of, of partners that are joining us in our footprints and, you know, continue to grow that um, database there. And then increasing our brand ambassador uh, database by 20%. So we just want to keep layering in, um, you know, new uh, volunteers into that mix. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell, and I'm happy to answer any questions specific to the brand activations program. So that's phase one of my presentation. Questions, anybody? Clyde? First, happy birthday. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who won the pineapple cup? Uh -oh. It's a sore subject. <clears throat> yeah. All right but I'm sure you can do well. Um, there was talk, it may have even been about a year ago, about a pop-up stage, and, and that's what I wrote down, uh, that would be, you drive it up there, it's in the back of a, a container or something, and, and really, mm -hmm. that's what people take picture of. I love the concept, and we've seen a few of those kind of um, at other, almost like professional development type events where there's kind of things we can observe and experience for ourselves to give us ideas on how to improve. So yeah, there are portable stage options. They come in different varieties and sizes. Um, they're very expensive, A, but uh, actually that is on the research list uh, as far as what else can we be doing? And this would be something that, going back to kind of the previous slide here, um, about the promotional assets. So a concert, you know, picture, not a full-blown concert stage, but a, kind of a miniature one. It could be a side stage, mm -hmm. for instance, but it's got our branding all over it, so it checks that box of creating that visibility for us. Um, you know, an engagement, people be watching the musicians on the stage, but then the value that would bring potentially to that partner, to that event organizer, to have access to this other stage that complements either the main stage. It can be used for a variety of reasons too. It could be, you know, um, a, the Skyway 10K event and they want to use it as a podium and it's our backdrop and all of our branding. So yeah, that, that's actually been on the radar for quite a while now, yeah. That would be great to see that move forward. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Anyone else? Anybody? No? All right. Steve, uh, department reports. Um, actually Got a bonus. Greg, go into a This was my birthday relation. present, was two presentations. I'm so sorry, Craig. Forgive <laughs> me. Okay. No worries. Okay. I got to find my notes here. Okay. So kind of a quick um, note at the front end of this. Um, so until recently, we've, we've not been immune uh, as an organization, my departments, um, from staffing challenges. So our community relations manager position has been vacant for over nine months until recently. Um, and I just want to personally kind of give a shout out to Brandy Bolden, who's our senior brand manager. So on the other side of the house, but between her and I, we've kind of divided and conquered that community relations manager position for the past nine months. So she's been instrumental in kind of bridging that gap. And I'll introduce everyone to the, our new community relations manager here shortly. But um, some of the things that, some of the highlights that we've um, achieved here this year, first and foremost uh, here, the value of tourism campaign. So back in October, uh, we met with BBK and KD, some internal stakeholders, and we laid out a vision for this campaign. Um, and since then, this is gonna be a robust 
campaign. So um, it's been in kind of the creative mode, uh, de developing messaging, data points, um, all the design, testing. So we've done a slow rollout, I think I mentioned before, uh, starting back in February, where um, we're testing some things out. And our hope was to unveil that campaign at the Rays game during National and Travel and Tourism Week. Didn't quite get, the, get to the finish line there with final approvals, so we had alternate messaging ready for that, um, but we're close. We're extremely close on this value tourism campaign. Um, Thanks for bringing up the pineapple cup. Uh, yeah, it, it did not go well there on Tuesday uh, the 9th. Uh, so we played kickball, and I'll let me get to it first. Scratch that. Let me start with the race game. So National Travel and Tourism Week, day one, um, had a tremendous turnout to the race. It was their largest attended game in several years. They pulled off the tarps off the top of the trop there and I, it was either at or close to a sellout. Um, but great opportunity to engage all the attendees. We had footprints both inside and outside the stadium. We had messaging throughout the game to the attendees. Commissioner uh, Charlie Justice throughout the first pitch. So we were heavy, heavily present there. Um, and it was a great, great turnout there. I'm putting together a recap, so I'll have all sorts of images and other data points and whatnot to recap the week, so just kind of high level. Uh, recap here. Uh, the travel rally, we had record attendance uh, of our chamber partners and other local partners. Over 40 attendees uh, attended the travel rally at PIE on Monday the 8th. So we were welcoming uh, visitors into the destination. <laughs> had, our, had our prize wheel going, which as anyone who's been to a, an event with a prize wheel, that's a heavy draw there. Um, so I think last year's turnout, we had 24, 25 folks in attendance. And so we, we were over 40 this year, which was awesome. Um, Tuesday's Pineapple Cup. So we played kickball in Oldsmar against Visit Tampa Bay. And um, the score was tied going into the eighth inning. I was pitching a gem of a game and got pulled. Actually, I pulled a muscle, so I pulled myself. And then kind of Jake, our new hire, he didn't do so well in the eighth with pitching. So that was a crash and burn. We, I don't recall the final score, but uh, it was, I think we ended up losing by nine um, after being tied through the eighth. So anyways, it was a blast. Um, you know, it's great just sort of networking and uh, interacting with our peers at Visit Tampa Bay. Uh, we had hoped our friends up at Pasco could join us as well, but um, ended up not being able to make it, um, but just, it was a fun day. All together, we'll bring home the cup next year. Um, so then visit Tampa Bay. They held their dinner uh, the following night, Wednesday the 8th. Uh, I believe Steve was in attendance for that. And then we hosted a, um, a full day fam tour of um, tours in Tarpon Springs, Palm Harbor, and then uh, Ennisbrook. So kind of North County education for the staff there. Um, you know, it was just great to see some of the, the communities we don't always get out to and, and learn all the latest and greatest. And then the final day there with uh, Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber, we partner with them on uh, their Sun Runner event after their luncheon. So another, and we had some of our assets on display there as well. So busy day um, or busy week, I should say, but it was a great week. And again, I'm putting together a full recap there. But some other events and initiatives, we've been, um, a part of this year. So Keep Pinellas Beautiful Sustainability partnered with um, with KPB and the City of Clearwater for their big cleanup event uh, last November. Uh, we assisted with the planning and execution of the annual marketing meeting. That's uh, kind of the, the event we host every February or so to um, educate our partners on what's going on. Um, hosted a fam trip with the Tampa volunteer groups, Tampa International Airport uh, volunteers. So they're educated on St. Pete Beer. They can promote that over on their side of the bay. Uh, and then staff fam tours I just described, um, not only Tarpon Springs and Palm Harbor last week, but a couple months ago in Oldsmar and Safety Harbor. So really pushing uh, education there uh, for our staff and volunteers. And then service the 13 chamber agreements. Um, you know, anything from the agreements themselves, invoicing, 
requests, collateral, X, Y, Z, you know, we've been there to fulfill their needs. Um, so that's been the past nine months. Oliver, I want to introduce you to our new com community relations manager, Oliver Kugler. Many, many of you will know him. He is the self-proclaimed walking billboard of tourism for Pinellas County. Um, but we're just beyond thrilled to, yeah, and if you don't know him, please uh, say hi afterwards. Um, but we're thrilled to have his experience, expertise, industry, uh, knowledge, and history. It's going to be um, you know, critical as we grow the community relations department here. So SWOT analysis wise, um, strengths and opportunities, such a wide diversity of, of partners, you know, attractions, hotels, breweries, events, it's A to Z. There's so many just phenomenal partners here. Um, resources and funding, kind of self-explanatory. Generally, the locals are positive towards tourism. I think there's room for improvement there. If we're not at 100%, you know, we're, we're working towards that. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for a, a partner program and um, chamber funding revamp, revamp excuse me, um, that is high on the priority list, and then finishing off that value of tourism campaign, getting that to the finish line. Weaknesses and threats, so partner management, just mention all you know, the wide variety of partners. It's a lot of folks to manage um, and to keep them happy, too. Everyone's going to have different needs, different desires, but you know, it's our job to, to make sure they're satisfied. Uh, measurements for new, the new program. I think we got to spend some time figuring out what that looks like. Staffing. Okay, we got 24 municipalities, 13 chambers. Like I said, all with different needs. Is one person or two people enough to accommodate all those needs and varying um, moving parts there? So then, and then the chamber funding program. Reinforcing that. So priorities moving forward. Step one, co complete and fully launch that value of tourism campaign. It's not only going to be geared towards the locals, but arming o Oliver with information that he can take around to businesses, stakeholders, the um, chambers, everybody else, uh, the entire community. Um, revamping that chamber funding program. So. Um, kind of first project on the docket with Oliver and Steve is what is this going to look like coming into next fiscal year, looking at the new criteria, um, surveying our chamber partners, what do they want this to look like, um, funding levels, et cetera, the distribution of funding, everything we need to revisit there. Um, surveying our partners, we need to understand kind of where we're at right now, establish that baseline of, okay, Things aren't perfect. How can we how can we be better? Increasing or creating new opportunities for partner engagement. We've got kind of the staple events here: annual marketing meeting, the National Travel and Tourism Week. Okay, I think partners are excited about those events. What else can we be doing on a regular or semi-regular basis to increase that engagement? Um, developing tools, attending events, uh, education. There's a whole lot more we can be doing there, um, starting with the staff and the volunteer fam trips, but certainly beyond that as well. And then growing our stable of sustainability partners. So keep Pinellas beautiful. It starts with them, but who else is in that space that we could maybe partner up with um, to push that message? So that concludes my second presentation there. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, Steve, closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to members of the council. I know it was a long day. Lots of uh, good discussion, uh, comments, and appreciate everything that you have said in the direction that, that we're going. I do have about two pages of notes. Um, I also enjoyed the fact that you read and you paid attention to the SWOT analysis and and 
you know, and it's interesting, if you take each of the different ones, you can see there's some commonalities with that, which is good. And then there's differences based on, on the markets. And uh, I know that'll be something that we'll be talking about in the next, the next couple of days. So uh, Katie mentioned it earlier, we have all of our marketing partners are in. And so we're spending all day Thursday and pretty much a good three quarters of the day on Friday dealing on a number of topics, all the way from the marketing, audience, messaging, competition, you know, you know, trends that we're seeing, really have, having uh, th uh, those co uh, uh, conversations. Um, also, and I think you've heard that from, you know, s several of the different folks also getting back to ROI. And I know we, we keep, we talk about it, we show it, but we're also looking at ROI on different programs. Um, because at the end, I, I want, you know, you as the TDC members, our stakeholders, you know, the public to, to know that a, an investment in what we're doing is good for the communities as a whole and, and what does that equal. So whether it's an activation, it's PR, it's sales, it's advertising that we, we go through and, 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 and show that. So again, that's something that you, I, I think you saw from a couple of departments. The, the other thing as well in, in the budget process, you know, again, staff has done a lot of hard work in the detail part of it. Um, but as we all know, you know, in three months, there could be changes in terms of what's happening out there. And so we'll still go through and evaluate where we maybe need to do th some things differently. Um, and, uh, and, and again, like we have done in the past, um, you know, we will present to you a media plan in August or September that really goes through and says this is where we're going and you know for next year again realizing that some, you know uh, some of those things that, that will uh, go through and change but again it's you know we take all of this the comments that you have said um, the comments that you've made and then look at how we can go through to refine uh, what we have and then and then start you know moving down the process really for us next um, is uh, in the budget process. There's a budget information session with the county commission, and I believe we're on June 15th or 16th. I don't remember the exact uh, which day, um, but that. So we have that process, and then um, I think Barry presents his the budget complete budget to the BCC um, in in July. Um, and then the public hearings are in September. So if there are changes to this, then we will bring that back to, to the TDC at, um, as, as well. But again, in, in that time period, if there are comments or things you wanna you know, chat even further about, please let me know um, and, 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 and reach out to me. Again, I'm excited about the direction um, and you know, again, um, how we can best provide a great return for the dollars that are invested, you know, in us and, and what we're going through and doing. Okay. Um, sorry, I know we're running over, but <clears throat> historically we've talked about, after we've seen the presentations, after we've looked at the numbers, we've talked about, well, where should we put more of I it? Mean, where should we take away? Um, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask regarding a few items. Um, last month, Madam Chair, you mentioned that you had a meeting with the federal level on beach nourishment and it seemed fairly positive. Is there anything more to report there as far as any positive feedback or negative or anything? Thank you for that question. Um, the Army Corps has taken a very strong stand on beach renourishment and that's one of the reasons why I have asked Barry to schedule a deep dive policy discussion with the county commission on how we want to move forward, recognizing that in the future, it looks like a lot of our re, uh, beach renourishment activities are gonna have to be totally funded on our own. And that's a policy decision that the county commission will have to make. That said, uh, depending on some ongoing discussions that are happening this week, I envision that as soon as we have our workshop on Thursday, we'll be working, uh, Brian Lowack, myself, Kelly Levy, and Mayor Kennedy from Indian Rocks will be traveling to Washington again to meet with the Army Corps ourselves because 
the going back and forth on email and the letters that have gone back and forth, it's almost like we're talking apples and oranges. And that's not going to cut it in terms of a thorough and honest decision. So we haven't given up, and we are really working hard to try to turn the Army Corps around. But in the meantime, we're also doing an analysis to determine how, what the dollar numbers are that would cause us to have to take this on on our own. Can I ask you a question about that? Not to interrupt you, I know it's your dime, but I'm glad to hear that you're going back up for a second time or multiple times. And I think you should work with Steve to get, you got a rock star marketing organization here to totally Mac daddy out your presentation to the Army Corps. I mean, you could have some really awesome overheads and video and, you know, I'm sure you're going to have a presentation for them when you meet with them. It's not just going to be talk. But, I mean, I think, I think this organization could put something really strong together for you versus the stagnant PowerPoint that can happen periodically. Just a suggestion. Thank you. With, with that else? looming... You know, last year I suggested and it was adopted that we add a quarter of a percent to beach nourishment. Right now we typically budget for a half percent. And uh, it was approved here just on a temporary, you know, one one year. I just wanted to get the ball rolling to try and to try to put a little more money over to beach nourishment so that we start building those reserves for that, should that happen, should we not be successful. And I'd, I'd propose that again and it may get shot down by the by the county commission, but uh, I really think we need to start moving some money over to that. It, it can always be moved back. It can always be moved back, but if we start allocating those capital dollars to something else, it can't be moved then. And uh, I really think it's important, you know, in light of what you've just said, that it's, it's not going our way yet. Hopefully it will, but we can always move it back if we need to, but I would start moving more money toward beach nourishment so we're ready to, to handle that if we, in fact, have to. Um, well, are you making that a motion, Phil? I would like to make a motion that we move from point uh, a half a penny to three fourths of a penny um, to make it real easy. Just this term, just this next budget term. Hopefully, we'll make it permanent, but I'm not proposing that right now. But at least get started in saving some of that um, before more capital projects come in and start consuming that. We don't have it for beach nourishment, which is our number one priority. Second. Is there a sec okay, there's a motion and a second. All those hold for discussion. Go ahead. I'd like uh, <clears throat> legal to advise us on uh, what this motion uh, does in, in the procedure going forward with the rules and regulations that were statutes that we operate under because we had that conversation. Yeah, no, it's totally acceptable for this board to make that recommendation. It'll next go to the BCC, either as part of their budget discussion, or Madam Chair can bring it up as a, hey, you might see this when the budget's rolled up, that the proposal from the TDC, again, is to increase for this one next upcoming budget cycle from the current half percent to three quarters of a percent. It's a one-time, correct. one year correct. is all we can do, correct. though. But they can look at it post after that, uh, as, as Phil if said. We need it, they need if it to. looks like we need it after we find more information and we, we make it, you know, maybe make it permanent or we get rid of it. But for one year, at least, at least let's, let's mm -hmm. start putting a little aside now uh, just in case. And Mike? we can always move back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Michael, just a point. Um, would this go into a reserve account that we would hold? OMB is not here. I don't think it's technically a reserve account. I think it's a dedicated account that's usually held for that purpose, so it's a little different. I don't want to call it a reserve per se, but it is a specific fund that's held for those uses. There's, right. there's 32 million that's been transferred into that bucket. It's separate from the capital now. Correct, correct. And it's there to be used for beach nourishment. I'm proposing we, we move a little bit more over to that bucket. And in the future, if we see we've got too much there or more than we need, we need it for something else, we can move it back. But at least we've started to be proactive should the worst occur. What does that half penny equate to dollar wise, total dollar wise? I think it's about eight million. An additional eight million. No. Well, the quarter percent would be an additional four million. No, we'd be able to. Hold on, hold on, hold on, capital. hold on, hold on, hold on. Chuck? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, we, we budgeted according to um, Jim's on page 15. In 22, 
five million dollars in twenty three we went up to nine point three and now we're going to ten point seven in twenty four so we i know our numbers increase but it's a so we have to get a calculator out, but I don't. I think that's more than our our sales have increased. Our tax has increased. So, um, I can, yeah, I'm not sure. I can respond to that. how we're getting to those. Okay, go ahead. I mean, that's I, your time. I can respond to that. The, the the 10 million, as Jim was saying earlier, it's the half penny plus makeup for increased tourist tax collections from prior years. Thank you. To bring that whole to bring it back up to half percent, so instead of doing a budget amendment mid year. They just give, move that much more the next year, and that's what they're doing. They're making up for it. So right now we're looking at, at uh, 100 million as a um, budgeted, or just over 100 million for for tax collections next year. So divide that by six, and that's 16 million per penny. Divide that by two is eight million plus. So half of that more would be 12 million. So we added, we move an additional four million this year, and then look at it again next year and see where we need to be. I think that's a very responsible position for us to take, and I would suggest that, while Steve, you'll put that into your recommendations for the budget coming from the TDC, I think it would be very wise for us to hear from Kelly Levy exactly how much beach renourishment would cost because right now we know we have 35 miles of beaches, but if we're looking at taking all of this on as a county, countywide, I'd be very interested in knowing what that number is because then we can be really thoughtful about how we adjust our formula or whatever it is that we have yeah, to do. She, Phil? I asked for a presentation last year, she gave it, and without- Twice. We got it twice, so yeah. like two, six months. Yeah, and without um, the Corps' assistant on Sand Key on that particular stretch, um, we would run out of money by 2030, I believe, 2031 on our, on our projected track. So that's why I suggest that we start saving more, should that be the case. Okay. And, you know, it, it, was, it was turned down by the VCC because they were still hopeful they could get something done, and I'm hopeful we can get something done. But, if it, you know, we, like I said, we can always shift it back. But once we leave it in that capital and a couple years down the road, the guys come in and ask for 30 million a year for 30 years, <laughs> which is likely, um, it's gonna go away. So I'm just trying to get this going in the right direction before it's too late. So, all right, are we, are we ready question? to vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Russ? Um, <clears throat> I know that Steve's meeting uh, in the next couple of days, and I think that there's been topics that we talked about in, in uh, uh, increases of what we should be spending in some of the uh, different parts, whether it's in the digital, or whether it's international, or whether it's in the incentive for travel, uh, for meetings and conventions and all. And in the past, we had a budget and we would move things around out of basically advertising in and uh, promotions and uh, there's enough money that i think that we ask staff to to uh, come back with a recommendation and, and and also to put it in for his budgeting presentation to increase our budget from the amount that you have right now you're showing i think there's a need there's a 12 percent growth in hotels in the next couple of years. There's also markets like luxury collection and some of those that we have not had before that we need to do. There's niche marketing in some of those things, ecotourism and nature and some of those things. And I think you need to be able to, we suggest you put it back in and, and ask and to say this is the amount and then we'll vote on it when it comes time for it. But I think our, our budget needs to be increased and we have the funds to do it with. Bill? Um, I'd second that. I was going to mention that as well as the second part of my Oh, sorry. sorry. But as you said, historically, we've taken pretty much everything. We've budgeted 95% of what we expect because you have to, you know, we can't do more than 95% of what you're forecasting. Um, we're forecasting about $65 million available for operations. We're spending $45 million. 
there's 20 million, now you can only do 95%, so that's really um, 61, 750. So you've got you know, 16 million that we're not budgeting, Steve. Um, and I don't understand why we aren't increasing the budgets on various things when pretty much all the weaknesses were not enough staff, not enough uh, resources, not enough advertising. Um, and we've got the money there. You know, we would typically budget for spending all 95% and advertising would be the plus or minus. We'd say, we'll put more here, we'll take it out of advertising. Okay, we want to take less from there, we'll put it into advertising. But it was all budgeted to be spent. And we're leaving, you know, 16 million on the table with a tremendous amount of reserves. So I'm, I'm not sure why we aren't, you know, we're supposed to take those dollars and spend it to market <laughs> in one, one way, shape or form the county to bring more heads and beds. And we've got 16 million that's not allocated to anything except growing reserves, which we have a ton of already. So it, in our budget that submitted, uh, we had about an, about $8 million more that were in, I think it ended up being like about 12 different decision packages. Um, that has not been approved yet. And so those dollars could be showing up within the, the different areas. Uh, we're just waiting on, um, you know, administration to review that or BCC to review that. Uh, but that's, we did ask, ask for that much more. Yeah. Um, well, it's not, I'm not seeing it here. I'm seeing pretty much duplicate of last year. It, well, and, and based on that, because it was a, a, dis, a decision package and it had not been decided yet, it was advised to go with the flat budget, which is what we submitted. Okay, well, now that there's 16 million on the table, well, that's, unused. How do, you, how do you make a decision on that then if you're, if you're doing a flat budget? How, how can you make a decision when you see all the, the weaknesses that say I need more money, essentially, or resources? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Phil. And so, I mean, how do you make a decision? Being used. <laughs> and, uh, you know, last year I did speak at the end, end of the meeting saying we're a little behind pace. Yeah, we're way ahead of 2019. We're doing great, but we want to hang on to everything we can, which means we need to throw more at meetings and conventions to get those back as some of the domestic uh, tour and travel business goes elsewhere. And it's, gonna, it's going back to what the normal is, which means we have to have a good mix of international convention and meetings business as well as the tourism business. And to get that, we're going to need to put more resources toward those other markets. So just to circle back on that, because I know we're at the end of the meeting and everybody, my, my brain is, is fried too, but we're working on a flat budget. You've got 12 decision packages that you've been asked to submit to administration, and we're not seeing that. So we're looking at the old numbers, and we're not seeing what's been requested, an additional $8 million. So we're just kind of <clears throat> then if, if i could just remind everyone that i have been asking for the last several months to be patient and let us finish our work before we started making decisions and i get that we're a little behind the eight ball but the fact of the matter is we're really not in a place where we can make decisions today, okay. in my mind. So we do not call for the vote on the budget today is the best thing you're saying we should do? Well, I, I'm only one person and I'm giving you the benefit of what I know is going on and what the reality is here as you see it today. And I know that doesn't sound good, but but you all, you, so Steve, you, you and your team, you've heard what, even though every single person didn't speak, you didn't hear anybody say they didn't agree. You've heard what people have said their concerns are, where they think they need more money, as far as our board members, right? You've heard that. So I presume that when you go make your presentation to the county administrator and the county commission, that you're going to take those things into consideration and make your decisions based on those things, correct? Unless there's something crazy that we don't know about. Yes. 
Well, then I'll, I will choose to trust you, and I don't want to make I don't want to make a motion. I just want to say that, on record, you've heard what we've had to say, and we assume that you will take that into the fullest consideration when you're making your recommendations. I mean, that's all we can do at this point. Hi. Hi, Madam Chair. I have one, hopefully, final question. Um, Michael, if we, isn't it up to this body to make a recommendation to the BCC on the budget? Uh, yes. It's and if we don't do it today, at what point do we do so? How about we do it in June? I was going to say, you can do it in the, it depends on the rollout of the budget to the BCC ultimately, but the June meeting seems appropriate as long as it meets their, their time frame. I'm not okay. involved in that. But June yeah. or July, it just depends on the next couple of weeks. <coughs> um, Barry, Barry has the, the budget. I mean, we've already gone over that. In fact, we had a, a meeting on Monday, but you know, we can go back and say, based on the meeting with the TDC, here's what we heard. So will you bring back a summary in June then that so we, we can, we can, we can and, go, th go and, through and do that? It doesn't have to be the whole presentation, just the summary of the things that we said. Yeah. You've taken notes, you know what we said. Yeah, like I said, two pages of notes. Yeah, okay. So then we can make the recommendation there. Just so two more quick things. Hold on. <laughs> in point of clarification, so not meaning to sound like I was uh, contradicting you, but I was confused, and, and you know, in the sense that, as you said, we were asked, I thought, to do the budget, and you're saying that from a c the county commission standpoint, you're asking us to hold off making that decision and I thought we were facing certain timeline requirements for those budgets so if it's appropriate to sit back and get more information and then make a decision it, it just seems as if we were sitting here looking at all these numbers and these presentations and hearing the strengths and weaknesses thinking that we needed to be making those decisions now but it, if I'm hearing you you want to have the opportunity to bring back more information and that would help us make a better decision. At a, a well, point. I think that we don't have enough information today to make the decision. As you have, a couple of you have already indicated, we've got numbers that we're looking at that are flat. I mean, we not only work on the county commission budget, but we also are responsible for all the constitutional officers and their budgets, and none of them are going to be flat. I can just tell you that right now because we are under a mandate from the state, surprise, surprise, to contribute additional dollars into the pension fund. So that's just an example of an administrative cost that, I don't know, maybe I've got my head in the sand. Your employees, Steve, are they in the Florida retirement mm -hmm. system? And have you increased your budget accordingly to take care of the additional dollars for the pension? I don't. I'm looking at Terry. That would be the um, Office of OMB. They make all of those adjustments in okay. the budget. Okay, but there again, that those dollars are going to be coming back, and we don't know what that's going to mean. I can tell you for our county, it's $36 million mm -hmm. additional. So, yes? There was one other follow-up question, if you can stay. Um, the, the budget of 5.9 million for personnel services, is that fully staffed or is that with who's staffed now? That's fully staffed. That's so that's, all if we fill all the positions at the amount we think we're gonna pay, then 5.9 is the number. Mm -hmm. So we still have 16 million. Good. <laughs> After we fill those spots. <laughs> I have one final comment and I'll, I will <laughs> You've say said that more than once, yeah. Phil. No, I said two, I said two more. This is the final one. I've said it before, page six, 
Visitors, total visitors, 15 million 714. That's day trippers and overnight. We need to split those up so we know how many are day trippers and how many are staying in the accommodations or staying with friends or relatives. You know, average stay 2.4 days. What, a day tripper doesn't stay anything. So I don't, I don't know, you know, what is the real average of an overnight visitor? Is it three, is it four, is it six? You know, you don't know that if you're gonna mix the day trippers in with that. And I mentioned it a couple times in the past and here it is, the report and shows them all mixed together. So I think it's real important for this board to know overnight visitation versus day trippers. I'm done. Okay. So the good of the order. Anything else? Okay, then we are adjourned. See you next.